All right, everybody ready to go? Let's go ahead and call ourselves into order today. Madam City Clerk, can you please call the roll? Thank you. Council Member Tibbetts? Here. Council Member Schwedhelm? Here. Council Member Sawyer? Here. Council Member Fleming? Here. Council Member Rogers? Present. Thank you. Uh, Vice Mayor Alvarez? Present. Mayor Rogers? Here. Let the record show that all council members are present. All right, thank you. We will start our day with three closed session items. Uh, we'll go ahead and see if there's public comment on those items. Mr. Go for it, Mr. DeWitt. And then Madam Deputy City Clerk, if I could have you handle the Zoom after. Hello, my name is Dwayne DeWitt. I'm from Roseland. And I had wanted to comment on the idea that it's still important to keep the wages in check Right now, you'll be having your labor negotiations, which go on continuously, basically. And <clears throat> the thing is, it's not like we have a lot of money that's extra, even though you feel you've got a big bank now because of the funds coming in from ARPA and the PG&E settlements and other things like that. I think it's very important you still have a hard-headed fiscal oversight in your negotiations to keep top management wages down and actually disperse whatever extra monies might be available in your mind to the lower paid workers at the bottom end, the maintenance people and the parks people, the ones that take care of our city. On the next item regarding this property negotiation with the county, why does this have to be secret? If it's land that's owned by the taxpayers, in negotiations with another taxpayer oriented agency you should be able to talk about it in public because it's not like someone's going to be trying to make profit off of this which would be why a private property negotiation is protected so this is between government agencies and this should be out in the open so that we the taxpayers can see what's actually happening now, last but not least, I wanted to add something which is, I believe, a circumstance which justifies a continuance on a matter for public hearing later today. I have here a copy of Council Policy 00013, where people can ask for continuance, and if they are the appellant, they need to do it as early as possible. So I'm doing it here during this session. The reason I'm asking for the continuance of the public hearing regarding old school cannabis is because as the appellant who paid my fees of $556 almost 10 weeks ago, I never heard anything back from any city employee about this matter. And yesterday when I came in to pick up a written agenda is when I saw it was on today's hearing. I went down to the planning department. It was 4.05 after, in the afternoon. The planner wasn't there that handled it. They told me that I could call. I did that. I got a request in to her for the appellant procedures. In the past, the planning department would give an appellant information on how to correctly do their appeal and how to handle things. That did not occur with me. When I came in today to get what was available, they gave me a copy of the Manual of Procedures and Protocols for the City Council. And that's where I found this idea about the city policy for continuance. So I'm asking for a continuance on old school cannabis. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. DeWitt. You know, do we have anybody on Zoom? Mayor, I'm not seeing any hands being raised via Zoom for items 2.1 through 2.3. Great, we'll recess into closed session.
Hi, Pablo. Hi, Charles. Thanks for joining us. Do you want to do a quick mic check? Good afternoon. It's Charles. Hello, this is Pablo. Thank you both. Um, is there a preference of who goes into the Spanish channel first? I'll go ahead and go first this time. Okay, I'll pop in there. And then, Charles, if you can restate uh, the how to participate from the Spanish channel at the time I say that out loud, that would be wonderful. And then I'll move you over to the Spanish channel with Pablo. Understood.
For those just joining the meeting via Zoom, live translation in Spanish is available and members of the public wishing to listen in the Span on Spanish channel can join via Zoom by clicking on the interpretation icon on your toolbar. It looks like a globe. Once you join the Spanish channel, we recommend you shut off the main audio so you only hear the Spanish translation. Charles, will you please restate this in Spanish? Para los recién llegados a la reunión, la interpretación en español está disponible y las personas quienes desean escuchar en español pueden pasar al canal de español. Para cambiar de canal, haga clic en el icono de interpretación ubicado en la barra de herramientas de su... Parece un globo terráqueo. Para que se una al canal de español, recomendamos que apaguen el audio principal para poder escuchar la interpretación claramente. Good afternoon and welcome to the December 14th City Council meeting. Madam City Clerk, can you please call the roll? Thank you. Councilmember Tibbetts? Here. Councilmember Schwedhelm? Here. Councilmember Sawyer? Here. Councilmember Fleming? Here. Councilmember Rogers? Present. Vice Mayor Alvarez? Present. Mayor Rogers? Here. Let the record show that all council members are present. Thank you, Stephanie. Uh, let the record also show it's the first time we've had seven council members at the dais in almost two years. So it is a, definitely a cause for celebration. Sue, could you please give a brief report out on our closed session items? Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, council did meet in closed session on three items today. Uh, the first, item 2.1, uh, was a conference with labor negotiators. Um, council gave direction uh, to the negotiation team and took no final action. 
The second uh, item uh, 2.2 is a conference with the real property negotiator. Um, again, the um, council uh, had a discussion and gave direction to the negotiation team and took no final action. And finally, um, the council met and discussed item 2.3, which is a conference with legal counsel on existing litigation. That was a matter of Rosalind Action and Dwayne DeWitt versus the city of Santa Rosa. Council uh, gave direction to um, legal counsel and took no final action. Thank you. All right, thank you so much, Madam City Attorney. Let's go ahead and see if we have any public comment on our report out from our closed session items. If you're interested, go ahead and either approach the podium or hit the raise hand feature on your Zoom. Seeing none, we'll keep moving. We have no proclamations this evening, but we do have staff reports. So Mr. City Manager. Mayor Rogers and members of the City Council, our COVID-19 update today starts with uh, information from the California Department of Public Health uh, announcing that effective tomorrow, December 15th, masks are required to be worn in all indoor public settings, irrespective of vaccination status, through January 15th of 2022, at which point the state will make further recommendations as needed in response to the pandemic. Sonoma County public health officials do not anticipate much impact or changes to the existing local indoor masking order, but are actively reviewing this new guidance from the state and are anticipated to share more information within the next few days. Additionally, the California Department of Public Health updated requirements for attending mega events like concerts and sporting events. Prior, atten prior to attending a mega event, attendees will now be required to provide either proof of, proof of vaccination, a negative antigen COVID-19 test within one day of the event, or a negative PCR test within two days of the event. The California Department of Public Health also issued a new travel advisory effective immediately to recommend that all travelers arriving in California test for COVID-19 within three to five days after arrival, regardless of their vaccination status. On Friday, in alignment with federal and state guidelines, Sonoma County announced that 16 and 17 year olds are now eligible to receive booster shots of the Pfizer COVID-19 vaccine six months after completion of their primary vaccination series. Vaccination is still the best protection against COVID-19 as people gather indoors with the arrival of colder weather and the winter holidays, increasing their risk of exposure to the virus. Local data collected over the last three months show that Sonoma County residents who are unvaccinated are nine times more likely to become ill, 40 times more likely to become hospitalized, and 16 times more likely to die from COVID-19 than people who have been immunized. As of yesterday, the county has 1,231 active COVID-19 cases and a total of 416 deaths since the pandemic started. That concludes our COVID-19 update for this week. Thank you, Mr. City Manager. Council, are there any questions? All right, let's see if there's any public comments on that staff report. I am not seeing any hands on Zoom, nor am I seeing anybody move towards the podium. Let's move on to city manager and city attorney reports. We'll start with the city attorney tonight. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, tonight, I will be reporting on our settlements and active litigation in the last month. As you know, under the open government uh, ordinance, we are providing these reports monthly. Um, in the um, materials that were published, it indicated that we had no settlements over 50,000 finalized in November. Um, we do have, however, a new case that was just very recently settled. That is a matter of Casey versus City of Santa Rosa and County of Sonoma. Uh, the case concerned allegations of a violation of civil rights during an arrest that took place in 2018. 
The matter was settled for a total of $110,000, and that amount was split evenly between the City of Santa Rosa and the County of Sonoma, uh, each entity um, committing to pay $55,000 uh, uh, each. Uh, that is the only settlement to report this evening. Um, in the litigation uh, log, we have 30 cases. It's up a little bit from last month, um, but not dramatically. Um, the one case that I would note that was new, we did have a couple of new cases, but the one that was is probably of more interest was we were served with a lawsuit from the Owners and Renters Rights Association challenging the city's new short-term rental ordinance Plaintiffs uh, in that action did apply for a TRO in the Superior Court. The court did deny that application. Um, so there is no uh, temporary restraining order. The an ordinance remains in effect, uh, but the litigation will now proceed on that. Among the 30 cases, we have nine uh, code enforcement and receiverships. These are actually only the receivership cases and do not include just the straight code enforcement matters. We have nine matters of general litigation. That includes breach of contract claims, an ADA claim, claim under the, another claim under the uh, Public Records Act, a uh, Proposition uh, 218 claim uh, regarding water, right, water rates, and then um, a couple of other general litigation matters. We also have six personal injury or dangerous condition of public property cases, five um, cases alleging police uh, actions and five writs of mandate currently pending. Uh, happy to answer any questions. Um, thank you. Let's go ahead and see if we have any questions from council members. Okay, seeing none, uh, Mr. City Manager, I have to I have to start. Uh, so, for those of you who don't know, tonight is Jeff's last scheduled council meeting with us. Uh, and obviously he'll still be around City Hall for the next couple of weeks uh, until we have the new city manager officially on board. But this is our last meeting of the year. And I just wanted to jump in before I give you a chance to speak and just say thank you. Uh, for those of you who haven't known Jeff, and I didn't know him prior to him coming here to be the interim city manager, uh, he not only has a long history of working at the city, but also deep, deep, deep community involvement since then and since he's come back to the city in his retirement um, and has really integrated himself into the, the public. Uh, when we needed somebody to step in about half a year ago, uh, Jeff came forward uh, as somebody who cared a lot about Santa Rosa. Uh, and I'll say it's been uh, incredible getting a chance to work with him uh, and hearing from staff uh, how much his mentorship has helped them. And I think that uh, even it's, though it's only been a six month stint, I think the city is in a much better spot uh, for you having served with us. Uh, so I just wanna say thank you. Uh, and like I said, we'll have a chance over the next couple of weeks to say goodbye to you, particularly behind the scenes. Uh, but I do wanna give a, get an opportunity for the public to say goodbye as well. And just thank you so much for your service. Thank you, Mayor. It's been a pleasure to have the opportunity to once again work with the city and the city council and to get to know uh, some of the newer council members uh, uh, during this tenure. Um, I'm uh, so proud of the work that the city has done and continues to do. I look forward to being a part of this community in the future and continuing to serve on a volunteer basis with some of our community organizations. I'd also like to share with you that we're uh, seeing the departure of one of our key department heads. Today's uh, the final day for Eric McHenry, our chief technology officer. Many of you know Eric and the leadership that he's uh, shared with us here in the city in the technology area. Much of what we experience today in our meetings is a result of the technology team and our city clerk working together to bring Zoom and hybrid meetings to the city as well as a host of other technological advances. So uh, I'd just like to say thank you to Eric. Thank you for all the advancements you've brought to the city. I hope you enjoy your retirement. I understand he's going to be uh, assuming a new leadership post as the president of the Airstream International Owners Club. And he'll be traveling around the country in his trailer. 
And when he's back in the area, he's also going to be a board member for Exchange Bank here locally. So congratulations, Eric, and thank you for your service to the city. And thank you to Eric as well. Uh, he's been a, a fixture here at City Hall. And as you mentioned, this last year has not been easy from the tech front. And so just thank you to him and his entire team. And I wish him the best in his retirement. Council members, does anybody have anything that they, any questions or any comments they'd like to make? Council Member Sawyer. Thank you, Mayor. And um, Jeff, you were my first city manager. And I, uh, 15 years ago, it's been an honor and a pleasure to serve with you again. Uh, you were the right man at the, at the right time to be helping us get through these, these last months. And um, just thank you for, for your service again. Um, and good luck. And I know you're not going anywhere. You'll, you'll be definitely a, a fixture in our community and continue to be involved. And I thank you very much for your service. Council Member Swedham. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, first, if Eric is listening, uh, congratulations on his your retirement. And knowing Eric, uh, as I do, I know Airstream is a big part of his life. He's quite the outdoorsman. So I know he's not going to be sitting at home with nothing to do in between fishing, hunting, traveling, three-wheeling. He's going to lead a very um, adventurous retirement life. So congratulations, Eric, and I really appreciate all your contributions to the city. And for you, Jeff, I was so pleased um, when the opportunity came for this interim job that you were interested, having both worked for you and one of the things that was nice being a staff member when you were the city manager um, it was like I wasn't working for you I was working with you and I'm hoping now that I'm in this role in your last six months I feel like we're continuing to work together because one of the things that we have in common is we're doing what's in the best interest of Santa Rosa so when you stepped in very challenging times and you've brought some stability to the organization that was needed and with Mayor Keisha coming in, I think you've, you're the perfect person to basically have a transition of power between, you know, uh, Sean's administration and Mayor Keisha's administration. So thank you, and I can't look, f can't wait to see the additional contributions you're going to make to the city of Santa Rosa. So thank you, Jeff. Vice Mayor. Thank you, Mayor. Jeff, I mean, uh, a thank you doesn't suffice. Uh, someone who's willing to take a call at any time to help guide a newly elected, including last night. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> like I said, I thank you doesn't suffice. I hope it does good for now, but I, I know that we're not done. And uh, I look forward to tomorrow and, and thank you for, for serving. And I'm happy, happy that you were able to, to have an opportunity to want to come back and to make that happen for, for not only us as the council, but us as the city of Santa Rosa. Thank you, sir. Yes, yeah, so I'll start out with Eric. Uh, if you're out there in space somewhere, getting ready to go out in your Airstream, I, you know, the thing that strikes me is that your next job sounds like a heck of a lot more fun. And uh, I, I hope you have a ton more fun. Thank you all for, thank you for your kind words and your support along the way. And, and your staff has been really helpful in getting us where we need to go with our technology. And, and I can't imagine the amount of work between your office, the city manager's office and the clerk's office that has had to be put in since the beginning of COVID. So thank you. You know, a lot of jurisdictions experienced a lot of difficulty and I think we've had a, a pretty smooth ride and, and much of that thanks goes to you. And as for Jeff, you know, most of the good things have already been said about you and I'm loath to say anything bad. So what I will say is my favorite thing about working with you, Jeff, is your sense of humor and that even with a mask on and glasses, you ain't got no poker face. And I always enjoy taking a look at you when somebody says something absurd. So I will miss that sorely. Best of luck in your next stage and I know we'll see you around. Um, so congratulations to Eric and your retirement if you are out there listening. And I, I would say that it is, um, it is a loss to the city, um, but it is definitely a gain um, for you to experience life at a whole nother level. Um, and that is to have time because I know we have monopolized a lot of your time, uh, especially with our transition uh, with COVID. So thank you so much to your service, to our city and to our community. And I hope you enjoy your retirement. It sounds like you have a lot of stuff planned. Um, and to Jeff, uh, this has been um, a ride. Uh, needless to say, the, the first year on council 
Um, there have been a lot of changes, and I feel like uh, I have known you for a really long time, and I, I thank you very much for uh, allowing uh, me the opportunity to grow um, for the time that you've been here um, and being open and willing um, to foster that growth, even though you knew that your time here was limited. So thank you very much. Thank you for being available. And I wish you the best in your retirement and don't go too far because I still have your cell phone number. Thank you. Thanks, Mayor. First, I'll start off by saying thank you to Eric. I remember uh, when I was first joining the council and we had our first goal setting meeting, I had the chance to sit next to Eric and also uh, the fire chief, Tony Gossner at the time. And I remember what an exciting and eventful discussion that was at lunch. It was ATVs, hunting, fishing, Alaska. Um, so I'm really glad to hear that uh, Eric is doing what he's doing, gonna be going off and running the Airstream Manufacturers Association. I just think that's perfect and I wish him all the best. Jeff, um, I wish I could, had the chance to work with you more over the last uh, year, but up the interactions that we had, uh, I really appreciate. And I knew you coming from, uh, I guess, both Rotary, but also your job at Memorial Hospital. And I knew we were getting the best choice because what I saw in you there was just this uh, huge amount of um, compassion for people and for this community, uh, the vulnerable and the homeless especially. And boy, that just translated into your work here. Um, and so I just wish you all the best. I look forward to working with you more in the future. I'm glad you're not going outside of the community. We get to still have you here, but uh, a million thank yous. Anyone else? Sue? Yeah, I'll, I'll briefly, we'll have a chance, I'm sure, to uh, talk in quite a few times in the next few weeks, but I do want to um, express my uh, very deep gratitude for your service and for working with you. It is an absolute pleasure, an absolute privilege to have had the chance to get to know you and to work closely with you. So thank you, thank you, thank you. All right, let's go ahead and open it up to public comment. If you have a comment on our uh, city manager and city attorney reports tonight, go ahead and hit the raise hand feature on Zoom or make your way up to the podium. And I'm not seeing any hands, so we'll go ahead and bring it back. Do we have any voicemail public comments? We do not, Mayor. All right, let's go on to statements of abstention by council members. Does anybody have to abstain tonight? Vice Mayor? Yes. Thank you, Mayor. I will be abstaining from item 15, the public hearing for uh, the appeal on old school cannabis due to my involvement in the cannabis industry. Okay, anything else, council members? I'll be abstaining from the minutes. I was not present. Uh, okay, do you note that, uh, Vice Mayor? Great, and then I will also be abstaining from item 15.1. I did an independent consulting project a couple of months ago writing a technical ordinance for one of the groups that's now assisting with the appeal. Uh, and so even though I don't do any work with them still, just to avoid any uh, perception of impropriety, I'll be abstaining from that item as well. Let's go on to our, we'll see if there's any public comments on item number nine. Yep, seeing none, we'll move on to item number 10. That's our mayors and council member reports. I'll start at this end of the dais and work my way down. Nothing to report, Mayor. Okay, council members, what up? Anything? Yes, I have a couple things. Um, I know we had a public safety subcommittee meeting on December 8th, and I'm sure our chair, uh, council member Fleming, will report out on that. Um, I also uh, last week took a tour of Caritas. I think all of us were invited and I really encourage uh, other of my colleagues to take that tour. Um, it's gonna be a fabulous facility and really bringing some uh, needed assets to those uh, who are receiving services from Catholic Charities. 
Um, not only will they be uh, doing some improvements to the Nightingale project, which uh, they're increasing the capacity, I think, from 17 beds, which what they have over on Brookwood. <clears throat> and the Nightingale project is a project that someone who is experiencing homelessness goes to the hospital, gets released, but shouldn't be out on the street. Um, they had 17 beds over there. I think at the new facility, they have up to 34, which is huge. Um, also, uh, with the new building with family support ser services and drop-in center, actually having medical facilities on site and a commercial kitchen. I really encourage you to take a look if you have time in all of our busy schedules, take a tour of it, because it really is going to be a game changer for our community. And then, uh, very happily to report, we had our Groundwater Sustainability Agency meeting on December 9th, and after the public hearing, um, the board unanimously approved the Groundwater Sustainability Plan. Now we'll be waiting on the State Department of Water Resources to approve the plan, and that could take a year or two. But it was a huge step for the GSA, and uh, thank you for giving me the direction that was supported by everyone else on the board. That's all I got. Thank you, Council Member. Nothing to report from me, Mayor. Okay. Uh, we had a Sonoma County Transportation Authority and Regional Climate Protection Agency uh, meeting yesterday. One of the items that we had was a pretty cool tool that shows all of the housing projects that have been proposed and approved, uh, proposed and or approved uh, on a GIS map for Sonoma County. And it uh, maps it against our priority development areas and high resource zones. Uh, the link is very long. I did share it on social media. I'd encourage folks to take a look at it. It's really interesting and it's very striking when you start to see where we're, we've been able to develop particularly affordable housing units and how many. Uh, Santa Rosa is continuing to lead the way on that. Uh, I think the number was about 45% of all of the affordable housing units in the county uh, are Santa Rosa approved uh, at this point. So I just encourage folks to take a look at that. Uh, tonight, uh, we'll also be adjourning in the memory of Marie Durkin. Uh, Marie Durkin is the mother of the uh, of our fantastic director for Santa Rosa Water, Jennifer Burke, and unfortunately she passed a number of weeks ago. Uh, in, in emailing with Jennifer, uh, just to check in on with her, uh, she did tell me that she received her passion for public service from her mom who had served as a planning commissioner when she was growing up. And so tonight we will be adjourning in her memory uh, and, and wishing Jennifer well. Council Member Fleming. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, this last week I've had the opportunity to get to uh, chair the Public Safety Subcommittee with the assistance of Councilmember Schwedhelm and Councilmember Rogers. We reviewed Policy 308, which is a use of force policy, and the Police Department has done an excellent job of reviewing this policy to ensure less force is used, less liability is incurred, and fewer people get hurt in the um, in the course of their, them carrying out their responsibilities. And the other main item that was brought forward was a complete revision of, of the terms that the police department will engage with uh, calls on. And they went through um, uh, Captain Morenzik, who is retiring at the end of this month, went through you know, nearly every possible type of call that they could receive. And they went through a, a thoughtful process of trying to reduce the amount of calls that they respond to in order to prioritize higher level calls to make things more digitally accessible and also to reduce um, the, the probability of negative outcomes with the community. And so I'm very pleased to have um, participated in that process. And um, you know, in the future, I, I think we'll be looking at taser policy as I think, uh, or as we've seen that um, you know, many other jurisdictions uh, don't use them because they can be lethal, as we've recently recognized. And then uh, this Wednesday, we'll have our last meeting of the Metropolitan Transportation Committee, or Commission, excuse me, at 9.30 a.m. tomorrow morning for all of you transit and housing folks who just can't get enough. Council members? No? Thank you, Mayor. Um, it's with a really heavy heart tonight that uh, I'm going to announce that tonight's going to be my last meeting with the Santa Rosa City Council. Um, on Tuesday, December 21st, will be when I submit my letter of resignation just one day after my last day as chair at the Renewal Enterprise District. 
the reason for this is really simple. Um, it's that the public deserves a really attentive council member, uh, but so does my son and wife, and I've had a really hard time juggling the two. Uh, it brings tears to my eyes to think about the last five years. It's been uh, ups and downs. It's been incredible. Um, working with all of you has been so special. I really mean that. Um, I wish it could have been longer, but uh, yeah, gosh, guys, I thank you for it. And um, I'm very sorry to uh, leave you with a selection process ahead. Uh, having been through that myself, I know that I don't want to wish it upon anybody else, but I just hope you understand that the public deserve 100%. So does my wife and child. So thanks, you guys. Uh, thank you, Council Member. Um, and I, I serve in uh, kind of a unique role because I've been friends with Jack since before either of us ran for office. Uh, and then I've had an opportunity to serve with him through everything. Uh, whether it was fires or the pandemic. Uh, and, and I'll say, I don't know that the city council has ever had such a strong champion for housing, for our homeless population, for uh, disadvantaged communities. Um, and I just thank you for your service over the last five years. And, and I know Allie is, is gonna be really excited to get her husband back. Uh, and I know that Casey is gonna be really proud uh, to be able to uh, be with you as he grows up. And so I know you're making a hard decision. I know you're making a decision for your family. And I just can't thank you enough for being there for us for the last five years. Jack, I'm sure it's, this was a real tough decision for you to make. Um, my comments are very short. It's been a pleasure and an honor serving with you, uh, your dedication. Uh, to those issues that, that you were passionate about, you brought that passion to the table. But family comes first. And you've made the right decision, and I honor that. Thank you, John. Tom. Thank you. Um, I'm so sorry to disappointed to hear you'll be leaving us because, as others have heard me say, it is a team sport, and you've been a very valuable member of this team. But I totally get it. In fact, as I've <clears throat> announced, I've got one more year. Part of my reasoning for that is I've got a grandson coming. And so the value of family and being there for them, you're 100% making the right choice. Again, once you start thinking back over five years, it seems like it's been much longer with the fires. But I know where our paths have intersected with housing and homelessness. And it's been unique once you became the executive director of St. Vincent de Paul. We couldn't talk on some of the things. But I know we're on that same page. So I know your efforts have made a difference in Santa Rosa. And thank you for your service, but you're doing exactly the right thing. Congratulations. Very tough decision. Jack, I mean, it's kind of like how you just mentioned it to Jeff about wishing that you had an opportunity to work longer. That's exactly how I feel right now. But families first. With that, I say congratulations. Enjoy the next chapter of your life. And also, as I stated earlier, I know we're not done. Thanks, Eddie. Thank you, sir. Well, Jack, I, I think that um, this must have been a really difficult decision, and I can hear in your voice how hard it's been. I'm personally going to really miss your leadership on housing. Getting to work with you on the Renewal Enterprise District has been one of the highlights of my time on council. And um, I'll be looking to another council member to really step up and, and be my partner in pushing hard for all kinds of housing all across the board and, and taking those difficult positions. So, you know, it's um, with a heavy heart that, that I say, I, I think you've probably done the right thing for your family and for yourself and that you point out, you know, the, by this example, you know, we point out that this is an impossible job to do. Um, in the way that it's set up. And I'm, I'm sorry that, that you couldn't continue in a way that was good for you and your family. Thanks, Victoria. I also look forward to uh, the opportunity to get to speak candidly with you about homelessness and housing for indigent people going forward. I think that's one opportunity that, that I can look forward to in this. Yeah, me too. And same goes for you, Tom. Um, I was not expecting that. 
I like to tease you, um, but I, I am happy that you're going to be able to spend more time with your family, definitely. I do like picking your brain. Um, I am looking forward to being able to pick your brain still and uh, for it not to count as, uh, you know, my Browns Act. Yeah. Uh, I don't have to count you as a person. Um, I'm also looking forward to uh, working with you on uh, in a different capacity, hopefully, um, uh, in other ways. Um, so hoping that I, we see more of you um, just in a different capacity. And I, I'm really, uh, I, I'm sad because I, I hear that you're sad and that was a, a hard decision for you to make, but family is family is first and this is a really tough job and it's hard to to do with the family and I think uh, a lot of us that that have families and are struggling with that so but we support I support you, thank you. Um, I think we all support you a hundred percent in making this decision so we wish you the that. best and know that I'm here for each and every one of you for whatever you need going forward I owe you all a lot Go ahead, go to public comment for council member reports. If there's anybody in the public, Mr. DeWitt, go ahead to approach the podium. Okay. I don't see any hands on Zoom. Did we have any voicemails? We do not, Mayor. All right. With that, we'll keep moving. Let's go on to our approval for the minutes. We have the October 12th, 2021 minutes for tonight. Council, do we have any amendments to those? Any amendments? I believe there is one, Mayor, and it'll be from uh, Council Member Nally Rogers abstaining for, or is, is that? Yeah, we'll come back for the, for the motion in a moment. Perfect. Let's go to the public, see if anybody has any changes that they need to the minutes. <clears throat> okay, seeing none, we will show those adopted as presented with Council Member Rogers abstaining, unless I hear objection from the council. Seeing none, we'll keep moving. Mr. City Manager, I believe we're pulling item 12.5. From the consent calendar, correct? That is correct, Mayor Rogers. Staff would like to propose an amendment to that item for the council's consideration. Okay, we'll bring that back at another time. Would you please read the rest of the consent calendar? If we could do that tonight, I think it's a simple amendment. Oh, okay, uh, that's, yes, we'll amend the item then. Yes. And we'll, uh, we'll pull that one separate and we'll do it separate from the rest of the con consent calendar if that works. Great. So we have uh, seven items on the consent calendar tonight, beginning with item 12.1, a resolution for approval of, for fire department to purchase two type one Pierce fire engines. Item 12.2, a resolution uh, approving the national prescription opiate litigation distributor settlement agreements. Item 12.3, a resolution authorizing certain staff to enter into agreements to execute other documents with the California Housing and Community Development Department, Community Development Block Grant Mitigation Planning and Public Services Projects developed in response to the 2017 Tubbs Fire. Item 12.4, a resolution approving a parking agreement with Airport Business Center and Blue Fox Partners for parking permits for Garage 5 and Garage 9 related to settlement of the Airport Business Center versus the City of Santa Rosa lawsuit. We will uh, take item 12.5 after the balance of the uh, consent calendar and the resolution, uh, I'm sorry, the revision we're proposing is removal of the request for funding for $50,000 for program monitoring services. Item 12.6, a resolution making the required monthly findings and authorizing the continued use of teleconferencing for public meetings 
of the City Council and all City Boards, Commissions, and Committees pursuant to Assembly Bill 361. Item 12.7, a resolution uh, for the termination of the proclamation of a local emergency due to the 2021 floods. Item 12.8, an ordinance adoption, an ordinance of the Council of the City of Santa Rosa establishing the monthly salary of $22,500 and other compensation and benefits for the city manager. Okay. Do we have any questions about the consent calendar? Councilmember Sweatham. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Actually, n n no real questions, just um, two requests on item 12.1 12.2, both of which I've supportive. For 12.1, just because there's some ifs in there, um, six figure ifs, if we're able to get the purchase order signed, could we get an update, and it doesn't have to be at a council meeting, just at least uh, an email, how did that turn out? Just because that figure is pretty significant. And then same thing on 12.2, um, there's some, a variety of different ways that those funds could be utilized, and I would like council to have a voice into identifying how they are. I'm, again, I'm making the assumption both of those will be supported. That's all, thank you. Yeah, let's go ahead and see if we have any public comment on these items. Hello, sir. My name is Dwayne DeWitt. I'm from Roseland. On item 12.8, just a back of the envelope calculation, the wages are $270,000 a year for this person. And that doesn't include the compensation and benefits, which you don't tell us here what they are. This seems like just a really outrageous amount of money for somebody to be a paper pusher. No offense intended to anybody that's in those types of positions, but these things are getting so out of hand in terms of how much money we spend for top management people we're not getting what we really should be getting from this type of a wage. This isn't offered in the private sector. People don't get this much money just to be a Monday through Friday paperwork kind of person. This is really a stunning situation. And it really begs the question, when will you folks begin to stop the inflationary spiral that's been going on for years now? I can appreciate Mr. Cullen. I like his sense of humor. We've been joking occasionally over the last 15, almost 20 something years, it seems like. And when he came as a temporary guy, he was also drawing his pension from another job in another place. And it's like these guys are making fat money, big bank off the taxpayers, just doing basic stuff. They're not saving lives. They're not like the EMTs that are out there doing the hard work. And it really just begs the question if we've lost our sense of balance and put our priorities in the wrong place. Like a nurse that's out there risking their lives right now during COVID is probably only making $65,000 a year with overtime. So please stop this inflationary spiral and hopefully hold the um, cost of living increases you'll continue to give these people in the future to just one percent this is fat money they're making now and it just doesn't seem fair especially during covid that these folks would make so much money just to be talking in meetings with other highly paid bureaucrats thank you for your time thank you mr dewitt i see no hands do we have any other voicemail public comments we do not, Mayor. Okay. Let's go ahead and see if the Vice Mayor has a motion. Thank you, Mayor. I would like to move consent items 12.1 through 12.4 and 12.6 through 12.8, with the exception of 12.5 being placed as the balance of the consent calendar by City Manager Jeff Cole. Second. We have a motion from the Vice Mayor and a second from Council Member Tibbetts. Let's go ahead and call the vote. Thank you, Mayor. Councilmember Tibbetts? Aye. Councilmember Schwedham? Aye. Councilmember Sawyer? Aye. Councilmember Fleming? Yes. Councilmember Rogers? 
Aye. Vice Mayor Alvarez? Aye. Mayor Rogers? Aye. That motion passes with seven ayes. All right. Now, Mr. City Manager, can you tell us what the amendments are to item 12.5? Mayor Rogers and members of the council, uh, Magali Tellis, uh, the staff member, our deputy director of community engagement, uh, let me know uh, earlier this afternoon that we no longer need the monitoring services under this program. So if we can uh, amend the approval to remove the $50,000 increase, um, that's the only change that we need. Okay. If there's any yeah. questions from council about that. I think Sue is going to give us the language or where it needs to be. Changed. Yes, I was going to indicate that it is in the second to last, um, be it further resolved, that includes that increase of $50,000 for program monitoring services. And that is no longer necessary. Okay. So we'll strike that language that therefore be it resolved language. Thank you. I believe that, that the entirety of that um, paragraph can be deleted, but if um, Ms. Um, Teus is online, she may be able to confirm that. So thank you. Yes, that, that would be the only, um, only adjustment. Thank you. Okay. Council Member Spudel. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. So confirm, because we still need to evaluate the programs. It just won't be through upstream investments at 50K. I'm assuming there might be some other adjustments. Is that, is my interpretation accurate? Yes, yeah, so we will still be able to continue with the software and the dashboard that upstream investments established for us. There's actually a way for us to continue doing that work without necessarily having them um, directly overseeing that. And, and that's something we're able to sort of work out very recently. Um, so it's sort of still in, in collaboration with them uh, on moving forward in this way. Great, thanks. Thank you. All right, let's see if we have any public comment on item 12.5. Seeing none, I'll bring it back to the council. Uh, council Member Alvarez, would you like to make a motion? Thank you, Mayor. I'd like to move item 12.5 with the amendment removing the section that speaks of the monitoring services for the amount of 50,000. Second. So we have a motion from the vice mayor, second from council member Tibbetts. Let's call the vote. Council member Tibbetts. Aye. Council member Schwedhelm. Aye. Council member Sawyer. Aye. Council member Fleming. Yes. Council member Rogers. Aye. Vice mayor Alvarez. Aye. Mayor Rogers. Aye. That motion passes with seven ayes. Okay. It's not yet five o'clock, so we'll come back to non-agenda items. Let's move on to item 14.1, Mr. City Manager. Mayor Rogers and members of the council, item 14.1 is a report item on the fiscal year 2021 Measure O annual report. Veronica Connor, our Acting Budget and Financial Analysis Manager, and Alan Alton, our Interim Chief Financial Officer, will present the staff report on this item this evening. Good evening, Mayor and City Council members. My name is Veronica Connor. I am the Budget and Financial Analysis Manager, and I am here to introduce to you the Measure O Annual Report for fiscal year 2020 and 2021. Um, next slide, please. You will be hearing today from the Violence Prevention Department, Fire Department, and the Police Department. And before we get started, I just want to say thank you to all the departments, as well as the budget team for their work in putting together this report and this presentation. And with that, I will turn it over to Violence Prevention. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor Rogers and members of City Council. Uh, next slide, please. My name is Jason Parrish, Administrative Services Officer with the Community Development and Engagement Portfolio. And I'll be starting off the Violence Prevention Group 
which consists of the Violence Prevention Partnership and Community Engagement, as well as the Neighborhood Services Programs funded by Measure O in the Recreation Division. Next slide, please. So the Violence Prevention Group uh, started out with a million dollars in fund balance and uh, between the sales tax collections as well as the uh, total 2021 uh, COVID expenditures uh, ended up with about half a million dollars in the ending fund balance as of the start of the current fiscal year. Um, and if you'll remember that $510,000, that will come up later in the presentation as well. Please advance the slide. So the most significant part of the violence prevention group uh, in both recreation as well as community engagement are the salaries. Roughly one third of that amount, 300,000 approximately, is made up of temporary seasonal employees uh, working out of the neighborhood services uh, portion of the group. And then as well, the uh, I draw your attention to the $799,000 in choice grants which by the requirement of the Measure O ordinance is 35% of the annual um, uh, revenue, roughly. Please advance the slide. So, and as you can see over the long term, especially with the Measure O program, we have to ensure that the revenues and the expenditures uh, track well. And in the last couple of years, as you can see, there's a, a very slight gap between the expenditures and the revenues as we've tried to continue supporting the public uh, throughout COVID in the important work of ensuring uh, community health and the health of our youth. So um, if you could please advance the slide. And I would like to introduce uh, Interim Deputy Director, Jeff Tibbetts, who will be presenting the next portion of the presentation. Thank you, Jason, and good evening to uh, Mayor, Vice Mayor, and Council. Jeff Tibbetts, Interim Deputy Director for Recreation. Uh, I'm going to present a little differently than maybe we normally do um, on our programs because let's let's face it, this year was a little different than than most years any of us have experienced. Um, I think it was a great example of how fortunate. Santa Rosa is and our community is to have a resource like Measure O um, and the flexibility of the spending and, and the resource that it is uh, and, and those funds that go to the recreation division and, and the section of neighborhood services to answer the call and, and provide services to our community as needed. Um, I, I've been, I started with, with neighborhood services. I've been with the city for 18, 19 years now. Um, I've, I've seen a lot of things, but this past year and the School of Rec uh, program is certainly something that uh, I feel very honored to to be here representing the Recreation Division, representing um, all the staff who put in the work to make this happen. Uh, it was truly a great accomplishment. The one thing I'd like to stress about this slide here is you can see that we have a participant in the middle um, and the slide was designed by staff this way because that's really how this program was created and developed is what do what does our community need what do our participants need um, so the idea of school of rec was we knew that the schools were not opening and so academic development uh, was kind of an obvious that we're going to fill that void um, and we're going to offer children a place to go while schools are closed and have some support and doing this distance learning that none of us knew really what that was or how that was going to work so obviously you had staff that were there able to assist children. Um, you had the gap of accessibility to technology being addressed. Um, so using our community centers, working with IT, getting everything ramped up, making sure that we were going to be able to accommodate all of these kids, Zooming and doing those things. Um, so that was, that was kind of what the program was built around and the, and the idea of the program. But there's so many other components that as we built out the program, we realized so much more was being done. Um, so as this program built, as we saw more going on, I, I can truly sit here and say I 100% believe that the kids who participated in this program, um, our participants, our students, in many ways became very fortunate through the pandemic because they had a sense of normalcy um, that most people did not have because of this program. Um, schools were closed, but these kids, they were part of a group. They were they were coming on a regular basis. They got to know their, their staff that were helping them. Um, and so they were able to, to get components of their life that otherwise they wouldn't have had. 
the other piece that came abundantly clear and, and kind of helped us develop these other pieces is that recreation played a critical role in bridging the distance learning relationship between the student and parent and the schools. Um, so we were able to, as we develop these relationships, really help bridge the gap and fill in some of these other missing points. So the first thing that came natural to us in recreation was that physical health piece. Um, and it, of course, you know, we're thinking we're going to play games, we're going to take the kids swimming, we're going to play pickleball, we're going to do these types of things that are going to have the kids being active and have them being healthy. What we didn't realize and, and what developed is that we became uh, a big piece of collaborating with the county health services. Uh, we were a big piece in helping increase the reporting of contact tracing and also uh, getting access to testing for participants and their families uh, to the point that we even at times had testing services come on site to our program uh, to help administer that, help keep the program open uh, and make sure that everybody was safe. The other piece that early on was identified and, and became critical there at the bottom is the food assistance. Um, so we had a collaboration with Redwood Empire Food Bank and San Rosa City's Kitchen. Uh, we had these kids 7.30 to 5 o'clock uh, Monday through Friday. Obviously, food was going to become an important part of that and, and what we were providing. So those collaborations allowed us to run that program through the School of Rec as well. The other two pieces, I think, are really things that uh, maybe caught us off guard of how, how involved we were going to get with those. So again, staff became very um, involved in the mental health of our participants. So uh, collaborate, our collaboration with the school, we had resources like the district psychologists, school counselors that we were building relationships, we were working with, we were communicating on a regular basis. Um, and that became really huge in, in getting these participants the services that they need. Um, we had special trainings that these staff would come in from the school districts and provide for our staff. Again, this was a huge undertaking. We were all hands on deck, um, staff from our aquatic services, our Howarth Park operations, you know, it's everybody on, on deck to, to come in and make this possible. And so we really saw that we needed to enhance uh, the level of training for our staff. So between our resources and, and collaborating with the school, we were able to do that. And then the other piece of that is um, that our protocols and our safety measures in the program were at such a level that the school districts quickly became comfortable with what we were doing, how we were running the program. So participants that were in our program actually had the ability to still have some in-person sessions with their counselors. So that's something that children not in the part, uh, in the program didn't have access to. They, they were still doing Zoom um, sessions with their counselors, but when something major happened with participants in our program, the schools would actually send the counselors on onto our site um, and they would get to have that uh, in person, which you know is, is a huge um, for that mental health of the participants and, and dealing with everything that was going on. The other piece there is that social and emotional development. And that's things like having the positive adult role models of, of all the staff that stepped up and, and really made this program possible. Um, just the fact of being part of whatever you want to call it, right? The, the term for COVID was that they were a cohort. They were a group, they were a team, they were a class, they were a family. Um, they were a part of something. And I think we all learned how important that is as we were isolated and stuck in our homes. Uh, they would use things in their cohorts like the community circles uh, where they would talk about things that are going on. I remind everybody as, as we look back on that year of not only were we dealing with schools being closed, uh, you know, isolation, all those different things. We had movements like Black Lives Matter going on and, and different social um, pieces going on in our community. And the kids had an opportunity to, to talk about what was going on in their world, how they were feeling about things in these community circles with, with these cohorts of, um, that they got to know. And then we're recreation, so we had to make it fun. So we had theme days, we had events, we had different stuff to, to make it new and, and make it fresh um, so that we were enjoying uh, our time there. So uh, again, I know a little bit different, but I really want to dive into that school of rec. Again, I really wanted to acknowledge all of the staff and everybody who made it possible from serving food to waiting outside in the cold to do health checks when the kids got dropped off. Uh, working with the schools, working in the classroom with the kids, everything. It was all hands on deck and really um, an amazing accomplishment for our community and amazing uh, testament to how important Measure O is for our community and the flexibility to serve our kids and our families in the ways that, that are needed. So next slide, please. So now I'll go a little bit norm, normal of how we would provide these things. So a little bit of a dive in into School of Rec. Uh, so recreation staff Im implemented this program. It was uh, in, uh, involved kids, uh, excuse me, kids in grades kindergarten through sixth grade. Uh, through the measure of portion, we were serving 125 youth. Uh, we did this for the full school year, almost 10 months. 
um, and that's providing 50 hours of educational and child care support each week. So again, I mentioned uh, kids getting dropped off 7.30 um, there through five o'clock. Um, and so it was really uh, quite a bit for the staff to take on and, and run the full, full gamut of the program. And again, we were in partnership with local school districts, uh, the neighborhood services team able to incorporate education and programming to support youth with the greatest need during COVID. Uh, we partnered with San Rosa City Schools and Bellevue Union School District. We serve students from Lincoln, Helen Lehman, BLS, Steel Lane, and Meadow Booth Schools. Uh, we certainly, you know, <laughs> would have been great to, to have that list go on and on and, and serve even more kids, but I can tell you the, the 125 kids uh, was quite the undertaking uh, for staff to, to accomplish. Next slide, please. So in addition to the School of Rec program that ran during the whole school year, we did bring back summer programs. Uh, caveat here on the information presented, this is the summer of 2021. When we're talking about financial reports, it's always difficult for summer programs because they get split um, of the calendar year. So the information there is 2021, um, just because it's easier to report that way. Better Together is a program. We did bring that back in 2020. So take you back to that calendar. Um, we're all getting sent home and, and things shutting down in the middle of March. And by June of 2020, we were back and had summer camps running and, and were one of the first programs to, to really come back and um, get back up and running and, uh, during the COVID and during the shutdown. So it was very little time for recreation to really flip that switch and get ready for running operations in COVID. By the summer 2021, um, oh, I should say the Better Together program, you may have heard Recreation Sensation. We rebranded Recreation Sensation Better Together just for COVID because it was gonna be so different than what we normally operated. We wanted to have branding that that would represent that it was a different program in that time. So uh, 2021 and, and numbers would have been similar for summer of 2020, 205 participants registered, um, and that equates to about 8,200 total service hours per week. Um, the team basketball camp uh, did not return summer 2020. Uh, we, we put that on, on hold for the first summer, but in summer 2021, we had the team basketball camp back, uh, 25 participants registered in that program for over 500 uh, total service hours per week. As I present all this information, the one thing I'd like to really stress as I pass on to Magali to talk a little bit more about BPP is all of these programs are an example of the safety net that we really try to set out uh, through neighborhood services in serving our community, serving our youth, serving our families, um, and as many of them as we can to create that safety net, um, to identify youth and families that maybe have additional needs and then pass on and work in collaboration with VPP, their granted agencies, to continue service, create a continuum of services for these families who need additional services. So with that, I will pass on to Magali to discuss the VPP portion a little more. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, good afternoon, Mayor Rogers, Vice Mayor Alvarez, members of the Council, Magali Tejas, Director of Community Engagement, uh, here to provide an update on the uh, violence prevention partnership activities in the last uh, fiscal year. Uh, we focused on addressing, acknowledging, and articulating the need for trauma-informed care in our communities uh, based on where we are currently situated and everything that's transpired. Our strategy in the last fiscal year was to take a step back and educate ourselves and the community on the community issues that have been at the forefront so that we can better be better prepared to respond and serve. So aside from the work that we were doing with our choice partner agencies, which we'll talk a little bit more about in a second, uh, we've also reached out to our colleagues from the California Violence Prevention Network. And for those of you that may not be familiar, um, the CalVPN's mission essentially is to create a movement based on comprehensive approaches that focus on galvanizing, on the galvanizing of community-wide efforts and using an upstream approach to address community violence. We want to learn everything that we can on how our regional partners are operating, as well as their setup, structure, best practices, and thinking about how um, any of that could be scalable to our program, in addition to creating a support and a larger network uh, for our work um, as, as we carry it out uh, locally. So our entire Measure O team created the first annual wildfire ready program, which spoke to the various concerns in community as they pertain to physical and mental safety from wildfires. We hosted a week long series where Dr. Peter Nelson, a member of the Federated Indians of the Great Rancheria and a professor at UC Berkeley educated us on prescribed burns as an ancestral practice, how and why good fire was an essential way of life in Sonoma County before the colonization of this land and why it's important 
to continue to work with our local tribes on these practices. The team from FIRE uh, presented crucial information on prescribed burns, the wildland uh, urban interface, WUI, funding for wildfire uh, prevention, home hardening, and defensible space. We also held a workshop which resonated with many of the comments that we've been receiving and hearing from community members around our shared trauma uh, with wildfires. We are fortunate to have members from the Sonoma, Count, Sonoma Community Resilience Collaborative provide resilience tools to manage times of crisis, as well as mechanisms on how to deal with stress from being triggered by smoke, fire alarms, and other nuances related to fire. So I'd like to thank uh, Grisela Correa for leading um, that very important effort. Because we work with so many direct service providers and community advocates of color, we want to address and name where, we, uh, where we're situated and much of what transpired over in 2020 and what 2020 taught us uh, that many folks of color who are the boots on the ground are taking on additional stressors um, due to the climate. And we found ourselves in, and this needed to be addressed and recognized so that we invited um, Dr. Daniela Dominguez to provide a presentation on self and community care as an act of resistance. And I think that's sort of a topic that um, the Violence Prevention Partnership will really be um, diving into. Um, it's, I think it's an important consideration as we look at how our providers are able to, and if they're able to replenish and refresh so that when they go back into community, um, they can go back um, you know, as, as sort of a whole person and, and giving their very best. Um, so the next slide, please. Okay, um, so part of what has recently shifted in our community includes a greater acknowledgement for root problems like systemic racism, a lack of equity and poverty. Um, this idea that there are deep roots under our social challenges is an idea that the partnership has been elevating. Um, violence in Santa Rosa has previously was previously described as a gang problem that came from outside our community. But on deeper reflection and research, we learned that violence is rooted in social structures that exist inside of Santa Rosa. Violence often erupts when one or two of these roots have taken hold in the community. And I just wanted to share some of those roots with you all uh, when we look at the 10 roots of community violence, uh, one of them being families are disconnected from community and support. Another is um, students do not reach their potential. Re-entry is not supported. And one that we are looking at closely is that historically government um, has historically not prioritized fostering relationships with marginalized communities to assess and meet needs. Um, and prevention services are lacking. Um, so we just wanted to recognize um, that we need to do a deeper investment in providing support to our neighborhoods. The partnership provides grants to community partners um, to offer services that combat these roots of violence. We'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, next slide, please. So as you all know, the CHOICE grant uh, funds 10 community-based organizations, 11 programs. Um, all of which uh, made the changes that they needed to make in order to continue providing services to the community, despite the obstacles provided by COVID. And uh, we were also able to redirect some of the funding to meet immediate needs in the community, such as food, face masks, hand sanitizers, uh, summer reading materials, and direct payments. We have been working closely um, with uh, Upstream Investments team, who's been, they've been incredible um, on results-based accountability to the work that so that we can collect, um, this is sort of the evaluation piece that we were talking about earlier and collecting with the RBA uh, model, we are asking of our choice funded agencies, one, how much did we do, uh, how much did we do with a given program or initiative? Two, how well did we do it? And three, is anyone better off as a result of it? And, you know, of course, we'll definitely have uh, more information to come as we formulate the dashboard and um, the report. Um, the next slide, please. 
Um, so in, in further looking at evaluation results, we found that choice cycle 10 services continue to incorporate a public health model spanning across multiple generations, incorporating both upstream preventative strategies as well as intervention components of preventing violence. And, you know, just 100 families received case management services to assist with finding child care and other family support needs. 76% of these families of 76% of these families' youth were um, enrolled in childcare. And of course, we have uh, many more of these um, facts to share with uh, the community uh, given our 2020 report, which we're um, happy to share and is available uh, on our website. Um, next slide, please. So in terms of our Guiding People Successfully program, um, Cal BIP uh, did provide funding starting September 2018 with a COVID extension, and funding took us all the way through August uh, 2021. And the next slide, please. And shortly after the fiscal year on August 2nd, we hired our new um, Guiding People Successfully Services Coordinator, Irma Cuevas, whom um, I'm sure many of you have already met or know um, and is doing incredible work already in, in her short time here at the city. So um, with that, um, I'm gonna move it over to um, open it back up to Jeff um, for the next slide. Thank you. So looking ahead, in the coming year with the Violence Prevention Partnership. Of course, we're going through a cycle 10 extension that will go through the end of the current fiscal year. Uh, and what that allows the Violence Prevention Partnership to do is start a cycle 11 that anticipates a period covering the remaining years of the current measure row. Um, and we'll see whether or not changes need to be made based upon uh, voter output. So we're also looking at reorganization and strengthening partnerships when it comes to several of the committees, uh, as well as looking at how the best way to deliver services in the next several years. If you could please forward the slide. So earlier I mentioned the $510,000 uh, that was available on the front fund at the start of the current fiscal year. And as you'll see, um, we used $346,000 of that, leaving us a balance that's less than $346,000. And so what we are doing in the current fiscal year is looking at the organization and how we can reorganize the choice grant cycle and some of the neighborhood after school site programs, as well as savings associated with that. So. We hope to present you with a budget in fiscal year 22-23 and our new city manager uh, so that we don't have to go through any um, uh, actual program reductions in the next year. But that's something we'll have to evaluate. Thank you. All right, thank you so much, Jason, Magali, Jeff. Um, you know, at the core, your programs are about people, and I just wanna thank you for all of the work that you've been putting in over the last year at a time where it's really difficult for us to be in person. Uh, and so I, I appreciate the, cre the creativity, I appreciate the focus on delivering for folks in the community, and I'll see if there are any questions from my colleagues here at the dais before we go on to fire. I, I don't have a question, but I do want to just express my gratitude for the work that you did. I know that in the early days, we had been working together with the Economic Development Subcommittee uh, with Council Member Sawyer to, to get these programs up and running. And you guys did so in a way that, that preserved the ability of so many families to maintain economic stability and so many children to not lose the, an entire academic year. And, and I just can't speak to how invaluable that is. Um, as a parent of a first grader that year um, who had to find this service on the private market, it was expensive and, and yet still invaluable. And so um, my, my hat is off to you and you'll forever have my gratitude. Council Member Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, great job done by all, but I do really want to um, 
just give a shout out to Jeff and his team, the School of Rec, because I think it kind of went uh, on behind the scenes. So, so many of our city employees, ever since the Tubbs fire, are finding themselves doing things that they didn't sign up for on a 24-7 basis. Um, and that was in the news. But, Jeff, what you and your team did and the quality, it, it was just a game changer. So, thank you so much for the value added to all the youth that participated in that. And you and your team, you just stepped up and created something that had never been there before. So, thank you. And I think it's going to be a nice um, beginning program that we'll grow on. What's that going to look like years from now, and how are you going to incorporate your learnings? I don't know, but um, it, it doesn't happen without the success that you guys just demonstrated this last year. So thank you and all of your staff. A lot of people behind the scenes made that a reality. Okay, seeing no other comments, let's go on to the fire department. Hello. Hello, Council. This is Jim Aaron. I'm the ASO for the Fire Department, and I'll be presenting the financial slides and turning it over to Chief Wester for operational and program information on the next slide. So if you'll take the next slide, please. This is our beginning fund balance. As you can see, it's just under $3.1 million. Um, we had sales revenues of 4.2, um, interest negative 10,000. Um, Expenditures of 3.9, and we ended up with a fund balance of 3.362 million. Um, now, this is a planned um, reserve that we, we're building up over time. We've been doing this since the beginning of Measure O um, with a plan to, to potentially fund, help fund some future fire stations and or uh, purchase specialized equipment. Um, next slide, please. For 2021, you can see this is where our expenditures came up. And if you look at the, the, the pie chart, you'll see that 85% of our of our expenditures are on salary and benefits. We're, we're people driven. Um, we have very little in other expenditures that we have control over. Um, service and supplies of about 3%, that's about it because we've got debt service at 9%, which is fixed and admin service charges, which are another 3%, which we have no control over. So um, we don't have a lot of, of room um, to, to cut if we needed to. So we're pretty careful with what we do. Um, just as a recap of the year, we were up almost 60,000 in salaries, and that was based basically large to uh, a large retirement payout that we had in Measure O, um, a Measure O personnel. Uh, benefits were up in workers' comp and insurance, and um, our vehicle maintenance was down. So overall, we ended up with an expenditure increase of $56,000. If you go to the next slide, you'll see where our revenues and expenditures line up. And it, except for 1920, um, every year we, we really have been keeping our revenues ahead of our expenditures because, we, like I said, we're we're monitoring and we're making sure that we've got some surplus left at the end of every year to help with future uh, station builds. Um, and the, the reason we dipped down in 1920 was really due to a drop in um, revenues because of COVID and sales tax. Um, so overall, um, we, we had a 2021 revenues of 4.2 million, expenditure 3.9, so we ended up with a net of 265,000 positive in the fund balance. And with that, I will go to the next slide, 24, and I'll turn it over to the chief. Thanks, Jim, and good evening, Mayor Rogers, members of council, Scott Westrow, fire chief for the city of Santa Rosa. Uh, this slide talks about, as Jim referenced, uh, some of the people that we have assigned to Measure O. Um, essentially, Measure O covers 10.25 FTEs within our organization. Uh, three fire captains, which are our frontline supervisors that uh, lead the engine or truck companies. Uh, there's a fire captain assigned to um, our training division, which is the, uh, the training tower. Um, so they manage that six and a half acre facility and all the programs that go on there, including our recruit academies. Uh, three fire engineers, which are the apparatus operators and three firefighters. So if you look at those totals compared to what a uh, fully staffed fire station is, a fully staffed fire station with three shifts, three people per engine company is nine personnel. So it equates to a full-time engine company being open. It also accounts for 25% of a battalion chief is assigned to our EMS division. Um, as you all know, that's about 65% of what we do on a daily basis. Um, so to have that oversight and management of the EMS division is very important to us. 
and provides the uh, incentive pay to six paramedics. So essentially what that does is it brought our uh, ladder trucks up to advanced life support service uh, through Measure O. Next slide, please. So this is sort of a recap of uh, the FTEs that are assigned to Measure O and some of the impacts um, aside from personnel that Measure O has provided the fire department. Um, so again, we have the nine firefighters or nine physicians and the training captain. Um, on top of the ladder trucks, it provides ALS staffing or paramedic level staffing on three of our engine companies. Um, again, the, the emergency medical services management and oversight through 25% of the battalion chief. And then with all this, um, it improves our response time and deployment of resources by providing um, not only the additional stations and personnel and the equipment, um, but also bringing, it, bringing that level of service up to the paramedic level of service that we provide in Santa Rosa. So it brings down our response times. It, it enables us to strategically deploy our resources better, um, which in turn reduces fire loss, improves EMS patient outcomes, and uh, improves community outreach. Um, we'll talk about it in the next slide more, but um, Measure did fund the construction of Fire Station 5 that was on Newgate Court that was lost in the Tubbs fire. Next slide, please. So as far as the stations that uh, Measure has built, um, it built Fire Station 10 in uh, 2008, built Fire Station 11 in 2009, which serves the Junior College neighborhood. Um, Station 10 serves the Southwest, and Station 5, which services Fountain Grove, um, which, as we all know, was lost in the Tubbs fire in 2017. We're working on reconstruction of that fire station right now. Next slide, please. As far as the specialty equipment uh, that Measure O provides to the fire department, uh, we purchased two Type 1 fire engines, which is the, uh, the fire engine you see on the street on a daily basis, um, represented by engine 10 on the right side of the screen. Um, it purchased one Type 3 wildland fire engine, uh, which is there on the bottom left. Four command vehicles, which are the uh, the, uh, the Tahoe SUVs that we uh, we use as battalion chiefs or as duty chiefs to respond to incidents, and then one, one swift water rescue trailer. Um, and as I was reviewing these slides earlier, it dawned on me that every one of these resources was utilized uh, very heavily this year, unfortunately. And to finish out the financial portion, I'll turn this back over to Jim. Okay, you want to go to the next slide. And this is giving you a, a snapshot of where we're at for the for the current year. Um, they're projecting based on budget that we're going to have a deficit of about twenty eight thousand dollars. And this is a slide that says, "What are you going to? How are you going to cover that shortfall?" Well, we actually don't expect to see a shortfall for twenty one twenty two based on the way revenues are working out right now. Um, if sales tax goes up like we anticipate, they will. Um, there won't be a there won't be a shortfall. Um, we will actually be able to add to our surplus again and continue with that. So, in if by some chance it doesn't come to fruition, as you saw from the previous slide, we have plenty of fund balance to cover twenty eight thousand um, dollars. And with that, I will open it up to questions. Council, do we have any questions on fire? Go ahead. Um, so my, my comment would be, um, I, I believe that the, the fire department does a great, a great job and I'm very thankful that we have such a wonderful department. Um, it is my hope that, that one day we don't have to use uh, funds uh, from Measure O or any other measure to supplement um, salaries. Um, or benefits and that we could use those for things that we uh, need and desire um, for a department, such as uh, equipment or extra things that we need. Um, um, because I really believe that the fire department needs them and deserves them. So I just want to thank you guys um, for what you do with what you have and um, from my interactions with uh, the, the people that go out into the community. Um, they have been great. They have smiles. Um, they're always willing to, to help the public um, and just being available, um, even when they get called out for things that maybe aren't um, things that they would normally be called out for. They still respond to the calls and they go out and they're willing to help. So uh, with that, 
just thank you for what you do. Thank you for uh, sticking it, you know, sticking in there with us. And uh, and hopefully one day our our circumstances will be a lot different, and um, we will be able to give you guys everything that you you need and deserve. Um, with funds that come in such as this. So thank you. Council Member Fleming. Yeah, you know, um, it's really amazing. The other day I saw a fire truck uh, rolling down 4th Street with Santa on top of it. And then the Rec and Park Department's Rosie had saw Santa inside. So, you know, pretty exciting stuff that you guys get to do and uh, wonderful work. I do have a question. It's, it's not in, in any way intended to be um, combative, and it, I'm going to pose it towards um, our police department as well. When I was re re preparing for council, I noticed a bit of a discrepancy in the administration costs between uh, fire and police, and then um, our uh, the park and rec side. And it, it's 50% higher for you guys, and 50% higher for police to administer these programs than than does the rec and, and park department. And I was just hoping you could speak to. Uh, what is a pretty significant uh, percentage difference in the administration costs? I can take a swing at that. It's actually a finance question, but I'll I'll tell you what that's made up of. Um, the overhead is really made up of all the shared service departments, um, and that's our share of it. Um, things like HR, city attorney, city manager. Um, the city council, those expenditures, anything to do with the shared services get lumped into a bucket and then we get charged out based on the size of our overall bucket, our overall department. So that's where you see police and fire taking a, a, a rather large hit compared to Rec and Park because our budgets are so much bigger. We've got almost a $45 million budget just in fire. Um, so I, I can't really address why those are going up. Um, that's more, like I said, a finance question. Um, and we have no control over those costs. That just happens every year. Okay, that's helpful. And I would be very interested to hear from finance because you would, it would be, it's kind of counterintuitive when you have a larger budget, you would imagine that, you know, you would be able to be a little bit a smaller, a smaller footprint on the administrative side. But I'm, I'm be interested to hear how I'm incorrect in that assumption. Um, I am Veronica Connor here from finance to help with this question. So the split for the administrative costs kind of align with the sales tax split with the sales tax dollars that we get in 40% goes to fire 40% goes to police and 20% goes to violence prevention. So you will see a corresponding difference in the overhead costs. It just is directly related to the size of the operation in each department if that helps. It, it it does not, and here's why. I do appreciate that. I, I did notice that the, each department gets um, to to that point. It gets actually a hundred percent more than Rec and Park, not fifty percent more. Um, Rec and Park gets twenty percent share of the Measure O funding, and each of the safety departments get forty percent. So, um, which is twice as much. Um, I, I won't push the point any further, but um, I just, you know, I do start to wonder um, if we couldn't be a little bit more nimble on the administration side. I do understand you probably get a bill from the city manager's office uh, for for all of the services, and, and I can work with him on trying to better understand how that works. And I, um, I look forward to understanding the nitty gritty of it better and won't hold up the council any further today. And thank you for all your service. Thank you. Seeing no other questions at the moment, let's go on to police. Great. Good afternoon, Mayor Rogers, Council Members. I'm Pam Lawrence, ASO for the Police Department. I'll go over the financial slides and then hand it off to Chief Navarro for the um, operations. Next slide, please. So this slide shows you our beginning fund balance of $756,000. Our revenues of 4.2 million, which were um, higher than expected. And then we had expenditures of about $4 million, leaving us a reserve balance of 958,000. Next slide, please. 
This shows you um, a pie chart of where the funds were spent. As you can see, about 93% were spent on salaries and benefits for our positions. That left us with about 171,000 spent on services and supplies. This covers our downtown enforcement team office lease that we have in the MOTS building, as well as maintenance and fuel on several of our vehicles and insurance, and then the 116,000 in administration costs. Next slide, please. This is a graph showing um, our revenues and expenditures of the program since the inception. Um, as you can see, our revenue, our, our expenses have been steadily increasing due mostly to increase in salaries. Um, this last year, they did dip a little bit, and that was um, due to freezing two school resource officer positions. I'll hand it off to Chief Navarro and then stay on for any questions. Thank you, Pam. Uh, good evening, Council or uh, Mayor Rogers and Council members. Um, so, for fiscal year 2021, I'm sorry. If you can go to the next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, for fiscal year um, 2021, we had uh, 19 positions in Measure O. The slide shows uh, where those positions were, and really, Measure O enhances services throughout our department. <clears throat> Uh, we have a lieutenant who oversees our incident management team and is an integral, integral part of our emergency planning. So whether that's uh, special events that are going on or, uh, some, you know, we have fires or any other major uh, significant uh, incident that's going on, uh, that lieutenant is overseeing uh, much of the teams and much of the operations and planning for those. Uh, that lieutenant also oversees our traffic bureau and is a liaison for our homeless services. Uh, the sergeant that's listed in Measure O, uh, that sergeant manages our downtown enforcement team and is heavily involved in working with our partners to address homeless issues. Uh, we've had several uh, of our officers in patrol uh, that are or in the field services division that are assigned to the downtown enforcement team, our traffic bureau uh, as uh, motors, uh, school resource officers, and, uh, and then also throughout the patrol teams. We also have uh, civilian positions. Our field evidence technicians and community service officers respond in the field to patrol call calls to uh, free up sworn officers to allow them to go to the more uh, urgent priority one calls uh, that they need to go to. And then we have a communication supervisor that is in the um, in Measure O. That communication supervisor provides uh, necessary management for a very busy dispatch center. Uh, they assist with quality control, auditing phone calls. Uh, they also uh, work the work the floor, handle emergencies, and take calls uh, during staffing shortages. Uh, they also have been very. Uh, the manager has also been uh, very integral in uh, handling some of the upgrades to our dispatch center. Next slide, please. So I have a couple of slides here regarding impacts uh, that Measure has uh, Measure O has had to our community. Um, as uh, Pam mentioned, uh, we do have uh, 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 funds that go into our services and supplies. Uh, we have a few uh, vehicles and a few motorcycles that are uh, purchased out of Measure O. But the the but the bulk of our Measure O funds goes to staffing. And uh, that staff, uh, again, provides uh, direct services to address calls for service. Again, the motor officers, they're there to enhance traffic safety, and uh, they also handle many of the grants that we get uh, through the state to address uh, DUI drivers and, um, and increase uh, traffic safety throughout our city. Our downtown enforcement team, they increase presence in the downtown corridor to uh, help impact uh, the businesses, and then they also have been working very uh, uh, hard and closely with our uh, other city departments on some of these uh, homeless issues. And then Measure O also allows us to spread out the workflow to allow staff to collaborate with partners, such as the uh, Violence Prevention Partnership, on um, how to uh, reduce violence and then also engage with the community. And so uh, in the past, we've had uh, the op opportunities to engage with the youth in a positive manner. Uh, we've had SROs who have provided safety at our schools and um, also have headed events such as the GREAT program and every 15 minutes. 
measure, measure O staff are included in our community engagement team, uh, which is vital, especially as we are starting to roll, hopefully roll out of the, the COVID era and uh, get back into uh, more community events. Um, and uh, measure O officers have received over 100 hours of training, including uh, both soft skills and technical skills, uh, but that includes uh, crisis intervention and communication uh, training uh, throughout the year. Next slide, please. <clears throat> the uh, Measure O uh, allows us to better respond to emergencies. Uh, again, Measure O staff were critically or critical and were involved in our incident management team. Uh, and, and this really helped us out when uh, we had to, uh, it's when we were experiencing uh, the, the beginnings of uh, the COVID issue. Uh, they developed policies and protocols uh, for our staff to make sure that we were safe. Uh, they, they made sure that we were uh, purchasing the appropriate equipment and uh, they handled complaints that were coming from the community regarding issues uh, uh, within, you know, for businesses and uh, other complaints that were coming in. Uh, many of the visual positions uh, were involved in the evacuation efforts. Uh, they were either taking calls or they were actually responding to, um, to uh, our evacuation areas. Uh, including the glass fire uh, to evacuate uh, our community uh, members. Again, our uh, downtown enforcement team, they work daily with our host and uh, citywide team to address homelessness. And um, uh, again, we are able to free up other staff to do more of the community engagement, uh, which uh, actually helps with our general fund staff to allow them to go out and do more uh, engagement um, in, their, in their particular beats. Our Measure O staff has been involved in uh, several different uh, opportunities, including uh, the community police experience, coffee with a cop. Uh, they uh, have staff booths over at the Cinco de Mayo festivals, and they've worked with, uh, again, uh, our schools to mentor kids. And uh, they've been uh, a part of uh, being directly involved in uh, some of our services to the businesses uh, in the downtown area. Uh, next slide, please. So we're going to, if you go to the next slide, we'll go to the um, kind of what's going on now. Um, this fiscal year uh, for 21-22, uh, we did have to uh, take some, uh, uh, take another look at uh, what we were doing with Measure O uh, due to uh, some revenue shortages. Uh, we had to make some uh, significant uh, reductions in the police department. Uh, last July, we reduced Measure O by three positions, and those are three uh, school resource officers. And uh, with that, we re returned the, the other two SROs back to patrol uh, to keep up with staffing demands there. So uh, with those three reductions, we now have 16 Measure O staff throughout the department. Uh, as we move forward, we're going to continue to evaluate the most effective ways to uh, utilize Measure O funds. Uh, as uh, we've been working with the finance team, uh, we have uh, been able to see some um, actually um, some improvements in the revenue uh, from Measure O. And so uh, we initially were looking at this year at the possibility of uh, reducing our staff by another officer, but we will not have to do that now uh, because of the revenue. So fortunately, uh, we, we are not planning any more reductions uh, at this time. Um, but uh, we do are we are looking ahead at uh, what uh, Measure O will do and uh, uh, and what we will be needing to do uh, as uh, 2025 uh, comes uh, closer. So uh, with that, uh, I next slide, please. So both Pam and I are here for any questions, uh, if you have any. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much, Chief. Uh, I have a quick question about the SRO program, if you could. Uh, it, it seemed a little bit confusing, just sort of the way that it's played out over the last couple of years. Uh, did we reassign and eliminate some of those positions just because of budget reasons? Or have we heard from the schools that now that students are back that they'd like to see those positions reinstated? Is it a policy decision or is it a budget decision, I guess, is the answer. Uh, that's a very good question, Mayor. So um, it was a it was there was a policy decision um, uh, 
uh, based on uh, the ad hoc committee that was uh, made up uh, through the uh, uh, city of Santa Rosa school board. Um, but uh, we had already had to freeze positions and uh, with the decision not to move forward with SROs, uh, we knew we had to reduce staff because of the budget. And uh, we, since we did not have SROs going back to campus, uh, that was where we decided to uh, make the make make the reductions. If that makes sense, it, it does. So if we, because I get this question all the time from folks, if we heard from the school district that they wanted those positions back, uh, would we entertain that request? Uh, we could. We we will definitely. Uh, look at uh, what we can do. I can tell you that we do not have the staffing available right now uh, because of the reductions. And in order to uh, build an SRO program back up, we're probably looking at a year or a um, year to year and a half uh, to get back to a staffing level where we can actually uh, implement a program. Okay. Any other questions from council members? All right. Thank you so much, Chief. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Pam. Oh, go ahead, Councilmember Fleming. Yes, um, two things. One is um, my question that I said that I would ask of you about the administration costs was adequately answered by the fire department. So just wanted to clear that up. And then uh, unless you have something that's different that applies to, okay, I'm getting the negative nod. <laughs> Thank you. Um, excellent. And I just wanted to share about the um, you know, we, we oftentimes get a lot of complaints about policing, and one of the um, things that I get a positive response about and wanted to share, since it was one of the items listed here that's provided as a result of Measure O, is I, I get emails from citizens and residents who notice the, the patrol officers um, for, the tra for traffic safety, and they're really grateful for, for your service on, on that count. So thank you for all the work you're doing to keep our streets safe. From, from speeding motorists. Thank you, I'll pass that along to staff. Council Member Rogers. Um, and my comment is uh, very similar to the one that I gave for fire. I am hoping that one day um, you guys are able to use um, some of these funds to do other things in the community, uh, more with community engagement and not focus so much on um, supplementing for salary positions um, and things that are a must, but things that you would like to do in the community um, as far as community engagement uh, goes. Um, so thank you very much for, uh, you know, hanging in there with us. And I know, Chief, that this has been really hard um, and your officers are doing a, a great job and I gave a shout out to one of them uh, a few meetings ago. So we are definitely seeing a, a change in um, just the interactions and, and things in the community. And I really, really, really love hearing the positive, the positive stories coming from the community. Um, so community members, keep them coming. We definitely share them. With the, with the department and we share them amongst each other and we share them, um, you know, with everyone. Um, so it, it really is uplifting to our officers to hear that. So thank you so much. Thank you, council member. So we'll go ahead and go to public comment for item 14.1. Uh, if you have a comment on this, go ahead and approach the podium. And I do see a couple of hands on Zoom. So seeing nobody at the chambers, we'll go to Zoom, where we'll start with Annabelle, followed by Gregory. Annabelle, are you able to unmute? Uh, si, sí. español, por favor. Uh, si. Sí. Okay, one moment while I move a translator over for assistance. Uh, yo, si me escucha? Un momento, por favor.
Charles is now on the uh, main channel, uh, ready to assist you. Listo. Ah, sí, yo mi comentario es que estamos en contra de lo que se va a hacer en Rosland, junto a la vía en la que era una escuela. No estamos de acuerdo con el dispensario, porque eso fue un lugar donde estuvieron niños. O sea, que podemos hacer un centro multicultural, podemos hacer un centro comunitario para Rosland, que tanta falta nos hace y no tenemos donde trae el consulado mexicano para renovación de pasaporte y matrícula. Necesitamos un lugar accesible con internet para que pueda trabajar el consulado mexicano. Entonces, sí necesitamos que no pongan ese centro ahí porque es más adicción para los jóvenes. Y si ya tenemos dos o tres lugares que venden, no podemos seguir poniendo más lugares así de cannabis. La mayoría de la comunidad está en contra de ese lugar porque no es un, un lugar sano donde podemos asistir a cosas. Necesitamos un centro comunitario y que nos apoyen ustedes como de la ciudad y encargados que son. Queremos su apoyo de ustedes, que lo quiten por necesidad comunitaria y por apoyar a todos los jóvenes que no queremos que haya más adicciones y cuando se está reproduciendo es olor, cuando se, se hace todo es más adicción a la comunidad. No queremos envenenar más la comunidad de Rosland, siempre ha sido criminalizada y no podemos seguir criminalizando ese lugar por el bien de todos los jóvenes, queremos maestros, queremos presidentes, gobernadores, policías, no queremos puras cosas criminalizando y haciendo que nuestra juventud se pierda por ese cannabis. Esa es mi humilde opinión en esta junta y por eso estoy aquí. Yo siempre he estado en Ruslan apoyando y soy de la junta de CBI y por eso estoy aquí para ser escuchados como miembro de alguna de un programa de una junta haciendo valer nuestra voz que se escuche y que nos apoyen en lo más importante ahorita que es un centro comunitario y no más cannabis en Santa Rosa o en el comunitario de Rosla. Gracias. Gracias. Uh, interpreter would like to clarify this is a comment on the cannabis center was this the right moment for that yeah no go ahead because uh we uh, went through it and i want to make sure council members have an opportunity to hear it understood so, uh, we are against what will be done in roseland at what was once a school this dispensary um there uh kids used to go there and instead of what it's going to be we could make it into a multicultural, uh, multicultural center um it is, or a community center, something that we need, or we could even bring in a Mexican consulate or something else that would help uh, that we could access in the community somewhere, maybe with internet access. Um, so we do not need the place, uh, we do not need that type of uh, building going into that place right there. We don't need that around us. It's just more addiction for our kids. Um, it's basically, uh, we already have two or three other locations that sell this kind of thing, so we can't be putting more cannabis places around. Uh, most of the community is against the installation of this right there. Uh, it's not a healthy place. What we need is a community center, and we need you to support us as the people that are in charge of this city. We want your support to remove it. We want to support the youth, and we don't want any more sources of addiction. And the aroma that it sends out also can cause more addiction. It was always criminalized in the past. So we need things like, that support the residents, that can support whoever governs the city, that support the police, but not things that, are, that were criminalized. We don't want to lose our youth to this. So it is my humble opinion, and, and that is my humble opinion, and that is why I'm here supporting uh, the removal of this. I'm a member of the board of CBI, and that is why I'm here, to be heard as a member of that board, and I want to make sure that our voice is heard. So I think that a community center is going to be the most important thing here. Great. Thank you, Charles. 
Uh, and we'll go ahead and uh, hold that one for council members for in just a little bit. And we'll continue public comment on our item 14.1 measure O uh, report. We'll go to Gregory followed by Ellen. Good evening, my name is Gregory Farron. Uh, one of the slides uh, for the police department, uh, one of the early ones showed a huge spike in expenses uh, in 2009-10, I think it was, almost a doubling of the total expense. I'm sure I, it, there's probably an easy answer to that, but it just seemed too odd for not to be asked about. All right, thank you, Gregory. We'll go ahead and we'll get a response to you after the public comment period. Let's go to Ellen. Hi, can you hear me? Yep. Great. Hi, I'm Ellen Bailey, and I'm uh, the chair of the Citizens Oversight Committee for Measure O, so I get to hear this report prior to the council getting to hear about it. And um, I'm always so impressed, though, to hear about the services that each department brings to the city. And um, I'm very aware, and I think the public is too, but just to reiterate to the public that this Measure O funding is due to sunset in 2025. And 2025 may seem a long ways away for some people, but it really isn't when it comes to the kind of the need we have to preserve this funding for our community. Uh, the loss of that funding means the loss of all the services we've just been hearing about. The Recreation and Parks Neighborhood Services Program, the Choice Grantees, and the Violence Prevention Partnership provides services to our most vulnerable children and families. The School of Rec program that Jeff talked about, Jeff Tibbetts spoke about, is one shining example of the creativity and competence of the staff and the flexibility that the Measure O funds provided to meet the needs of our community during what we all know is unprecedented fires, a pandemic and the tremendous social unrest our, our country has been going through. If we lose Measure O, we'd lose 10 positions at the fire department. And those positions allow for improved response times. And every one of us knows how important that response time means to each and every person that needs that help. And response times for the paramedics who, who respond to individual emergencies as well as community emergencies. We know the fires are going to be a continued part of our lives in California. I wish that wasn't true, but we all know it's going to be. And so we will need to continue to, we will, there's a need that to, I'm not saying this very well. We need to continue to have the measure of funding to meet the needs of our community. And the police department, 19 positions. That's a lot of positions, but those positions provide emergency planning traffic safety. Um, they partner with the homeless issues that we are facing in our community that are huge. Um, they provide calls for service to every incident that comes up where a police officer is needed. They provide critical dispatch services and downtown, downtown enfor enforcement teams and the important community partnerships and the community engagement that's been critical to deal with the social unrest in our own community. So I just want to remind the public that when this comes tax measure, if it gets to be put on the ballot, to remember that it's not just money. We're talking about services, essential services that our community needs and that have been very well provided by these, these departments. Thank you very much. Thank you, Madam Chair. It's the last hand that I see. Do we have any voicemails? We do not, Mayor. All right, I'll bring it back to the council. Uh, Council Member Schwedhelm, I believe this is, yep, this is your item. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I would move a motion to accept the Measure O annual report for fiscal year 2020 and 2021. Second. So we have a motion from Council Member Schwedhelm and a second from Council Member Sawyer. Are there any additional comments from Council Members? Vice Mayor. Thank you, Mayor. I definitely understand the importance of Measure O and what it means to the community, especially with public safety and violence prevention. I'm very happy to say that the, that I feel that the city of Santa Rosa has been using an, an equity lens and, and a lens that, that, that invites our community to participate. We'd hear it here today as we're hearing participants from non-English speaking communities and individuals. I will be supporting this, 
but I do hope that in the future, and as really as I as I grow as a as a, as a public servant, that we fund these programs that do focus on equity more. That the word prevention means more than reactive. And it is my hopes that what we're seeing today can be translated into what we're funding through the programs of Measure O. And it is prevention. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Uh, Adam City Clerk, we have a motion and a second. Can you please call the vote? Yes, thank you. Council Member Tibbetts? Aye. Council Member Schwedhelm? Aye. Council Member Sawyer? Aye. Council Member Fleming? Yes. Council Member Rogers? Aye. Vice Mayor Alvarez? Aye. Mayor Rogers? Aye. That motion passes with seven ayes. Great. Uh, so, Council, we are going to move on to our public hearings for the evening. Uh, it was brought to my attention by staff that 15.2 we have to do tonight. Uh, it's a procedural one, shouldn't take as long as 15.1. So we're going to do 15.2 first, and then we'll come back and do 15.1 uh, after that. So, Mr. City Manager, go ahead and take it away. Mayor Rogers and members of the City Council, item 15.2 is a public hearing. The matter before the, public, uh, the City Council is the Fall 2021 General Plan Amendment Package. It includes a project known as 38 Degrees North Phase 3 and an addendum to a previously approved mitigated negative declaration, general plan diagram and text amendments and rezoning. The Brush Creek Road General Plan Amendment that was originally a part of this fall package has been removed and will be considered at a future meeting in 2022. Adam Ross, City Planner, will be presenting the staff report on this item. Uh, thank you, Mayor Rogers and members of the council. Uh, in council member uh, Schwedhelm, thank you for that. Um, yes, thank you. Uh, my name is Adam Ross, the project planner for the 38 Degrees North Phase 3 project. The site is located at 2660 Petaluma Hill Road uh, within the city of Santa Rosa. This is part of the fall, fall 2021 general plan amendment package. Um, it includes a general plan amendment, uh, rezoning application, and um, design review at a later date with the design review board. Next slide, please. The 38 degrees north phase two project includes a 30 unit multifamily residential development consisting of one 20 unit building and one 10 unit building on a 1.29 acre portion of a 10.87 acre parcel known as a 38 degrees north phase two site. Phase three is designed to operate with phases one and two as a single community. I'll go over phases one and two uh, later on in the presentation. And if approved, the total units for the site it will be 322 units total. And those are all multifamily. Next slide, please. So the general plan, um, the general plan amendment includes a diagram and text amendment. The diagram amendment is uh, to change the site's uh, current land use designations, which is retail and business service, as well as medium density residential, which allows eight to 18 units per acre, to medium high density residential, which allows 18 to 30 units per acre. And it also requests to remove the star symbol from the site's location. The star symbol uh, designates the site as a location for a community shopping center. The text amendment is to remove the reference to the community shopping center on pages 2-12, 2-22, and 2-30 of the general plan text. The zoning map uh, amendment would, is to request the site be changed from CSC, Com Commercial Shopping Center, and PD 96-001C uh, zoning districts to R330, which is multifamily residential. Uh, the project also requires a major design review for new construction greater than 10,000 square feet. And again, that's subject to the design review board uh, review and approval. Next slide, please. Here's an image uh, on the left. It shows the approximate location of, this, of the project site. It's in the southeast quadrant of the city. On the right side, you see an aerial, um, the yellow 
uh, border indicates the the uh, the project boundary. Um, on the northern side, you see some buildings already done. That's phase one. That's uh, already built uh, and occupied. Phase two and phase three are uh, within the kind of undeveloped area of the project site. Next slide, please. So here's a another aerial view, kind of how everything would would look. So if you're looking um, uh, the north, uh, the north arrow would be to the right of the screen. If you're looking at this uh, as it's laid out. Um, so on the right side, you see 38 degrees north, phase one. That's the multifamily currently built and occupied. Phase two is in the middle where that cursor was. Um, there's a little section in between, which is a 2.5 acre open space preserve. Again, I'll go over that a little bit uh, later in the slides. And then the, the colored section um, shows the uh, requested 30 additional units under phase three. Next slide, please. So here's a kind of zoomed in photo or picture of the site plan for phase three. It would, uh, again, it would uh, work in uh, um, kind of a cohesive, uh, uh, it, would, it would work cohesively with, it would integrate uh, with phase one and phase two, and it would take access off of, a, of, of an approved, approved entrance for phase two. And you can see both the 10 plex and the 20 plex uh, face, um, uh, face Petaluma Hill Road and Farmers Lane. Next slide, please. So the date is actually incorrect. It should say August 17th, 20, uh, 2017, uh, instead of 2021. Uh, that's when the design review board approved phase one. Uh, phase one is a 120 unit multifamily housing development with on-site amenities and a state density bonus uh, on a 5.03 acre site. Six of those units are dedicated to very low income residents and 12 of the units are dedicated to low income residents. For the phase one, there was a mitigated negative, negative declaration adopted. Next slide, please. This is a repeat of that previous one. So you can skip this slide, please. In, on August 20th, uh, it should say 2019, the design review board approved phase two, which is 172 unit multifamily housing development with on-site amenities. That is a market rate project. Um, it's the total site, uh, the total area of phase two is 10.87 acres. That does include a 2.54 acre open space preserve and 1.29 acres are preserved were preserved uh, for a 21,000 square foot community shopping center as required by the general plan uh, diagram and text. Uh, that phase two also included a mitigated negative declaration for which it was adopted. And that project for, and phase two is currently, again, it's entitled and it's currently in plan review for public improvement plans and grading plans with the city. Uh, next slide, please. So a bit of the project history of phase three. Um, in May of this year, a neighborhood meeting was held. Uh, there was a concept design review held with the design review board um, earlier this year on July 15th. Um, applications were submitted. The major design review is currently being reviewed by staff. Um, on October 28th, uh, there was a an SB18 tribal consultation meeting that was held, a follow-up meeting was held on December 1st of this year. During that meeting, a request was made uh, for, a, um, uh, for a tribal monitor to be uh, added as a condition of approval uh, and as approved by the, uh, by the local tribe. The applicant did agree to those conditions of approval and um, they have already entered into a contract with a, an approved tribal monitor. There are a few uh, um, clarify, uh, sorry, there are a few additions to the uh, agenda items that staff's ready to read into the public record at the appropriate time. That would be a paragraph identifying that tribal um, SB18 tribal consultation meeting in the addendum. And that is all, that addendum is also the exhibit A of the project. So that's the same um, addition of a paragraph there. And then just reference to the revised date 
of December 9th of 2021, uh, which reflects the tribal um, uh, monitor uh, being added to the addendum and the uh, and the MMRP. And so that would also just have clarifying dates on the ordinance and the two resolutions. Um, and then on November 18th of 2021, the Planning Commission approved the recommendation for Council to adopt the addendum, the general plan amendments, and the rezoning application. Next slide, please. So the current site's general plan land use designation is both retail and business service and uh, medium density residential. The medium density residential allows 18 to, uh, 8 to 18 units per acre. And the star symbol, which you can see there, uh, indicates a community shopping center uh, location, uh, community shopping center to be located at this site. Next slide, please. So here's a general plan, the, the uh, existing and proposed, uh, which is provided in the agenda packet and part of the staff report. As you can see that on the left side, there's the star symbol, the phase one and phase two. Uh, border, and then on the right is what the site would look like on the general plan diagram should the pro should the council approve the project. Um, so it would just be one uh, medium high density residential land use designation. Next slide, please. So the text amendment is required to kind of uh, continue the removal of the star symbol. So that would remove the reference to a community shopping center at the site on page 2-12 of the general plan. It would remove the reference to community shopping center uh, in table 2-4 on page 2-20 under general plan policy LULE1. And it would remove the reference to a community shopping center at Petaluma Hill Road at Yolanda Avenue on page 2-22 policy number, uh, policy LULG1 and remove reference to the community shopping center on page 2-30 policies LULW and LULW1. And on the right side, it kind of is just identified as strike throughs of where that would be removed. Um, so it would, uh, it would just, it's, tri it's stricken through, but they would be removed from the, from the actual text. Next slide, please. As part of the request, um, there was a market study completed with this project, uh, analyzing the feasibility of a community shopping center at this site. You see a one mile, two mile, and three mile radius uh, diagrams. The project is within half a mile to the Santa Rosa Marketplace, uh, which does include anchor tenants such as Target, Costco, and there's also Trader Joe's there, which provide grocery um, uh, uh, grocery store items, and it's within three quarters of a mile of Smart and Final Extra, another grocery store uh, type retail establishment. What's also not shown here is that within half a mile to the north of the, of the site on Petaluma Hill Road is Lola's Market, which is a, a small grocery store. Um, and uh, next slide, please. And so just to reiterate, the market analysis was by Zonda. It's a market research and consulting firm specializing in the real estate industry. And within that study, which is where that uh, image came from, it concluded that the 38 degrees north site does not support any anchor retail uses, nor does it uh, and does not support uh, a grocery store anchor in particular. Uh, next slide, please. In addition to that, the current va commercial vacancy rates in Sonoma County and Santa Rosa are as shown here. So you have 7.7% or 289,000 square feet um, of commercial vacancy rates in Sonoma County. This is based off of um, uh, eight quarter um, uh, vacancy rates provided by Keegan and Copen, um, a commercial real estate firm. Uh, and uh, within Santa Rosa specifically, uh, you have an 8.4% vacancy rate or 672,301 square feet. And within the Santa Rosa marketplace, you have 6.1% or 34,294 square feet. And again, that's half a mile from the 38 degrees north site. Next slide, please. Uh, in addition to that, one of the benefits the city receives is 30 additional units. Um, it is 1.17% of the housing action plan um, goal to by provi of providing 2,550 units by 2022. Um, 
So that's just in addition to uh, into the findings for a general plan amendment. Next slide, please. So here are some of the policies for uh, that the uh, proposal would implement, um, which father, uh, fosters a compact rather than scattered development pattern in order to reduce travel, energy, land, and materials consumption while promoting greenhouse gas emissions reduction citywide. It uh, does not allow development at less than the minimum density, and it requires it be at the medium uh, midpoint or higher for medium and medium high density residential categories and it meets the housing needs of all Santa Rosa residents. Next slide, please. So within that, um, and I just wanted to reiterate that uh, this request to remove the uh, commercial shopping center, uh, community shopping center from the site does not preclude uh, in the future any um, community shopping centers. Uh, they are allowed within commercial zoning districts um, and so if the market ever changed in the uh, future, someone else can propose a community shopping center and therefore put in a grocery store in this area. Um, and so moving on to the zoning map amendment um, request. So the project site as shown in the image is currently uh, zoned as CSC, which is community shopping center. That's in uh, response to the general plan uh, location of the community shopping center on the diagram and PD 96-001C, which is uh, a PD zoning district. Um, those would, the request would change those to R330, which is the multifamily residential zoning district. Next slide, please. Here's some proposed elevations for reference. Again, the design would be completed, uh, approved by the design review board. The top image shows kind of like the looking uh, northeast from across Petaluma Hill Road, and the bottom image looks like it's uh, looking directly across um, from Petaluma Hill Road, looking east to the to the proposed site. Next slide, please. The CEQA, under CEQA guidelines section 15164 it provides that an addendum to an approved EIR is appropriate when only minor technical changes or additions are made, but none of the conditions described in section 15162 has occurred. And the addendum to the 38 degrees north phase two mitigated negative declaration concluded that the proposed project would not cause a new significant environmental uh, would not cause any new significant environmental impacts or substantial increases in the severity of significant effects beyond those previously identified as part of the city's environmental review process. And none of the circumstances under CEQA guidelines section 15162 were triggered. Therefore, no additional analysis is required. Uh, so that's why staff identified an addendum to the previously approved MND um, be uh, appropriate for the project. And within that, nothing found that there were any uh, additional or greater impacts than then what was previously uh, analyzed on the site. Next slide, please. Some public comments were received um, early on during the, um, mostly during the uh, neighborhood meeting and then uh, later on when the, uh, in response to the planning commission public hearing notice. Um, that was a concern about removing the community shopping center designation from the site. And then there were uh, concerns about construction impacts to the surrounding area from fugitive dust and noise. Um, so in response to the first uh, concern, again, you know, the market study shows that the commercial zoning district is, or sorry, the uh, grocery store use is overserved in the area and couldn't support now or in the future um, uh, a community shopping center at the site. And again, that doesn't preclude one from being put in in the uh, in the area at a future uh, date, should the market change at some point in time. Um, and the project is, um, is required to comply with uh, standard construction impacts for noise and fugitive dust. Noise is subject to the uh, noise ordinance um, within city code and the fugitive dust that is a requirement um, such as you know daily twice watering down 
uh, dirt and dust um, areas, sweeping, keeping it clean. Uh, those are standard conditions, um, and the applicant is obviously more than willing to uh, comply with those uh, conditions of approval, which is found within the addendum. Next slide, please. So it is recommended by the Planning Commission and the Economic Development Department that the City Council, by two resolutions, adopt an addendum to the MND for the uh, 38 degrees north phase two site. Sorry, adopt an addendum for the, for the uh, 38 degrees north phase three project uh, to the 38 degrees north phase two MND, that's a resolution, and approve a general plan diagram and text amendment, that's another resolution, to change the land use designations to medium high density residential, remove the star symbol designating a future community shopping center, remove reference to a community shopping center in the southeast portion of the city in table 2-4, on page 2-20 under general plan policy LUL E1, remove reference to a community shopping center at Petaluma Hill Road and Yolanda Avenue on page 2-22 uh, policy LUL G1 and remove reference to the community shopping center on page 2-30 policies LULW and LULW1. And it is recommended by the Planning Commission and the Planning and Economic Development Department that the council introduce an ordinance to adopt a rezoning ordinance uh, rezoning ordinance to amend the zoning map for the property uh, located at 2660 Petaluma Hill Road to R330. Next slide, please. And that concludes staff's presentation. Uh, again, my name is Adam Ross, and I am ready to answer any questions you may have. The applicant does not have a presentation, but is here and um, will speak on the matter and answer any questions that the council may have as well. Thank you. All right, thank you so much, Adam. Let's go ahead and start and see if we have any questions from council members. I'm seeing none, so we'll go ahead and open the public hearing. If you're interested in providing comment on this public hearing, go ahead and hit the raise hand feature on Zoom or approach the podium. Again, this is for item 15.2. I see one hand, we'll go to Dave. Dave, are you able to unmute? Yes, I'm sorry. Can you hear me? Yes, we can, go ahead. Oh. Good. Good evening, Mayor Rogers and council members. Uh, I'm Dave Eady, the applicant, speaking on behalf of uh, Kennedy Wilson. I don't know if you can see me on Zoom, but if you can, pardon my casual mode of dress. I'm here in Hawaii, and uh, a Hawaiian shirt is the uh, business attire here. So um, I'd like to express our uh, appreciation to staff for their very competent presentation and uh, report and their guidance along the way as we've gone here. Um, and since the rationale we've set forth in our application is quite clearly distilled for you in the staff report and uh, was unanimously embraced by the Planning Commission, I'll just be very brief with a few points of emphasis. Um, Zonda, the uh, company Adam referred to that is a uh, nationally recognized market research firm, uh, has conducted many, many market studies like this over the decades and uh, has uh, revealed in this study, as he told you, that in the foreseeable future, there's no commercially viable potential for a commercial land use here. Uh, Zonda concluded, concluded notably that the uh, uh, since the general plan was adopted, you have three new grocery stores and outlets in the area. Um, their demand model and findings further, further illustrate that uh, any anchor uh, retail use, and in particular, a grocery store anchor is not supportable. Uh, there's more supply and demand, clearly, that's been mentioned uh, for every nearly, almost every nearly uh, every retail category. Local brokers that were interviewed concur with these conclusions, and uh, traffic levels at the site are insufficient to support commercials. So 
Um, I think that when we went, when we came to uh, the property and started looking at possibly uh, a retail side of the business here, which we do in addition to apartments, uh, and looked at this opportunity, we were just convinced that it was not a suitable site for a commercial shopping center. Uh, to us, the most telling thing was the property owner that sold it to us, Winco Foods, uh, who is a grocery developer and operator, uh, sold the property because the company no longer considered there to be a demand for a grocery store at this location. You know, so that's the course we took and uh, decided to file for the general plan amendment and zone change to hopefully uh, permit a uh, residential component to be added here to the site and round out the total block, if you will, to 322 units. Um, so with your hopeful uh, approval tonight, uh, we're pretty confident that the site preparation and development for phase two, which is just getting started and can overlap, uh, and that's, that way we'll avoid likely construction impacts created by removing construction equipment off phase two and only to have it bring back for phase three. So I know as I'm out of time here, so I just wanted to uh, state that we concur with the staff's findings. Appreciate the planning commissions uh, that they found the proposal merited their support and urge your approval. And I'm uh, here to answer questions. Great, thank you so much. Seeing nobody else rise. Uh, Dina, did we have any voicemails? We do not, Mayor. Okay, we'll close the public hearing, bring it back to council to see if there's any additional questions and or comments. Okay, so we have two resolutions and an ordinance. I'm gonna to come to council member Rogers for resolution number one. Um, I would like to make a motion to adopt a resolution of the Council of the City of Santa Rosa adopting an addendum to the approved 38 degrees north phase two initial study mitigative negative declaration including a mitigation monitoring and reporting program state clearing house number 2020060247 for general plan amendment zoning map uh, amendment and development of 38 degrees north phase three a 30 unit multifamily development located at 2660 petaluma hill road santa rosa apns 044-37 Zero dash zero zero two and zero four four dash three seven zero dash zero one zero and zero four four dash zero five one dash zero seven three and zero four four dash zero five one dash zero five five and file number PRJ two one dash zero one one and wait for the reading of the text. I'll second that. We have a motion from council member Rogers and a second from the vice mayor. Uh, Adam, you have a, an issue? Uh, not an issue. I just, uh, there, there, I just want to read into the public record, the, uh, additions to the addendum identifying the cultural resource, I'm sorry, the tribal monitor and, um, the dates in the, uh, ordinance and resolutions to reflect the, uh, amended date of that, uh, addendum. Yep, please go ahead. Great, okay. So the first one, there's six total. The first one is update the update the date on the first page to December of 2021 of the initial study uh, of the addendum. Um, and the uh, add an additional paragraph that identifies a tribal monitor be added on pages 20 through 21, which reads, Though cultural resources do not require additional analysis, it should be noted that as part of the tribal notification and consultation process carried out by the city consistent with SB 18, which is triggered when a project is proposing a general plan amendment, representatives from the Federated Indians of Great and Rancheria requested that a tribal monitor be required during ground disturbing activities. To reflect the request made during the consultation process, the cultural resource monitoring plan originally prepared by Evans and DeShazo on August 19, 2019, has been updated to include a provision that a 
Federation of Indians of Great and Rancheria approved travel monitor be on site during ground disturbing activities. Mitigation measure CL1, CLU-1, which requires compliance with all monitoring protocols and procedures identified in the cultural resource monitoring plan has been updated to reference the CRMP revision date of December 6, 2021, and also includes a requirement for an FIGR approved monitor on site consistent with the request made during the consultation process. This addition does not constitute a new or more significant impact, and as such, no further discussion of cultural resources is warranted. And uh, ongoing, um, to add a to the to add to the second sentence in the next paragraph on page 21, to read an updated version of the phase two MMRP is included in appendix E here too and shows proposed changes, including changes to CUL-1-1 as discussed above and strike through indicating deleted text and underlined indicating new text. Uh, second portion, um, the exhibit A is, the, is also the uh, addendum that is to be attached to the res resolution for the addendum so that uh, same change applies to pages 20 through 21. Number three, the staff re report reflects the initial study, um, sorry, the addendum to the initial study and MND's modified date on page 14 under the environmental section as follows. Um, which would read an addendum to the adopted 2020 MND was prepared on October 22nd, 2021 and revised on December 9, 2021 and reviewed by city staff. Item four, add the following words and revised on December 9, 2021 to the first sentence of the second paragraph of section four. So that section reads an addendum to the adopted 2020 MND was prepared on October 22nd, 2021 and revised on December 9, 2021 and reviews by city staff. Item five, change the date of the reference exhibit A at the end of page four of resolution one, adopting the addendum to read exhibit A, addendum and mitigation monitoring and reporting program dated December, 2021. Final item, item six, Add the following words and revise on December 9, 2021 to the first sentence of the second paragraph of finding D. So that section reads, an addendum to the adopted 2020 MND was prepared on October 20th, 2021 and revised on December 9, 2021 and reviewed by city staff. And that concludes the uh, minor changes to the, item, to the agenda items. I appreciate that. Uh, council so member, moved. do you accept those? So moved. And the, the second? I, I will say, I will keep my second. Perfect. Let's go ahead and call the vote. Council Member Tibbetts? Aye. Council Member Schwedhelm? Aye. Council Member Sawyer? Aye. Council Member Fleming? Yes. Council Member Rogers? Aye. Vice Mayor Alvarez? Aye. Mayor Rogers? Aye. That motion passes with seven ayes. Okay, let's go on to resolution two. I would like to make a motion to adopt resolution of the Council of the City of Santa Rosa, amending the general plan diagram and text for the 38 degrees North Phase 3 project from retail and business services and medium density residential to medium high density residential and remove the star symbol at the project site. Amend the general plan text to remove reference to the community shopping center on pages uh, 2-12 and 2-20 and 2-4 for the property at 2660 Petaluma Hill Road, Santa Rosa 044-370-002 and 044-370-003 one, um, excuse me, zero one zero and zero four four dash zero five one dash zero seven three and zero four four dash zero five one dash zero five five and file number PRJ two one dash zero one one and wave for the reading of the text. Second. We'll uh, clarify at the end of the resolution as well, the GPAM 21-001. Yes, that. And wait for the reading of the text. All right, we have a motion in from Council Member Rogers and a second from Council Member Tibbetts. Let's call the vote. Council Member Tibbetts? Aye. 
Councilmember Schwedhelm? Aye. Councilmember Sawyer? Aye. Councilmember Fleming? Yes. Councilmember Rogers? Aye. Vice Mayor Alvarez? Aye. Mayor Rogers? Aye. That motion passes with seven ayes. And finally, the ordinance. <laughs> All right. I would like to make a motion to adopt ordinance of the Council of the City of Santa Rosa rezoning the property located at 2660 Petaluma Hill Road, also identified as assessor's parcel numbers 044-370-002 and 044-370-010 and 044-051-073 and 044-051-074. Dash zero five five from the CSC Community Shopping Center and PD nine six dash zero zero one C to the R three dash three zero multifamily residential district zoning file number PRJ two one dash zero one one also REZ two one dash zero zero two and wait for the reading of the text. Second. Motion from Councilmember Rogers and a second from Councilmember Tibbetts. Let's call that vote. Okay, Mayor, I'd like to clarify that this mo this ordinance is not being adopted. It's being introduced. Yes. Okay, thank you. I'm sorry, who was the second? Uh, Tibbetts. Thank you. Councilmember Tibbetts? Aye. Councilmember Schwedhelm? Aye. Councilmember Sawyer? Aye. Councilmember Fleming? Yes. Councilmember Rogers? Aye. Vice Mayor Alvarez? Aye. Mayor Rogers? Aye. That motion passes with seven ayes. Okay, Adam and Sue, that's all we need for item 15.2, correct? Uh, yes, that's correct. Great. Uh, Council, I know we've been at it for a long time now, so I, I apologize folks, we're gonna take a quick dinner break and we will be back at seven o'clock.
Okay. Thank you. Good evening. Let's um, continue with our meeting. As Madam Clerk, can you roll, call the roll, please? Yes, thank you. Council Member Tibbetts? Here. Council Member Schwedhelm? Here. Council Member Sawyer? Here. Council Member Fleming? Here. Council Member Rogers? Present. And um, Vice Mayor Alvarez will be um, abstaining from the item as well as Mayor Rogers will also be abstaining from the item. Thank you, Madam Clerk. So the first thing we need to do is just check with the council any ex parte communications you would like to um, divulge. Council Member Schweitel. Thank you. Yes, um, I've been inside the site, toured the site, and I've recently spoken to my planning commissioner, and this morning I spoke with um, the chair of the planning commission and did not learn any new information that's not contained in the public record. Thank you. Council Member Fleming. I received a call from an uh, agent with 421 Group last week, had a brief conversation, learned no new information. Thank you. Council Member Rogers. And Council Member Tibbetts. Uh, no communications that I can recall about this project. Okay, thank you. And I did speak with um, my planning commissioner and um, received a couple of calls from the applicant, um, but no conversations and no conversations with the, with the appellant. So um, moving on, um, this, I'd like to ask if the um, if the council has any questions for staff at this point, and, and then what the what staff will be looking for this evening, um, and maybe the best way to do that would be that to to um, have our uh, staff presentation, um, Ms. Tumian's um, report in. Is she here? On Zoom. <clears throat> yes, Council Member Sawyer, the, the matter before the council tonight is the I think public you're on, hearing. I think you're on, are you muted? I don't oh. believe so. Shouldn't be. Okay. Um, the matter before the council tonight is the public hearing of the appeal of the old school cannabis project conditional use permit located at 100 Sebastopol Road, CUP 21-027. Kristen A. Tumians, our senior planner, will be presenting the staff report on this public hearing this evening. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you, Council Member Rogers and members of the City Council. My name is Kristen A. Tumians, senior planner, and I'd like to present the Old School Cannabis Appeal um, located at 100 Sebastopol Road. Next slide, please. So the project um, involves a, a proposed cannabis retail cultivation, distribution, and manufacturing facility. It um, will host all four uses in a 20,840 square foot building. And the proposed uh, retail hours are from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. seven days a week. Uh, next slide, please. It's located in uh, Southwest Santa Rosa in Roseland off of Sebastopol Road. Next slide, please. And here's an aerial uh, shot of the project site. It's a vacant um, former uh, charter school. Um, that's uh, the applicant proposes to operate a cannabis business. Um, you can see that the um, property is bounded by Sebastopol Road, Timothy Road, and Smart Rail. Next slide, please. And here are some um, street view images of the vacant site at the moment. Next slide, please. And here is a 1,000-foot um, radius um, showing the um, distance between the current proposed uh, cannabis retail location and um, another, another approved cannabis location known as uh, Phenotopia at the uh, shopping center at the corner of Dutton and Sebastopol. So this just demonstrates that um, there, the proposed project um, meets the over-concentration uh, requirement um, required by city ordinance. Next slide, please. And this is the um, zone, general plan and zoning for the project site. So the front 
third um, has a general plan designation of medium residential and the two thirds southern portion of the property is as a general plan designation of general industry um, or sorry light industry and the entire property is zoned light industrial uh, the building sits on the industrial portion of um, the industrial zoned portion of the site and um, the requested uses are allowed in the light industrial zoning district next slide please so here's a site plan showing the existing conditions so we have an entrance off Sebastopol Road and one off of Timothy next slide please this is the applicant's proposal it would have a um, a block wall along Timothy Road with a gate and a see-through wrought iron fence along Sebastopol Road with gates that would be open during um, operating hours um, the parking lot would serve um, the cannabis use as well as that um, vacant corner store on the on Sebastopol and Timothy and um, there's an interior court uh, interior courtyard of the parking lot that would be fenced to allow for secure deliveries um, in and out of the uh, business. Next slide, please. Um, the on-site consumption portion, which is part of the retail delivery use, um, is located in the red circle and it's proposed as a um, sort of a gated outdoor lounge um, screened from public view. Next slide, please. And the red lines that you see outline um, a system of gates that are proposed um, that would allow for uh, security around the manufacturing portion that would occur in that red rectangle in the center of your screen. And the overall gates um, and fences along the what you see on the red lines would allow for um, secure transport of product in and out of the facility. Um, and the retail portion would still be accessible to the public um, when those operations take place. Next slide, please. And so this is the um, the parking um, situation at the property. They are required to have 28 spaces given the four different uses proposed. And there are 60 spaces available total on the site. So they have more than enough parking um, to meet their needs. Uh, next slide, please. This is the proposed floor plan. The red um, rectangle indicates where the volatile manufacturing would occur. It's a um, specially designed um, building that it would be um, reviewed by um, our building and fire departments and be required to have um, annual inspections um, as well. Um, all part, all um, outlined in the cannabis ordinance for uh, volatile manufacturing. As you can see, the, the light gray towards the top of your screen, that portion would be the retail, um, cannabis retail portion. And the outdoor lounge is indicated just north of that. Next slide, please. And here we have the proposed um, elevation. The, the applicant proposes um, some light renovations to the building, the addition of that outdoor lounge. Next slide, please. Here's a, a perspective of the proposed entry. The entry would be visible from um, Sebastopol Road, which is a requirement of the cannabis ordinance. Next slide, please. And here are current and are existing and proposed um, elevation, uh, uh, existing street view and proposed renderings um, of the project site. So the applicant proposes a see through wrought iron fence along Sebastopol Road. Next slide, please. And here it would be the view along Timothy, where they propose a um, block wall and gate. Next slide, please. Um, actually, if we could skip to Appellant 2, which is um, actually, I'll just continue. Um, 
my understanding is appellant, oh, sorry. Appellant number one would like to move to be appellant number two um, in the order um, that you hear them tonight. I'll, I'll just discuss appellant number one's um, concerns. Um, he states that environmental justice and social equity discrimination by Santa Rosa against Roseland residents and the Santa Rosa General Plan 2035 states that Santa Rosa will be safe and a livable com community. He also states currently three homicides in Santa Rosa during 2021, all in disadvantage overburden community of Roseland. Another drug dealer in area decreases safety and livability. And just to address those um, staff provided responses in the staff report, but just to give you a summary, um, the in December of 2017, the city council unanimous, unanimously adopted the city's comprehensive cannabis ordinance and the regulations address locational and operational requirements for commercial cannabis related businesses. Um, and the, the ordinance allows the city to direct these land uses to appropriate areas of the city and also establishes a public review process for permits. And it includes um, requirements of the applicants that address uh, land use compatibility, odor, security, safety, health, lighting, parking, and noise. And the applicant has demonstrated compliance with um, the cannabis ordinance um, as far as mitigating for voter security, lighting, parking, and noise. So, and, and staff is unaware of any homicides related to legal cannabis retail dispensaries or legal cannabis related uses within the city limits. Um, and the zoning code requires uh, cannabis businesses to provide adequate security, ensure public safety, the safety of persons in the facility to protect um, the business premises from theft. Um, and the applicants are required to provide a security plan that includes lighting, alarms, secure storage and, and waste, uh, procedures for safe transport of products and currency, controlled busy building access like alarms and emergency access and they are required to have um, high quality cameras um, installed. The applicant is also proposing to replace the existing chain link fence around the perimeter of the property um, with a new, as I stated, a uh, wrought iron security fence and uh, with two gates along Sebastopol Road and the gates would be secured at the close of business. And then there would be a, a block wall along Timothy um, with a gate as well. Next slide, please. So this just summarizes my um, staff responses to opponent number one. This um, slide shows the cannabis retail applications um, as of May 15th, 2021. Um, I have a, a better slide to show you towards the end of my presentation, but this was the, the map that I had when I prepared <laughs> for this meeting. The, um, City Planning uh, Division uh, prepared a interactive map that's available on the Canvas website. Um, this one shows where the um, existing um, proposed, approved, and pending cannabis locations are in the city, and they're indicated by a triangle shape. And they're distributed throughout the city, and um, they don't appear to be concentrated in the Roseland area. Next slide, please. Uh, another issue is the term drug dealer refers to an illegal activity that does not accurately describe the proposed project. Next slide, please. Next slide, <clears throat> next slide, please. And this just describes the security measures that the applicant um, will implement as part of the project, which includes the, the fencing and gates. Um, and as stated before, the distribution activities will occur behind a secondary gate, which would act similar to a Sally port. Next slide, please. So for um, appellant number two, she states that a uh, proper notification of the public notice to the community in the surrounding area during the September 23rd, 2021 meeting 
Uh, many people that live on Timothy stated they did not receive the notice in the mail and the notification on the gate was in English. There was a halt on the meeting on September 9th, 2021, which only allowed the community two weeks to come forward to participate in the meeting. Santa Rosa did not did make changes to the process to continue with the approval on September 23rd. The process should have been restarted and the community given the proper time to comply with the process to speak to neighbors that did not receive the notice. So uh, next slide, please. Um, just to address the first um, issue that appellant um, number two raised, um, <clears throat> On August 27th, planning staff mailed a notice of application to notify surrounding property owners within 600 feet of the project site of the proposed project. Um, the um, item was scheduled for the September 9th planning commission, but on the, the day before, um, staff received a request for uh, translation services from English to Spanish. Um, after receiving that request, um, Staff postponed the, um, the, the uh, continued the planning commission meeting to September 23rd, which would which allowed for staff to secure um, professional translation services from um, English to Spanish. For, um, the appellant's uh, next issue was um, there are children that live directly across the street from this facility. Having a consumption area and patrons leaving the facility puts the community at risk with possible DUI in close proximity to families that live on either side of the dispensary. Also the use of type seven manufacturers which allow the use of volatile solvents for extraction or post-processing refinement of cannabis extract. The risk of explosion in a highly populated area once again puts families at risk of harm. This area have high cases of asthma, heart disease, diabetes, and a lower life expectancy due to high levels of exhaust from the highway, um, the 101 freeway, the 12 highway and diesel, diesel trucks that are up and down the Sebastopol corridor. So city's responses, um, the, can, the city's cannabis ordinance requires that cannabis retail facilities be located at least 600 feet from a K through 12 school but there's no prohibition of cannabis retail facilities from residential areas or areas where children are living. Um, the applicant does propose to operate a cannabis retail dispensary with on-site consumption. Um, and that as stated before, the perimeter would be secured with fences and gates. Um, and the applicant has a um, robust security plan. And as far as the on-site consumption, um, the code requires that um, neither patients or customers be permitted to co consume cannabis um, um, on, the, on the site um, unless they have a, a use permit that, allow, that specifically allows on-site consumption. And those, the requirements in the code for on-site consumption include um, that the applicant um, have a specific area designated for that, that doesn't allow um, anyone under 21 to enter, and that it be um, appropriately labeled. And um, the city has an even um, stricter ordinance that does not permit any smoking. So any um, cannabis consumption that is consumed on site cannot include smoking or vaping. Next, next slide, please. Next slide, please. And then just to address the, um, the concern with volatile um, cannabis manufacturing, the city code requires that the applicant use a closed loop system and that it be listed or certified by an approved third party testing agency or licensed by a professional engineer. And it has to be approved for the intended use by the city's building official and fire official. And the city requires that the licensed professional engineer annually recertify the extraction equipment. 
Um, and um, volatile manufacturing is not limited to, to just cannabis um, oil extraction. It, it has also been used in, um, for example, food additive and uh, perfume industry, um, just as an example of where it's also used. Next slide, please. And this, this project qualifies for a number of exemptions given that um, it involves very minor modifications to the structure and site and um, a, a no expansion to uh, the use. Um, it's also an infill project and it's also consistent with the city's general plan and the Rosen Area Sebastopol Road specific plan for which EIRs are prepared and certified. And if I could skip the next slide and just show the newer maps that we have available on the city's website. So this is a, um, a global map of uh, the operating approved and, and cannabis retail applications under review. And I just wanted to show how many um, the city currently has um, per quadrant just to show that um, they're fairly evenly distributed along major corridors through the city that pass you know, north, south, um, east, and west. Next slide, please. And I have it um, broken down by quadrant and you can see um, where they're dotted around um, and spread out throughout the city. The blue hatch marks that you're seeing are um, K through 12 schools and that, that would prevent a applicant from locating a cannabis retail facility within that thousand feet proximity. Next slide, please. So this is the Northwest. Next slide, please. And here's the Southeast. So we have five approved and two operating. And then next slide would be the Roseland area. So we have four approved, one operating, one pending, and the current one that's appealed. And with that, um, it is recommended by the Planning and Economic Development Department and the Planning Commission that the council by resolution deny the appeals of the Planning Commission's decision to approve a conditional use permit um, to allow a 2,350 square foot of retail dispensary with delivery and on-site consumption, 17,120 square feet of commercial cultivation, 870 square feet of dis for distribution, and 500 square feet of manufacturing level two volatile at 100 Sebastopol Road. Staff is available for comments and questions. Thank you, Ms. Tumian. Um, council, questions of staff at this point? Council Member Schwedham. Thank you, Council Member Sawyer. And this just may be a clarification. On the project narrative, when I was reading it specifically, I had that interest in the closed loop system. On page six, attachment four, it says the uh, it won't be used until inspected by the Sebastopol city building official and fire chief. I'm making the assumption that it should be Santa Rosa and we have the training in. Yes, so that that's an error. It would be Santa Rosa and we have approved other volatile cannabis manufacturing facilities elsewhere in the city. So this is not a, um, a new use that's proposed or a novel use that's proposed. Great, so does that language for whatever happens today, does that need to be changed by motion of the council or is, I'm not sure how, um, what the project narrative it has any legal requirements. Maybe this would be for the city attorney. Uh, yes, it would be helpful to have that clarified uh, in the motion. Great, thank, thank you. you. Um, I had a few questions. Um, the first is, I'm not sure if you can answer this or if the chief is on, but has uh, cannabis locations increased crime um, in any of the quadrants throughout the city or additional calls for service?
Chief Navarro is no longer viewable via Zoom. Um, that's not going to get it answered. Um, and, um, are there other locations, uh, cannabis locations, uh, near, uh, it seems to be a lot of residential units surrounding this one in the industrial light, light industrial is like kind of in the middle, but around, um, um, is just residential. So is this uh, just specific to this area or? We have other um, areas where residential um, abuts industrial areas and where they, there are cannabis, um, various cannabis operations. Um, but the most uh, notable that comes to mind is Yolanda Avenue. Uh, there are several um, cannabis related uses, including um, approved retail locations and directly behind um, uh, those industrial um, campuses, uh, there are residential uses. Another one that comes to mind would be Piner Road. So there are uh, mobile home parks behind um, um, the various residential uses directly behind the uses, behind the cannabis uses because I'm not familiar, and if you don't know, you can just say you don't know. Um, do you happen to know the, the types of residential um, housing that is near those uh, cannabis facilities? Are they uh, single-family homes that are, um, are they low-income housing? What, what type of housing um, is located? I can answer specifically for the example on Yolanda Avenue, but um, they are uh, single family residences that um, share a rear yard with the industrial campus that house the cannabis uses. Okay. Um, and then lastly, uh, the site that we're, we're looking at tonight, um, will this site have a permit for on site consumption? Yes, that's part of the project description, and um, that's what they're requesting. It would be a component of their retail operation. Okay, I just wanted to clarify um, because I believe it was a appellant two uh, made a point to say that there were children nearby and the response was um, multiple things, but one was only if there was a permit for use, which there will be a permit for use. So there is a reason to be concerned for appellant two. So I just wanted to make sure that we were clear on that one. Okay, thank you. Thank you, council member. Do we have a representative from the um, SRPD to respond to the questions regarding calls for service? I believe the chief is gonna be promoted here in just a second. Excellent, thank you. Yes, he's online now. Welcome, chief. Hello, um, so we don't have the, I don't have the data right now. We don't have anything that would um, uh, anything significant that would show that there's a, a significant increase in crime. Uh, we do have uh, crimes from time to time, but uh, no, no major spikes that, that uh, I can report out at this time, but we can get some further data at a later date. Thank you. Does that answer your question, Council Member Rogers? Yes, I, I mean, I think that there's enough locations that if we were gonna see a a, a spike that we would we would see it. Thank you, Chief. Good point. Thank you, Councilmember Tibbetts. Thank you, John. Um, the question that I have is: I think during the last appeal we had on a cannabis dispensary, I asked the question: Can we form the cannabis subcommittee and reevaluate that 1,000 foot buffer? The I think it was called the the density aspect, or I'm forgetting the, the proper term, but density of cannabis, uh, did that ever transpire? I know we've had a lot going on, but was that ever subsequently discussed? Because at the last uh, appeal, 
I did voice some concern for the amount of density that we're starting to see in the city. I'm not aware um, that that committee uh, has uh, reformed and, and taken any action. Um, I don't know if uh, Claire or someone else from PED might, um, might be aware, but I'm not aware of, of any action. We have been, we have had a lot of other things going on right now. Sure. Thanks. Well, if Claire is available, um, I'd love to, to hear it, but I'm gonna, I'm just gonna, you know, politely assume that's no, just given the, the plate of things that we've had. Good evening, if I may, can you hear me? This is Claire Hartman, Interim Assistant City Manager, and I'd like to respond to your question, Councilmember Tibbetts. Um, we did hear the comment, the interest in um, reforming the Cannabis Subcommittee. Um, however, I, I think that is something that we'll need to address when we revisit the City Council goals, um, when we evaluate the, uh, the work plan for the year, um, and I believe that that the council goals will be revisited in February, but in terms of the current work plan that we're working on, that was out of the scope. Um, and uh, in fact, that subcommittee is not currently meeting, but should there be interest to reform it, that would be the, the proper time to set it up. And then we can, we can staff it and we can move forward with um, that type of amendment. And I'm sure there'll be other amendments of interest to the, by the community and other council members. Okay. Thank you, Assistant City Manager. Thank you, Ms. Harbin. Councilmember Fleming. Yeah, I wanted to just clarify. It's my understanding, I believe staff said this, but I just want to be crystal clear about it, that the consumption on site will not be in the form of smoking or vaping. It will be in the form of like oral consumption, like drinking teas or sodas or um, eating gummies or the like. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. The city has a ordinance um, that heavily restricts smoking of any kind, um, and it um, includes both tobacco and cannabis. So the um, on-site consumption would be limited to um, edibles, for instance. Okay. And can you speak to the plan for dealing with environmental toxins that might potentially be generated by the production? on this, um, at this project? I would defer to the applicant for that question. Well, I guess what I'm asking, um, and it's okay if you don't have the answer, um, but if staff analyzed, um, or there's a standard um, plan, or there's some governing body that deals with manufacturing, I can't imagine that there isn't. Um, I, I'm interested to hear from the applicant later, but this to me seems like one that I, I'd like to hear from a, a governmental representative. I'm not familiar with any specific requirements from the planning, for instance. Um, okay, understood. Um, but so they, they will be using these chemicals that you said are fairly common, um, but do we know if uh, there's gonna be a, any, and perhaps it's fine if you don't know, but I'm just wondering how these things are, are managed. I, I don't know the specifics on the, manufac the manufacturing process. I just know, a just have a general understanding of what a closed loop system is. But I, oh, so that, that's, I that's, that, that sounds like we're, you're going, getting warm there. So a closed loop system, uh, can you tell yeah. us about that? Yes, so um, in order for, um, in order to allow for safe manufacturing um, with a volatile compound, it's required to be in a closed loop system so that the, um, the volatile compound is not exposed to the air. So um, butane, for instance, um, is used um, quite often in volatile manufacturing to extract oils from um, cannabis plants, plant and plant materials. And, um, it's used in a um, controlled device. And um, in this case, the applicant's proposing it in a specially designed room for um, um, extra, uh, extra safety and um, additional caution. Thank you, and I do appreciate your, your caution in answering a technical question, but, but you, you did it really well, so thank you for your help. 
no Council questions. Member Fleming, if I may, the uh, fire department is the department that administers the hazardous materials function within the city, does the inspections and reviews the applicant or the operator's plans for hazardous materials handling and disposal. Yeah, I, I know. I just wanted to confirm for the for the listening public that that those th these types of safety precautions are in place, and that it is the Santa Rosa Police Department that will be conducting these inspections and approvals. Thank you, you so much. The Santa Rosa Fire Department. Right, right. That the police department will come if there's a problem. All right. Councilmember Tibbetts. Thank you, Councilmember Sawyer. I apologize. I forgot to ask previously when I had the floor. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, there have not been any developments or approved use or mechanisms to test if somebody is driving under the influence. Am I correct in that assumption or has technology evolved to where we can now pull somebody over and detect that they're under the influence? For the chief, I assume. If he's not here, that's all right. Uh, council member, uh, there is uh, nothing at this point that uh, can be used for uh, to evaluate driving under the influence with a presumptive test. Uh, our officers are trained to um, do field sobriety tests, and um, there are there are private companies that are working on a presumptive test, uh, so similar to what they do with alcohol. But there's nothing at this time that's approved. Um, I'll make a quick comment, uh, after, and I'll still listen to public comment, but I remember we had one of these proposals uh, with an on-site consumption come up before us in the past, and I remember at that time I was uh, against having on-site consumption as a result of not having a way to enforce it, because to me that was tantamount to opening, a, opening bars when you didn't have a way to d determine if somebody is, shouldn't be driving a vehicle. Um, so I, I just, I guess I just add that comment. I'll delve more into it in the comment section. Thank you. Thank you, council member. Any other questions, council, at this point? So at this point, we'll um, introduce planning commissioner chair, planning commission chair, Karen Weeks for a presentation. Welcome, chair Weeks. Thank you. Uh Council Member Acting Mayor Sawyer. Um, as uh, Council Member Sawyer said, my name is Karen Weeks and I am the chair of the Planning Commission. And I'm here today to provide you a brief overview of our actions as it relates to this item before you tonight. As Ms. Tumian said, the project was originally uh, scheduled for us on the September 9th, 2021 meeting. However, the day before, um, staff received a request for a Spanish translation. And due to that short time frame uh, of the request, staff requested of the commission that the item be continued to the September 23rd meeting. That continuation information was translated into Spanish at that uh, September 9th meeting. And then on the 23rd, when we did hear the item, um, there were, of the seven members, of the Planning Commission, six of us were present. The meeting was translated into Spanish in real time using the Zoom Spanish channel and uh, the great Zoom and in Spanish interpreters that the city uses. An extra time was allowed for the public commenters due to that translation. As you know, the Planning Commission is charged with carrying out California planning and zoning laws within the city of Santa Rosa, which includes the implementation of local ordinances and policies relating to land use matters. <clears throat> We've been reviewing cannabis conditional use permits for a number of years now, and as always, uh, in items such as this, we review this uh, conditional use permit applications in accordance with the applicable zoning code and city policies. Our role as a commissioner is to follow those applicable codes and policies laid out by the council, council as well as state regulations. As you're well aware, it's been the council's direction to treat the now legal cannabis business as any other legal business. The submitted application for this privately owned property was consistent with all the policies laid out for its cannabis business within the city of Santa Rosa. 
During the meeting, we heard from 34 members of the public, 26 were opposed and eight supporting. Commissioners asked a variety of questions regarding issues such as odor mitigation, the question of on-site consumption and on-site management. The commissioners did approve the CUP with a six to zero vote, as I indicated with one member absent. And if you have any questions about our action at that in that uh, time, I'd be happy to answer them at this. Thank you. Council, questions for our planning commission chair? Thanks again, Madam Chair. And if we have further questions, um, I'm sure you'll be available. I will. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Next, we'll be hearing from the applicant. Um, do we have Mr. Longman on our Zoom? Yes, he's being promoted now. Thank you. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, Mr. Longman, you have 10 minutes, please. Thank you. Uh, hi, uh, actually, uh, our owner, Nayeli Rivera, uh, will be giving the presentation. Can Ms. Rivera raise her hand so I can enable her speaking permissions? Can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Awesome. Good evening, council members and staff. Thank you for your time today and for giving me the chance to talk about our project at 100 Sebastopol Road. My name is Nayeli Rivera, and I am one of the owners of the 100 Sebastopol Road project. We are seeking to open and operate a new state-of-the-art commercial cannabis facility at 100 Sebastopol Road. We previously received unanimous approval from the Planning Commission for cultivation, manufacturing, distribution, and retail uses. We are here today to address the appeals made against our project. It is our hope that the appeals will be denied and that we are able to commence operations in the near future. Next slide, please. Um, next slide, please. Myself and Sadie Hunter are partners in this business. I've known Sadie for many years. She was born and raised in Northern California like myself. She is the general manager of Canadel, a cannabis dispensary near Anadel Park in Santa Rosa. She has been in cannabis for a long time and is a strong advocate for cannabis, patient rights, and policy reform. Next slide, please. A little bit about me. I was born and raised right here in Sonoma County. My father and mother immigrated to Sonoma County in the mid 1970s. I am a first generation Mexican American woman. My father has worked in the Latino community for over 30 years. He worked in immigration services and has done a lot of outreach in the Roseland area as well as Sonoma County as a whole. At an early age, he would bring me to work and I began assisting him with immigration services. I have seen Roseland develop over the years and I support the culture and the community. The early work I did in Roseland with my father created a passion in me to be of service to my community. After graduating high school, I continued to work as an interpreter. I worked with the Sonoma County Office of Education as well as the deaf and hard of hearing community. My family also owns a farm labor contracting company out of Napa. I began working with my family in the, in the late 2000s. This sparked my passion for business and entrepreneurial pursuits. Next slide, please. As you can tell, this project is a proud woman owned and led business. It is of utmost importance for us that we use our platform to not only uplift women in the cannabis industry, but women in all businesses. I feel very honored and grateful to be given this opportunity 
to form this business and connect back with my roots, as well as work in an industry I am extremely passionate about. Next slide, please. This project will be a vertically integrated company, meaning, meaning it will follow the life cycle of the plant to the shelf. The quality of product that we intend to produce will rival other companies and put Roseland on the map as one of the best cultivators in the state. I think it is important that our community sees this operation as not just a business, but an opportunity to educate and bring more knowledge and support to the cannabis industry while highlighting the positive effects it can have on the local economy. Next slide, please. Volunteering and community, community development are close to my heart. When Sadie and I made the decision to move forward with this project, we knew we both wanted our new business venture to do good and elicit change for the betterment of Roseland. We created the community benefits plan, which directly outlines how we plan to be of service to our community. First, we will implement year round food drive events through the nonprofit organization fish in order to feed the hungry in our community. Second, we intend to hire locally and tap into the diverse talent pool in the Roseland community. We will advertise career opportunities through Sonoma sponsored job development programs, Craigslist and the Spanish speaking site taco list in order to ensure our workforce is representative of our community. Once our business is operational and cash flow, cash flow positive, we plan to not only make monetary donations, but encourage volunteering of our staff. We've identified social advocates for youth, the living room, the Vitalant blood donations as organizations we intend to support. Next slide, please. The team at that 100, road, 100 Sebastopol Road project wants to be at the forefront of supporting the health and livelihood of the community we operate within. During the September 23 planning commission meeting and at the city council meeting since, we've heard numerous comments from public speakers expressing a desire for this facility to be utilized as a public library or community center. In an effort to better understand the likelihood of the city pursuing such a use, we reached out to Eddie Alvarez, the council member representing the district where the, this property is located. During our conversation with council member Alvarez, we asked if the city was still interested in pursuing a library at this location. After our initial conversation, council member Alvarez told us that he had inquired with the Sonoma Pu County Public Library regarding their interest in the proposed facility. He was told by staff that they are exploring many potential sites for the library and that they would take another look at the proposed property should it become available, but are not committed to any particular site as of yet. During our discussion, discussion council member Alvarez also mem mentioned that while looking into the issue, he learned from city staff that the city had considered purchasing the property over a year ago, but ultimately made a decision not to move forward. For those calling for more infrastructure and equitable justice for the Roseland community, we want you to know that we support you. We feel that equitable justice for Roseland means providing places where people can work and make a living with comp competitive wages. Our combined retail, distribution, manufacturing, and cultivation uses will bring over 50 new career opportunities to the area. We are upholding the essence of the affordable housing and anti-displacement strategy supplement of the Roseland area specific plan of 2016 by providing careers for the local community. The Roseland specific plan outlines strategies developed in other cities that quote, include policies aimed at supporting existing and new businesses that reflect the changing nature of industry, creating the types of jobs most beneficial to the local economy and preparing the workforce to compete for these jobs. By 2022, the recreational cannabis market in California is projected to reach 5 billion. The California cannabis industry's total economic impact could be nearly 10 billion. To, de to deny the benefits of this booming industry to Roseland would be a disservice to the community. Our project will generate over a half million dollars in yearly tax revenue for the city. It is our hope that the city of Santa Rosa 
will allocate necessary funds from that tax revenue to make sure that Roseland residents have the proper infrastructure to succeed. Among these infrastructure needs include a community cultural center and an expanded library. We want to be part of the solution to the social equity concerns that face Roseland and to be a leader as it moves into the future. Next slide, please. We know that safety and security are always a top concern for any community, and we share that concern. The presence of a dispensary could be enough to deter criminal activities. The results of one particular study published in the Journal of Regional Science and Urban Economics in 2019 imply that an additional dispensary in a neighborhood leads to a reduction of 17 crimes per month for 10,000 residents which corresponds to roughly a 19% decline relative to the average crime rate over the sample period. Our comprehensive security plan will help to improve safety in the area. Our staff will be thoroughly trained on measures to keep the facility secure and safe, and will be trained to de-escalation protocols for issues that may potentially arise. We will also maintain clear communication with local law enforcement to ensure our safety practices are in line with their guidance. Next slide, please. At our hearing with the Planning Commission, there were requests for changes to the project that made it a better fit for Roseland. We appreciated the feedback and implemented those considerations immediately. First, we elected to rename our operation to the 100 Sebastopol Road project. After we heard that some members of the community were offended by our original name choice, by, that were offended by our original name choice, we never meant any offense and we were happy to change it. Second, at the request of the Commissioner Holton, we further developed our comprehensive policy regarding the practices at our on site consumption lounge. We reached out to active consumption lounges throughout the state to gather insight into their practices. You think what we- Excuse me, Ms. Rivera, yeah, I'm gonna need you to wrap up pretty quickly here. Okay. Using what we learned, we drafted a safe consumption policy to outline our methods for prioritizing safety at our launch. I have made sure that each council member has a copy of this policy for review tonight. Um, I think- I think we, so, reached Yeah, I might. Okay. Thank, thank you very much for your presentation. Council. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions for the applicant at this point? Seeing none, we'll move to the appellant. Um, we have two appellants making presentations this evening. Each will have 10 minutes for their presentation. Um, Mr. DeWitt. Thank you. Ms. Ms. Minor. Ms. Miner's permissions to speak have been enabled. Thank you, and, and thank you, everyone. I'd just like to say a few words. Um, I'm a little um, ill-prepared because of the time frame. I wasn't notified about this in, um, until December 9th to have my presentation ready. So some of the um, things I want to just touch upon is uh, in relation to the asthma um, that we have in our area and the numbers that we have we continue to have a lot of disparities in that capacity. I'm part of the library system and they did reach out to the um, the business on uh, that place of business in July of 2020. They had a visitation in regards to that because they was inquiring about that. And then they also revisited that um, same facility in January, February, February of 2021. Also, as, as the populations of Santa Rosa continue to shift and change, the city government needs to shift and change with that. The process was very difficult, finding out how to do the appeals and it wasn't very clear and it wasn't, and the technical support was not fully in place. The direction of the process was difficult to navigate and, and then also the website was difficult to navigate. There are high fees that is in relation to appeals process in this area. There are low income um, people that wanted to also do an appeal but couldn't afford, afford it. So there's issues in that. Language equity was not there when the postings were done originally. 
and there are so many other things. So those are a few of the things that was not in my um, slide. So you can go to the next slide, please. This is the ordinance that um, is in the city of Santa Rosa. And I just wanna highlight the area where it says will not be detrimental to public interest, health, safety, co convenience of, or welfare of the city. And that is actually from the city's ordinance. Next slide, please. Again, uh, there's a lot of information and I just wanted to have the overview of everything. So I highlighted a few things. And again, this is from the city ordinance things that will not adversely affect the health, peace, or safety of persons living and working in the surrounding areas. The city have done many listening sessions in regards to feeling safe in Santa Rosa. And for myself, uh, being a first generation here in America, this is an issue for me not feeling safe here in, uh, in my community. And those are questions that was done through our listening sessions, done through um, a budget and done uh, in many capacity. And that question holds dear to my heart. Do I feel safe in my community? And with such a magnitude of a facility coming in, I don't feel safe. Since the inception of Rosen coming in on um, November 1st, 2017, there have been many disadvantages that have happened in Rosen's prior to them coming into the city. There are a lot of effective changes that are going on, but there's still lack of cultural sensitivities and lack of technology used from the people uh, from the community that makes it difficult for them in this process. So next slide, please. Again, this is the census track and where the location is. Uh, the first posting um, was all in English and the information that was sent out to the surrounding area was all in English. And as you can see from the census tract, the percentage of um, Latin, Hispanic, Latino and Hispanic is 66.7% just for that census tract. Next slide, please. Again, here's the English posting that was posted. So next slide, please. This was sent out to the surrounding areas. It is all in English. And the person that gave this to me, she speaks Spanish. And so again, the diversity in the language um, barrier was there. And so to have something posted and sent out to the, um, the public on August 27th to people that only speak English, that is a problem. Next slide, next slide please. Again, the slide showing that it was all in English and it was sent to a Spanish speaker. Next slide. Thank you for the diversity, equity, and inclusion. This was a sign recently posted for th this meeting today. And as you can see, changes were made, but so many years here in Roseland from other previous meetings that we have, they have done it in English and we had the same issue, the same inequities going on in Roseland. And finally, now we are beginning to see a shift. Next slide, please. Here is the health, uh, health density. These are, these are numbers that is coming from data that is available. I have included the websites for that. And this is the Healthy Places Index. As you can see here, the um, quartile, we're in quartile one, which is the least healthiest community conditions. These numbers, some of these numbers are updated. We have new numbers that is coming out in the in the in the tw January of 2022. So, but again, our our disparities, our ca California Healthy Plague Index. You can check it out at that website. Next slide. I just want to highlight the Measure of America project, which is our our portrait of Sonoma County. That the new numbers are out uh, will be out again in January. And there are still a lot of disparities that is in this area. I want to highlight again the American Human Index, Development Index that tells the story of how ordinary Americans are faring and empowers community, health, education, and income and, uh, indicators, and racial and economic groups. Next slide. Again, some more data. It, it, when you look at this particular slide, the Human Development Index is 5.58. Out of 10, we have life expectancy of 80.9 years. Uh, education index is 5.12 of 10, and the median personal earning is 37,320. Again, disparities, health issues, 
So we all talked about having a community center, a larger library system, and all of that would help in the process of Roseland and improving that area. As the new numbers come out in January, for the a portrait of Sonoma County, you will begin to see the disparities that we're still facing in that area. Next slide. Again, more information in regards to some of the data in Roseland. We can go ahead and move, go to the next slide. Again, additional data showing about that census track and three additional census track that's in that same area. I hope that you guys had an opportunity to read all of that. Go ahead and go to the next slide. Again, additional data. Again, so these numbers are based in 2014, but our portrait of Sonoma, I've had an opportunity to look at some of that data that's coming out and it still holds true. There are slow, slow movement in the data. And so I wish we had this meeting um, was gonna be done in January when we can have the portrait of Sonoma and additional information, data points that was coming from the city with the um, uh, scorecard from the violence prevention that will be all out as well which also supports what is seen in the portrait of sonoma next slide next slide again on our city website is stated the environmental review process i added the information in in red which says this includes land air minerals plant life animal life noise traffic I included human life, growth, development, health, and health disparities, because we deal with a lot here in Roseland. I live in Roseland, I, I work, play, and eat in Roseland, and we have a lot of issues here. And this facility coming in uh, will bring some, maybe some help, but unless they're gonna have a security guard walking up and down the corridor, I don't see how it will affect the, the change in um, crime levels that we have in Rosen because it's all up and down that basketball corridor. Next slide. One of the um, most shocking things we have in Rosen is the brownfields. There's so many brownfields up and down that corridor. And this project is going to contribute, uh, even though there's closed system and there's all this um, additional stuff, the kids of this area, again, has asthma. So if you see here, if anybody's interested, this is not my data. This is the data that's coming from various entities. You can go and look at all the different uh, brownfields that we have here in Roseland that they're still waiting for it to clear up so that they can build a, additional um, housing. And so we need to do also look at policies and rezoning and ordinances. We need to change these things in Roseland so that it can be beneficial to the people of Roseland and which will bring forward things like the library, things like job, maybe a job court type thing. That's what the public is speaking of. Next slide. Again, in the Santa Rosa general plan, this is um, an area of interest, Roseland is, and it talks about provide new social and cultural services and amenities to the needs of Roseland area, Sebastian Rose, Rose specific plan area, and the larger community. We are still waiting for a civic or community building. Next slide. Thank you, City Council, for the recent talks about the community center and the Rosen Library. We still in need of that, and that's what we would want to have in Rosen. And again, that building was a building that we were looking at. And how do I know? I was a part of those conversations. I was also out there advocating for the public library. And that was one of the sites we was looking at. And the public library, the Sonoma County Public Library, that was also the site they was looking at. They Hermione, did, yes. Excuse me, I need you to wrap up. Okay, can we go to the slide, the map? And here is the map off of the city website once again. And as you can see, the some of these, um, approved is is going into the school um, city zone and from my understanding that is not supposed to happen and then as you can see the two circles there's a concentration uh, over concentration buffer so that is what's happening so this is on the city website once again um, I hope this information was helpful there was much more that I have and I hope that you guys had an opportunity to read read through the information that I submitted thank you thank you Ms. Miner Mr. DeWitt
Mr. DeWitt, we will give you a three minute warning and a one minute warning, um, but we do not have a visual timer available for the 10 minute allotment. Hello. <clears throat> Time to ground truth in justice right here and now in Santa Rosa. My name is Dwayne DeWitt. I'm from Roseland. Roseland Action was formed in 1993 as an environmental justice and social equity group formed by Roseland residents and supporters because we had a goal of empowering a marginalized area. The goal is to speak up for equity and fairness and I agree with the previous speaker, though I never worked with her at all on this project and didn't even know about this meeting until yesterday at four o'clock when I got the agenda from the office. The city planner with this project never informed me and I'm an appellant. Anyway, let's get down to the specifics. We in the community wanted to have a resilient, sustainable, nature-oriented, resource district within Santa Rosa. We basically wanted to make sure we were defining the services, the structures, and the support we want in our neighborhoods. Federal regulations still consider marijuana a drug. So I'm gonna talk the way I like to feel. These are drug dealers. And drug abusers, drug addicts, and drug dealers are not a good thing for any neighborhood, anywhere. The citizens and residents of disadvantaged, underserved, overburdened places such as Roseland do not need this old school drug dealership. If located in Roseland, this drug dealership will be detrimental to public health, safety, and welfare of Roseland residents. It will adversely affect the health, peace, and safety of Roseland residents nearby. Roseland residents have disproportionately been impacted by environmental harms and policies the city of Santa Rosa has foisted upon us for decades. <clears throat> Roseland residents should be able to keep detrimental businesses out of our neighborhoods. Professional healthcare workers living in Roseland were founders of Roseland Action. They recognized a need to lower the amount of alcohol and drug abuse by people in Roseland long ago. Margot Piccinini worked with Southwest Area Citizens Group to challenge liquor sales permits and lower the amount of bars and liquor sales in Roseland. She succeeded. It will be a disservice to her memory and all of Roseland to open a drug den in our neighborhood, our midst right now. Stoned walkers, drivers, and bicyclists will increase there will be loadies out in the public space. Since Santa Rosa closed down Homeless Hill, dozens and dozens of drunken and drug-addled vagrants now roam the area near 100 Sebastopol Road day and night. A woman was murdered nearby on Roberts Avenue recently. People on Boyd Street, Timothy Road, and Goodman Avenue no longer feel safe in their neighborhoods. Putting a drug den in this spot will be an attractive public nuisance, which will make life worse for local law-abiding neighbors. Roseland recently endured a police killing of a man who may have been under the influence of alcohol or drugs. We don't want this to happen again to anyone. Lowering the amount of drug abuse by people in Roseland is more important than this business moving in here now. Local citizens are not clamoring for this. 30 years ago at the first National People of Color Environmental Leadership Summit in Washington, D.C., definitions of 17 principles of environmental justice were drafted and adopted. Principle seven states, environmental justice demands the right to participate as equal partners at every level of decision-making, including needs assessment, planning, implementation, enforcement, and evaluation. This has not happened for this drug project. This drug project is being shoved down the throats of Roseland residents. Those living near this drug dealing site will be directly affected by this in their daily lives. Nothing good will come from this business being forced upon residents. Such a drug dealing business will mark the neighborhood. 
In the past, the city has really redlined Roseland residents. Before the turn of the century, the city in Sonoma County declared a red zone. I have a map of it here, which I would show you if the overhead was working. It was on Hughes Avenue and Sunset Avenue housing tract due to groundwater pollution, contamination, and it forever marginalized these residents and the value of their homes, stigmatizing their neighborhood forever. The old school cannabis drug project will stigmatize the Timothy Road neighborhood and marginalize the area. <clears throat> this will worsen the current situation for Sevastopol Road area affected by contamination and polluted land. It was mentioned they're brownfields. Contaminated land has stigmatized the area. Brownfields have caused disinvestment in the area while causing marginalization of residents. Having served on the Roseland Area Sebastopol Road Specific Plan Citizens Advisory Committee, I know this type of project was never discussed for this site. People on the committee were seeking to lift up the Sebastopol Road corridor. This type of project will not be a community-friendly business. Rather, it will be a site requiring armed guards with high level of security on site. This is not a welcoming picture for where luxury meets downtown, according to the Village Station housing project being built next door to the project. It has been stated 26 speakers at the Planning Commission opposed the project, while eight speakers supported it. Three times the amount opponents will show the city, this is not the place for this business. This business can be operated in an industrial or business park instead of here. Business promises often do not actually materialize. Often, a community suffers while a business profits. The addition of an attractive nuisance into a disadvantaged, underserved, and overburdened community often makes things worse. Roseland's been struggling, and what we need now is for folks to take a look at this and say, you know what? These business people might have a good idea but take it somewhere else. We've already got enough drug dealers in our area, both legal and illegal. This isn't gonna make Roseland better. I don't care who is telling you it's gonna get better. We know from living there on the streets and seeing what's happening to our community, it has not improved since annexation. It's actually worse on Sebastopol Road now. We actually need you folks now, our elected officials, to say we can take a break and ask these business people to go elsewhere. They don't own the site, they're just going to be renting the site. This is a perfect building for another use, one that enhances the community. Let us put our library there and our community youth center. We don't need to build a new building that would cost $10 million, according to what you folks have said, with $10 million worth of planning. Let's use this building here and now for what the community needs and let these business people find a different site somewhere else. Their business will go wherever it needs to. We in the community don't have anywhere else in which we can actually house a community youth center, a library. This big building can do that. It did it when it was Roseland Collegiate Prep High School. So let's step up, let's work together with the community, be on equal terms with us. Don't come from the top down on us and overpower us and tell us it's our way, not Roseland's way. We're coming here tonight we're sitting through these hearings because we believe our community can be improved, but not by this drug dealership. You're at one moment, one minute. I thank you for giving me this time limit. I thank you here tonight for informing me of this meeting. I asked you for a continuance. You didn't want to do that. I really feel that staff did a disservice to myself and the other applicant, the appellant, by not even giving us the information we needed by not even informing me, even though I'd paid the $556 to say, I don't believe you're treating us fairly. That's, that's an amazing amount of money for 10 minutes, $50 a minute, 
to tell you that this is not the right thing to have in my community. And I've lived there all my life, and you guys are going to come in here and tell me, oh, we'll make it better. You know, it's never worked out. You folks have never made it better yet. So please don't tell me tonight you're going to approve this, and we'll all be better off in the future. That's a crock. All the best to you. Thank you, Mr. DeWitt. Council, any questions for either one of the appellants at this time? Council Member Fleming. Yes, um, oh, oh, excuse me. No, I have a question for the um, applicant, not the okay. appellant. Okay. My mistake. Any, any questions for the appellants? Okay, thank you. Ms. Rivera, um, you have five minutes to respond to the appellants if you so choose. Yes, thank you. First off, I want to thank the appellants for pursuing what they think is best for Roseland. We are doing the same. We hope that the dialogue initiated in this public process is just the beginning of a continued open conversation about how we can work together for the betterment of this community. The first appellant discussed a lack of proper public notice of our initial planning commission hearing. In particular, there was a complaint that notices in Spanish were not posted and that the nearby neighbors were not notified properly. This was brought to the attention of the Planning Commission a day before the initial hearing on September 9th. Because of this, the Planning Director and staff postponed the hearing until September 23rd. We stand by the city's open government principles that prioritize diversity, equity, and inclusion. We remain grateful that the city postponed our initial hearing so that the members of our Spanish-speaking community could, partic could participate fully in the public process. Additionally, we were active in our bilingual outreach to the neighborhood and have clearly made our goals and intentions known for our neighbors. The appellant also addressed our facility's presence in a residential area and felt that having a consumption lounge as well as, a, as conducting type seven manufacturing was a risk to their residents. As I mentioned in my previous presentation, our team has conducted exhaustive research regarding the safety practices of consumption lounges across the state. Using the information we gathered, we've designed a safe consumption policy that we believe is unraveled in the state. Our type seven manufacturing process is designed with a closed loop backing system. This method is not exclusive to cannabis manufacturing and is often used to produce perfume, food additives, and beauty products. The risks outlined by the appellant are negligible to non-existent. Our lab will be inspected by the city's building and fire code officials and rated a C1D1 lab. It would also meet the requirements for the Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act and peer reviewed for best practices down to the last bolt. We canvass our surrounding neighborhood on multiple occasions to connect with the neighbors of the project. Along the way, we passed out information about our project in both Spanish and English. In our outreach efforts, we knocked on doors of 120 residences directly adjacent to the property spanning from Timothy Road, Sebastopol Road, Briarbush Way, Blithwood Place, Deep Growth Place, and Howarth Way, resulting in over 60 conversations and 43 neighbors signing our petition in support of our project. Some of the neighbors refer to the vacant building at 100 Sebastopol Road, Road as a blight in the neighborhood, and they are excited to see a business finally move into the space. A few neighbors even reached out to me after the fact to ask about possible employment opportunities once we open. On top of that, we have a petition circulating around the greater Santa Rosa community that has garnered 563 signatures of support. In September, we also hosted a community meeting at the facility to give our neighbors a chance to walk through and ask questions. Also something to note during our outreach, we received numerous comments wishing there was most space for cultural events and educational functions in the Roseland area. And we are hopeful that we're able to host a number of events in our facility and want to create a safe space for community engagement. The second appellant describes our project as being a drug dealer, which is refuted in the staff report provided earlier by Mrs. Tumians. As the term drug dealer refers to an illegal activity and does not accurately describe our proposed project. 57% of Californians voted to legalize cannabis in the Proposition 64 vote of 2016. To talk about legal and regulated cannabis operations as being criminal activities is unfair to us and especially unfair to the comprehensive cannabis ordinance that the city council and staff have worked for years as a top priority to develop. 
The fact of the matter is that our project will be a neighborhood serving use as described by the planning commissioners themselves. I do not feel it is appropriate for us to address this appellant's claim any further. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Rivera. <laughs> Council, any questions for the applicant at this time? Ms. Fleming. I, I have a question about something that might seem out of left field, um, has not been raised by anybody here. But one of the things that concerned me about your project rendering was the amount of hardscape around the project and how much hardscape we have in um, our, our downtown core, which includes Roseland. I'm just curious to know if, if uh, the applicant would be willing to have more permeable uh, land cover um, as opposed to all the concrete that I see in, in the renderings. Can you hear me? Ms. Rivera, did you hear the question? I did hear the question. Can you hear it? Can you guys hear me? Yes, now, yes. Awesome. Yeah, we are open to all possibilities. I think the rendering is, um, you know, uh, not anything that we've set in stone. So we are definitely open to um, suggestions or, you know, hearing the community as to how to make that space um, more presentable. Um, me being a Mexican-American woman and growing up in Roseland and being around culture and art, I would like to incorporate that and, and possibly, you know, uh, bring that down into that area that's more industrialized at this point. Okay, thank you. I do appreciate it. Um, having um, compressed granite or some other uh, form of ground covering uh, would definitely help reach some of our environmental goals uh, as a community. So thank you for considering that. I don't have any further questions. Thank you, council member. Any other questions, council, for the applicant? Seeing none, we'll move to public comment. Um, anyone in the chamber care to address the council at this time, if you could line up at the podium? Council um, member Sawyer, can you open the public oh, hearing? Thank you. Thank you. We'll open the public hearing. Thank you, Madam Clerk. And so just line up at the podium and you will have three minutes to address the council. Please go ahead and state your name for the public record if you choose to do so. Okay, hello. My name is Janice Siebert, and I'm the president of the Roseland School District Board of Trustees for uh, 2020 and 2021. And I'm here to convey that the board is not in favor of this project. In fact, no one, we're major stakeholders in the community and no one from this project or the city even reached out to us to let us know this was happening. And you heard from many of our parents and more are here and our children as well to speak to you. So I'm gonna let them talk about uh, what what they um, need to. Um, let's see, but I'm, at, I'm just urging you to listen to them. You know, they're not the, the big business. They're the, we're the people who live in Roseland. And um, so we're the important voices. Just a couple of things I'd like to point out to you that in this discussion tonight and at the planning commission meeting, um, they keep just talking about this uh, saying cannabis dispensaries are being distributed equitably throughout the city. Uh, but we're not talking about a small storefront dispensary. We're talking about a massive industrial enterprise of over 20,000 square feet. Um, have you talked about your, uh, to your measure O people about the effect of this uh, and what they think about the prospect of this. Also, please consider the Bodine Asphalt Facility, which was built mostly before residences grew up around it. Now, uh, San, Ro has, San Rosa has been unable to prevent that business from um, expanding their hours, uh, heavy truck traffic noise, and other negative impacts to the now residential neighborhood that surrounds us. 
for this cannabis facility to be built, you would have to be authorizing the construction in the middle of already existing residences in an area designed to be designated to be built out to high density transit hub. So you have this measure O, prevent, uh, violence presential, present, blah, blah, prevention partnership that just uh, counseled 71 1,782 people served in the Roseland District, West Sebastopol Road, etc. This is exactly the area that does not need the old cannabis um, facility to be built there. Council members, rather than approving a high security fortress to keep people out, it is, this is the perfect location to be integrated into the community near homes, businesses, train station. This is a great opportunity for Santa Rosa to take a step forward in community assets that will provide wonderful things for all of its residences, an opportunity to blend Roseland into the greater city area instead of further comp compartmentalizing it. Thank you. Thank you. Hola, buenas noches. Mi nombre es Concepción Domínguez. Uh, estamos aquí hoy buscando apoyo para nuestra comunidad, para parar el proceso del lugar que quieren poner de cannabis de, en Rosland. Yo como, como comunidad les digo que por traer esto a, a Rosland es muy malo. Este tipo de negocios no es bueno aquí porque tenemos muchas familias, jóvenes, escuelas y todo, y no nos ayudaría mucho a nuestra comunidad. Y por eso mismo les pido de que hagan cambios y por favor no aprueben esto porque la verdad es un negocio muy malo para nosotros y la verdad nuestros jóvenes echarían un poco más a perder de lo que están. Entonces sería mejor un lugar comunitario, algo para nuestra comunidad, algo para, para cuando haya un incendio o algo tengamos un lugar a donde llegar por una emergencia o algo para poder ayudar a nuestra comunidad o un centro cultural o la librería, alguna otra cosa, porque en realidad esto sería como una bomba de tiempo. Si hacen algo de, de producto ahí de cannabis, todo eso sería muy malo para nuestra comunidad. Ahí hay escuelas, hay, hay residencias, hay todo, y en realidad no, no nos beneficia nada, la verdad. Y quisiera que escuchara nuestra petición y por favor no aprueben esto, porque en realidad no hay ningún beneficio para nosotros. Y por favor les pongo hincapié en que entiendan nuestras peticiones porque en verdad no nos favorece esto. Quisiera algo positivo más para mi comunidad, que haya deportes, haya una clase de música o algo más mejor para nosotros. Entonces no entiendo por qué quieren poner algo así, como cannabis, venta de drogas, todo eso no, no beneficia nada a la comunidad. Yo creo que más bien es por dinero, por negocio, yo qué sé, pero en realidad deberían de hacer algo mejor para nuestra comunidad. Se los pido, por favor. Y escúchenos nuestra petición porque estamos aquí todos unidos. Roslan está aquí y queremos que nos escuchen. Gracias. Pablo, can you please restate that in English? Thank you. Good evening. Uh, my name is Concepcion Dominguez. And I'm here in support of the community to stop uh, for you guys from bringing this. This is something bad. Um, here in this area, we have families, we have youth, we have schools. It's just not something good. You know, make a change. Uh, don't approve this. I think the kids and the youth here have a lot more to lose than to gain from this um, here in the community. You know, why don't you make something for the community? Why don't you uh, make something a shelter in case there's a, there's a fire, a place where we can all gather? maybe a multicultural center. Um, I think this is just a time bomb waiting to happen with the production of cannabis products here. Um, it would just be bad for our community. It's just not something beneficial. So I ask you to please hear our petition. Uh, this is not to benefit any of us. So again, I'm just asking that you listen to our petition. You know, why don't you put something to do with sports or, or music in this place? Something that's better for all of us. I think this deal of selling cannabis and drugs, I don't know if it's just business or if it's for the money. Just I ask that you please listen to us here. We're in Rosen and we're here united.
Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Hello, everyone. My name is Ricarda Suarez, a current senior at Rosalind University Prep. As you may remember me from last week, I am here again today to emphasize the importance for you to uphold the appeal. Uh, the development of the old school cannabis dispensary that would be located at the former RUP campus, um, located in the heart of Roseland. Let's keep in mind this is not a dispensary, this would be a factory, um, and it is not necessary. It is not something we have asked for. As previously mentioned, out of the 34 comments done during the September 23rd meeting, 26 of those opposing to the proposal with eight approval. With only Commissioner Carter listening to the community's demand, I again show up like I did on that September meeting and ask, um, and as I did last week as well, uh, as a student, resident, and young adult, urge you to uphold this appeal. As you are aware, the community as a whole is against this. We did not ask for this, we were not properly informed, and most importantly, our needs for resources, such as a permanent location for the Roseland Library, a multicultural center, a child care center, or resiliency hub have not yet been met. This location once brought those, who, those young adults who were expected to fail at life to college. They got there because of this institution, because of Roseland University Prep. Roseland was not given the opportunity to, to choose the proposal for this, um, to develop something at this location. Roseland has been asking for a place like such mentioned above, like a, a resiliency hub, a Roseland library, or a permanent location for it, um, and more for years. Youth, youth well-being will be heavily in, impacted by the approval of this proposal. Our health and safety should be prioritized. Students who will find themselves walking in front of this place will be unsafe. This will no longer be a place we can call home. This will not improve our community. As a resident of this marginalized community, I will state it again, I am here to demand for the location to be used for resources that we, students, parents, and children need to improve our livelihood, health, safety, and education. Roseland has repeatedly demonstrated the strong contradiction to this proposal to which, as our representatives, I urge you to uphold the appeal. Before I end my comment, as a predominant Latinx community, Roseland as a whole expects each and every single one of you to hear us, to see us, and to uphold this appeal. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, my name is Christina Avalar, and I would like to ask the City Council to heed the voice of the Roseland community and not approve the cannabis dispensary at 100 Sebastopol Road. Approving this dispensary would only amplify existing health disparities between Roseland and the rest of the city. Given that the proposed dispensary does not include a safe way of removing and managing the toxic waste a dispensary of this nature produces, the mere existence of this dispensary poses an immediate health risk to all those living in the surrounding area. There are already multiple dispensaries located along Sebastopol Road. The hyper-concentration of cannabis dispensaries in low-income communities, as in Roseland, is evidence of environmental racism in action. We do not need to fill this vacant lot with something that not only does not fulfill a community need, but that will be a detriment to public health. Resistance to this project persists because we know this dispensary will only do harm to the surrounding population. Regardless of what benefits the applicants claim to bring to Roseland, the people living in Roseland want no part of this dispensary regardless of what it is called. I urge the council to not approve the construction of this dispensary. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good evening, Council. My name is Manny Morales. I'm here speaking on behalf of the Latinx Student Congress. Students, community members, and families were present last week on Tuesday when we were here at City Council Chambers to submit over 900 uh, physical signatures that we have been collecting over the past month and a half in an effort to get this uh, dispensary uh, rejected by 
the Planning Commission and the appeal upheld by the City Council tonight. Again, we, we have to remember that this center, this location that's being proposed was the former home and center for learning for young people in Roseland. That's the, the one thing that we have to maintain in mind. The idea that we wanna repurpose it into something different, it should come as a result of considering the youth first, considering the community, considering the well-being, considering the health of, of Roseland. I'm here today to reassert our stance against a business that presents more injustices to an already neglected community. The proposed business, as you have heard in the appeal uh, presentation, will add to the disparities already affecting the health and well-being of residents in Roseland, like the dispromotion, disproportionate rate of asthma. Uh, we're concerned with the initial uh, miscommunication, not miscommunication, lack of communication from the city of Santa Rosa um, to be transparent in the, the plans for this location. The lack of translation services during the initial uh, planning commission meeting uh, is evidence of violations of the open government ordinance. Two, um, tonight we, we saw um, a commissioner, uh, a member of the planning commission um, present the, this proposed uh, plan. And what I noticed was a lot of skimming over the information that should have been talked about, should have been discussed. Again, tonight, I'll be submitting two, 200 more signatures, physical signatures that we collected over this weekend, one day alone, one one hour, two hours actually, of collecting signatures, over 200 signatures that we have collected, I'll be submitting them to add to the 900, to the over 900 that we had initially submitted. Um, and just so that you also know, a petition online on change.org is gonna come your way with over 500 more. That is um, going against the, six, the 60 that were claimed to have been um, gotten by this, by this company that's proposing this business. Thank, Thank you for you, your time. Thank you, sir. Ms. Manis, could you inform the community how to communicate via Zoom and uh, facilitate the remaining public comment? Will do. For those members of the public wishing to make comment via Zoom, please raise your hand. If you are participating by telephone, please dial star nine via Zoom. We do have one more member of the public wishing to speak live in council chamber, and we will move to that speaker first before moving to Zoom. And good evening, everybody. It's been a minute since I've been here. I used to come over on a regular basis to talk to the members of the city council about issues of gangs. I have a lot of experience on that issue, and that is one of the issues that Roseland has to deal with on a daily basis. And now the proposed uh, new old school, soon to possibly be named, it sounds like the members of the um, proposal group, the owners of the business are willing to negotiate for a moment, which is a very nice move because once they open, they're gonna make so much money in this facility that you, know, you can give it whatever name you want as long as they continue to make their money. So my name is Rafael Vasquez. I am here today as the advisor of Mecha of Santa Rosa Junior College, located at Santa Rosa Junior College. And one of the things that this council has done over the last few years is to propose something that is called the Open Government Ordinance, which states that the purpose of that ordinance is to create public trust to engage the community and to create a system of transparency, public participation, and collaboration. And just by stating that, I'm letting you know that this council and this city has violated that ordinance by not providing the information to the community in a language that they could understand. Two, the meetings happen while the Roseland community members are working Low-income community members often work until six, seven, or eight at night, and therefore you are excluding their participation when you don't allow them to be present 
at these meetings. Even the most recent meeting that this council had uh, in regards to the $10 million that you're wanting to put out there in Roseland, you had that meeting at one in the afternoon and we went out there and we asked the parents of Roseland and they said, it is obvious that the city council does not want the community of Roseland to participate thereby violating uh, this government open ordinance. So we want to point that out because at some point you may be looking at litigation by violating the rights of the community that elected you here. And just a couple of things in order to consider this proposed location, you have to look at the detrimental, whether or not there's any detriment to the public interest of the city. And again, unless you're going to exclude the opinions and the lives of the residents of Roseland, by providing an opportunity for this business to come in, you are also in violation of that part of that ordinance. And we can go on and talk about the environment as well. But again, most importantly, it is important that you listen to the voices of the people of Roseland. Thank you for your time. Thank you, sir. I see no additional members of the public wishing to speak from council and chamber. We will move to the Zoom participants. The first public commenter will be Sierra, followed by Dalo. Sierra, please go ahead. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Hi. <laughs> Hi, Mayor and Council Members. Um, my name is Sierra Lewitter, um, and I am here tonight to uplift the voices of the youth and community of Roseland to uphold the appeal tonight. Uh, this is not a fight against the cannabis industry. This is about a historically marginalized and underserved community having agency over their community. This is a land use issue. This is valuable land that can provide many beneficial resources other than cannabis. As your maps show and California reports show, there is plenty of cannabis being produced. The market is flooded. This is also an environmental racism issue. With the volatile extraction process, there are plenty of examples of marginalized communities being affected by quote unquote safe processes and their health being affected. This is not just a simple grow site or a small dispensary. Let's move away from this harmful extractive economy mindset to a community building one. I have talked to many community members of Roseland and they do not want this in their community. They have been asking for a multicultural center, resiliency hub, daycare, library, and many more community oriented options. I'm asking you please to listen to the Roseland community. As was pointed out by Manny, there are there is a petition against the dispensary with over a thousand signatures throughout Santa Rosa compared to the 43 and 500 or whatever throughout the, Rose, the Santa Rosa community that was presented um, by the applicants. Um, yes, I just urge you to listen to the actual members of the community. I know that there are some good intentions. I appreciate the updates and improvements and safety precautions, but you're not listening to the community. And that is the priority here. Um, thank you so much. Thank you. The next public comment will be from Dalo, followed by Joe Bell. Uh, okay. Buenas tardes. Mi nombre es Daisy. Mi comentario es sobre la importancia de de tener la construcción del dispensario en Rosla, ya que nos estamos en una comunidad que ha sido siempre marginada y más es, sabemos que esto no se ha hecho con la claridad que la ley ha requerido, como lo es el idioma en el que fue presentado. También este dispensario va a traer más problemas de salud a nuestros hijos que son perjudiciales. 
no podemos permitir el deterioro, el deterioro, deterioro, deterioro de nuestra salud, de nuestra comunidad. No sabemos a, a ciencia cierta los componentes y cómo se elabora. Tal vez haya riesgo de explosiones en áreas cercanas donde hay áreas de familias. Estamos cansados que nuestras comunidades sean blancos para este tipo de negocios que perjudican a nuestros jóvenes. Queremos un Rosland limpio sin este tipo de negocios. Es impresionante escuchar cómo presentan este proyecto. Lo hacen en una forma de crecimiento de Rosland. Hablan de equidad, cuando en realidad sabemos que están jugando con nuestras mentes, las mentes de nuestra gente que no estamos suficientemente informados, con nuestras necesidades de crecer y sabemos que no esta no es la forma de crecer. ¿Cómo queremos crecer y cómo y hablan más de equidad sin saber realmente qué necesita nuestra comunidad? Cannabis no es sinónimo de equidad. De equidad. Seamos inteligentes. Ningún dueño de un negocio nos dirá qué consecuencias traerá su producto. ¿Por qué no llevar este proyecto a áreas más sofisticadas, con más dinero? No tenemos dinero para vivir, sabemos que no vamos a tener dinero para consumir esto. Entonces, esto será que personas ajenas a nuestra área serán las que vendrán a consumir este, este producto. Preguntaron si esto ha sido motivo de delitos los locales de cannabis. Claro que van a responder que no. ¿Por qué? Porque sabemos que hay intereses, hay intereses en estos negocios. Um, estos negocios generan altas ganancias y, y son suficientes razones para buscar que se justifique y que se lleve a cabo. Estamos jugando dinero contra salud y seguridad. Pongan, pongan, ustedes sabrán cuál es el interés que quieren. Pónganse a pensar si esto fuera en su comunidad, si esto fuera a un lado de su casa. ¿Ustedes qué harían? ¿Qué decidirían? ¿Apelar o seguir apoyando? Esto no va a ser perjudicado para ustedes, es para nuestra comunidad. 43 firmas sobre mil es algo de pensarse. Nuestra comunidad... Y la voz de Rosland no quiere un dispensario en esa área. Queremos educación, queremos cura, necesitamos. Thank you, Pablo. Can you please restate that in English? Good evening. My name is Daisy, and I'm here, you know, to speak in regards to holding off on the construction of this dispensary. Uh, you know, this whole project hasn't been done with the clarity that it should have been done and not presented to us like it was presented to the other, the rest of the community. This is something that's going to harm our youth, and we can simply just not allow this it, to come to our community. Um, we're in an area where our health is deteriorating, and we don't want this. Um, you speak of how Rosen is, is supposed to be cleaning up. Well, this isn't helping the situation. Um, it's amazing how this has been presented and how you speak about this um, when when really you're not addressing the actual community that lives here. Uh, we don't want cannabis in our area. <clears throat> this is something that hasn't been done with fairness. <clears throat> uh, why not take this to an area where there's money? I mean, we don't have the money to afford any of this and it's gonna be, be bringing people to this community um, that maybe shouldn't shouldn't be here. <clears throat> um, we know that there is a lot of interest in this business and this business generates a lot of money and you're basically playing with the safety and our health over money. Now imagine if this was in your community or near your homes. Now you're talking about 43 signatures over a hundred or excuse me, over a thousand signatures. We simply don't want this in our community. And if interpreter can make a comment, please. Uh, just in regards to a reminder uh, that we ask participants tonight to speak slowly. So allow the interpreter to express their comments effectively. Entonces, quiero decir como recordatorio, les quiero pedir a los participantes de comentario público que hablen despacio para permitir que nuestro intérprete 
exprese sus comentarios con manera eficaz, por favor. Thank you. Thank you, Pablo. The next public comment will be from Joe Bell, followed by Patricia. Hi, my name is Jolie, and I'm calling in support of this project. I understand that people would prefer a community center or a library, um, but my concern is that this building has been vacant for a long time and that it hasn't. The city has chosen not to you know, use this as a public space and they haven't made any headway in making this into a public project for Roseland. Um, I, you know, the decision is at hand is whether you're going to allow this a local local people to bring a local business to Roseland. And yes, it is a big cannabis business, but it is also will be locally operated, owned and um, I believe that they will bring back to the community and put back and give jobs to um, people in the Roseland community. And I think that, you know, the potential employment and community and the economic growth for the community could be really good. Um, also, uh, you know, I believe in the decriminalization of marijuana, which I believe also leads to decriminalization in the streets and to less crime. Um, when things are legalized and treated as such. Um, and I also agree that I hope a portion of the tax money that is raised from this project will go directly, be allocated directly back to Roseland. I think that that's important, especially if businesses are going to be thriving there, um, that they do have a relationship with the community and the city also has a relationship with that community in order to give back. Um, you know, and I think people, I think it will benefit Roseland in other ways, if you're, if you have a one of a kind dispensary that is bringing people from other parts of Sonoma County or even out of the area to visit this place, they're going to be visiting other businesses and restaurants in the Roseland district, which will help with the economy there as well. So I just wanted to call in support of that. Thank you. The next public comment will be from Patricia followed by Elizabeth. Patricia, it looks like you are using an older version of Zoom and you will need to update your Zoom app in order to be able to speak at the meeting. Um, if you can do that and then re-raise your hand, we'll be happy to call on you uh, once you've done your Zoom update. We'll move on to Elizabeth. Hello, City Council um, and fellow community members. My name is Elizabeth Avila. I'm a community organizer in Sonoma County, and I'm here to urge the council today to uphold the appeal on the dispensary. Um, I will confess to you that I've only lived in Santa Rosa for a few months now, but I know one thing for sure from the five months that I've lived in the city and that from the work that I do with the community. And that one thing is that there is a large and wonderful and loving community in this city, in Roseland, in Santa Rosa whether it be among farm workers, tenants, immigrants, youth, students, or other groups of people. These people, these communities, they need spaces to learn, to be empowered, to thrive, to receive resources or services, and essentially really just to be in community with one another. Um, the people of Roseland and the youth from the Latinx Student Congress are rejecting this proposition for fun. They're not taking time out of their day to collect hundreds of signatures and gain support for fun. This is an issue that they feel strongly about, enough to put a huge amount of time and their energy into advocating for things that they really want to see in their community. I strongly believe that you should defer to these people that you are hearing from to know what is best for them to have in their community. And if they're saying that a dispensary is not that, then it should not be there. I strongly believe that by upholding the appeal and utilizing the space for our community purposes, you are in turn investing in the community and that will bring more benefits than distance, but than this dispensary could. Um, I'd also like to say that I personally don't have anything against cannabis use. What I do take issue with is prioritizing capital and merchandise over the interest and well-being of communities are directly impacted by your decisions. I take issue with choosing profits over people 
and I take issue with building metaphorical and, as it seems, literal walls that divide people rather than unite them. Um, businesses come and go. Businesses undergo leadership changes. They undergo policy, and they're simply not reliable. So as much as the applicant says that they are interested in benefiting the community, communities should not have to rely on businesses. They should be able to rely on each other and then able to do that, they need a space to cultivate those relationships that are filled with other members of the community of equal stature and people just like them. Um, so with that being said, I respectfully urge that you listen to the people and that you uphold the appeal. Thank you. Thank you. The next public comment will be from Woody followed by Veronica. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Good, good evening. My name is Woody Hastings. I live in unincorporated Sonoma County. Thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight. I'm, I'm here tonight to stand in solidarity with the Roseland residents who oppose this cannabis facility. I strongly agree with the community members calling for a true community serving uh, facility, uh, uh, true you know, community serving facility um, that, that meets community needs, that brings resources, education, health, you know, the things that have been talked about, like a library or a daycare, things like that. Um, I, I have nothing against cannabis or the cannabis industry. In fact, I use cannabis medicinally to treat my arthritis. And the reality is for me that there is absolutely, uh, there's already an abundance of cannabis dispensaries in Sonoma County. I, I have absolutely no problem obtaining cannabis um, so there's really, I don't think there is a need for a facility like this. So I join with uh, the Roseland community members urging you to reject the proposal. Thank you. Thank you. Patricia, I'm going to give you a shot uh, one more time just to see if you've been able to do your Zoom update. And it looks like you still need to do your Zoom update. Uh, interpreter Pablo, can you please restate that um, in order to participate, she needs to do a Zoom update and then can rejoin bueno, the meeting and raise her hand. Thank you. Bueno, Patricia, aparece que necesita usted actualizar su aplicación de Zoom para poder participar en este momento. Entonces le pedimos que por favor reinicie la aplicación actualizándola a la nueva versión y intente nuevamente levantar la mano para que la podamos llamar. Thank you. The next public comment will be from Veronica, followed by Mike. Um, hello, my name is Veronica. Um, just as last week's meeting, I was here urging you guys to uphold the appeal. Similar like what Manny said about collecting signatures, I was one of the many students in the club I'm in, Mecha going around the neighborhood, walking around, asking people for signatures, being at Bayer Farm while it was mid raining, asking for signatures because our education matters to us and wanting this to continue education because the school I am, Rosalind University Prep, the old site, we want it to continue to be a place where we could have a place to continue educating, continue learning, and prioritize our youth health and safety, such as a multicultural center or even a library center, because we're still here talking because our needs have been met. And we're going to continue until our needs have been met. And I urge you to think about the voices we heard and the signatures that we collected upholding the appeal, which was over a thousand, contrary to the other side, which was around 30. That's all. Thank you for your time. Thank you. The next public comment will be from Mike, followed by Mia. Hi, can everyone hear me? Yes. Hi, my name's uh, Michael Balderanos, and I've been a Santa Rosa resident for all my life, 33 years. Um, I just wanted to call in and um, give my overwhelming support for this project. Um, 
I can't think of anything more that this area needs than a thriving business coming in run by thoughtful um, and um, respectable members of this community to help bring over 50 plus jobs, I believe, to the community. Um, in turn, bringing people from all over Santa Rosa into Roseland, supporting the local businesses and the local economy. Um, the saying, all boats rise with the tide comes to mind uh, in this instance. I think it's an overwhelming positive um, for the area uh, and for Santa Rosa as a whole. So um, thank you for the opportunity to speak today and have a good night. Thank you, Mike. The next public comment will be from Mia, followed by resident with a telephone number ending in 3128. Mia, please unmute yourself and proceed with your comment. Sí, hola, me escuchan? Sí. Uh, hola, sí, mi nombre es Mia Valencia y soy parte de la comunidad de Roseland por más de 20 años. Y este, lo que quería decir es que sí quiero que aprueben este este proyecto para darnos muchas oportunidades para nosotros para trabajar y más importante para aprender sobre cannabis y educarnos más y no ser tan ciegos con esto tampoco. Si nosotros ya tenemos una tienda de cannabis, cuatro minutos donde quieren este proyecto, ¿cuál es la diferencia si ellos quieren darnos más oportunidad de trabajo? Como dice la señorita Rivera, 50 trabajos más. Eso es Eso es sin si me escuchan. Sí. Eso es otras oportunidades para nosotros para poder trabajar y aprender más sobre es, esto. No entiendo por qué dicen que violencia y todo eso sí, eso no tiene nada que ver con esto. Esto es algo medicinal para nosotros y para más importante para también poder aprender de esto. Eso es todo. Thank you. Pablo, can you please restate the speaker's comment? So my name is Mia Valencia, and I belong to the Rosen community for over 20 years now. And I'm calling to say that you should approve this. And this is really something that's going to give us an opportunity to learn about what cannabis is and to give us employment. Um, if we already live within four minutes away of another dispensary, what's the difference of having one here? If anything, it's given us more of an opportunity to learn about what this is and more employment. Um, I think the lady said 50 jobs. I mean, that's a lot. And I don't know why the issue of violence is being brought up. If anything, this is just a great opportunity and that's all. Thank you, resident with phone number ending in 3128 is the next public comment followed by Isabel. Please go ahead with Hello, your can everyone hear me? Yes. Hello, my name is Seth Spohr and I've lived in Santa Rosa since I was a child. I uh, entered the cannabis industry in 2018 and was pleased to see that it's filled with dedicated and hardworking citizens, upstanding citizens that you see every single day. It made me feel comfortable and I was able to thrive in this workforce ever since. Cannabis is something I am very passionate about. It fills me with happiness and I love waking up every day knowing I'm helping my fellow locals with medical needs, meditative needs and recreational wants. It also gives me the ability to provide for myself and to provide for my family. I hear people saying that they're looking for a library or a school, but I know that there are libraries in multiple schools within five mile radiuses of here. I've had nothing good or nothing but good experiences since I've been working as a cannabis consultant, and I wish nothing more than others to be able to have the same experiences and opportunities that I have had. Having another local dispensary will not only bring more jobs to our community, but more happiness, health, and wellness as well. Thank you very much for your time. All right, the next public comment will be from Isabel, followed by Ashley. Hello, I'm Isabel Lopez, Executive Director of the Arts and Cultural Nonprofit called Raices Collective, who's worked in Rose. 
Portland area. I'm here to urge the city council to uphold the appeal at 100 Sebastopol Road. I am here to support the youth and the community of Roseland who have spoken out against having a dispensary in Roseland. What I do support and have supported um, is their outspoken need for a community center and a permanent library. Um, from my experience working in Roseland, the people of Roseland have, have yet to have a safe uh, community space and a permanent library. Um, I've seen a couple of libraries that um, are not yet permanent. Uh, based on the portrait of Sonoma County, Roseland does have one of the lowest life expectancies in the county. Um, and it is concerning that there is a lack of an analysis of uh, an environmental impact on the land and on the health of the residents of Roseland. Um, this alone should be a red flag to the council. The way in which the city planning commission notified Roseland residents about this project poses some serious equity issues. The approval of it is even more concerning, especially since there were 26 residents of Roseland who opposed it versus the eight. Um, at the meeting where it was approved. I asked the council to reconsider this dispensary in Roseland and support the appeal. I urge you to listen to the Roseland residents and work with them to bring about projects that they do want and have wanted for a really long time. Um, I think it's enough with the environmental racism, racism in Roseland. Um, thank you. The next public comment will be from Ashley, followed by Jesus. Hello, my name is Ashley Oldham. I'd like to thank the City Council for taking the time to hear us today. I'm calling today in support of this project as both a woman in the cannabis industry, as well as a mother of school-aged children. As a woman in the industry, I'm offended to hear people continue to refer to dispensary owners as drug dealers. California voted cannabis to be legal five years ago today. As a, um, as a mother, I feel that I, that, sorry, I was having some computer trouble here. Um, as a mother, I feel that you know, Roseburn um, Prep School, in my understanding, is that it moved over two years ago, and it did not move because a cannabis business was coming. Um, it, it moved for its own reasons. I understand the feelings of the kids that used to go to school there. However, I don't feel like it should be substantiated, considering that the two projects have nothing to do with each other. It's also my understanding that the city had a chance to buy this property and hasn't done it yet. I believe that this project will bring a lot of jobs into the community, good paying jobs and lots of tax money. I am in support of this project and I hope that you all can consider it. Thank you. The next public comment is from Jesus followed by Ryan. Hello, my name is Jesus Perez and I am a current senior at, at Roseland University Prep. I am also here on behalf of my metric club. I am opposed to this project simply for the matter that I believe it is wrong that our voices here are not being taken into consideration or, at all. As previously stated before, the lack of communication that was given to us is honestly baffling as we were only informed of a project like this mere days before it was set to happen. The fact that we had to scramble around to gather as much information as possible and investigate in our own rather than be given to it, get, be, have it be given to us by the city that we trust to listen to us and inform us of what's been going on, going on in our city is honestly a bit disheartening. I believe that us, Rosen, have a, have a better use for a community center or a library as we have been requesting for years. And the fact that our voices keep getting ignored and our request being denied in support of businesses that we have not been asking for is ridiculous to me. I request to you, the Center of the City Council, that you uphold the appeal because our voices matter just as much as everyone else's. And the fact that there are more people who are in favor of us at opening up a library or a community center in that location should be plenty for you. We, the city, 
We the city slash community trust you. We do not want to see you break our trust as you have over the past few years. Here is a chance for you to do what is right for us, the community, and listen to us. Thank you for your time. Next public comment will be Ryan, followed by Anna. Ryan, go ahead. Sorry, I had to unmute myself there. Thank you, go ahead. Sorry, uh, thank you. Thank you, City Council, for listening to me and all the local residents this evening. I uh, definitely have heard some outlandish and generalized statements, so I'm just going to keep it to what I know, and that's, um, you know, construction. And I am uh, in construction in Sonoma County and been a resident here off of Sebastopol Road for a number of years now, and I've just never seen Roseland improve. And knowing construction and knowing how much things actually cost you know this is not an opportunity to just put some paint on this building and call it a library or a children's center it's not going to be something long term or sustainable or inspiring to the youth that it's meant to be so here's a chance to bring in an architecturally designed new building uh, 10 million dollars of new construction technology and cleaning up nearly a block of Roseland that is in dire need of repair. You know, putting cameras and, um, you know, well-lit area is not an area that breeds uh, illegal activity, uh, such as all the sideshows or all of the actual drug dealing that's already happening on the streets um, all throughout Roseland already. So, you know, I just support, I support this just from a, hey, we're going to bring in some some new construction here. It is going to um, uh, rise with the tides. I think it's going to attract more developers and attract um, the community to to uh, actually stay there, stay stay local to that area, and um, that would obviously be more appealing than to build a children's center and a library and other new construction around the area. Um, I think just would be um, a chance to to give it a facelift in an area that, that really needs it. Thank you. Thank you. The next comment will be from Anna, followed by Michelle. Anna, go ahead. Anna? Okay, we will come back to Anna. It looks like she might be having some technical difficulties. We will um, try her again momentarily. Michelle, please unmute yourself and proceed with your comment. Hi, can everybody hear me? Yes. Um, my name is Michelle Saxon, and I am a female member of the cannabis community. Um, I have repeatedly heard people say, go somewhere else with this. Um, I feel there's a lack of information. There's dispensaries all over California, from Hollywood to Palm Springs. And I feel like there's a hypothetical fear of cannabis based on a lack of experience and knowledge. If this was a winery or a brewery, would people be opposed to it? And I'm just wondering how people think that the city will be able to have cultural centers and libraries without allowing tax paying businesses to be a part of the community. Um, the cannabis tax is 27%. Um, you know, that's higher than, than any other. Um, and I also heard somebody else say that there was 43 signatures um, of people um, in support of this. Um, and it was 563 from what I heard. So. Um, I just wanted to offer my support. Thank you. Thank you. The next public comment will be from resident with a phone number ending in 2722, followed by Ryan.
President 2722, please unmute your mic and proceed with your comment. Okay, we'll move along to Ryan, resident 2722, we'll circle back. Ryan, please proceed with your comment. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, my name is Ryan and I'm a uh, resident of Santa Rosa. I was involved with the efforts that canvassed uh, the neighborhoods directly adjacent to the proposed property. And it is correct, we received 563 signatures um, in support of the project, but 43 of those were from neighbors that um, live directly adjacent to the proposed property and the ones that would be most directly impacted by um, this project going in or remaining vacant. During those conversations, um, I spoke with over 60 people. Um, the vast majority supported the, the project. Um, close to 70% of the people that we spoke to were willing to sign the petition and include their address, um, showing that they lived right there near the area. Um, some of the concerns that they mentioned and why they do support this project is that the building has remained vacant for two years. It's poorly lit. Um, they don't feel safe walking by that area. There has been issues with um, uh, people having their packages stolen off of the property. The neighbors actually um, referenced that there was a homeless issue um, due to that property being vacant and people taking up residents around there. And they were having their packages stolen, cars broken into. And so they were actually excited to talk to me and learn about the project, learn that a business was coming in there that um, would be having security. Uh, they would be improving the lighting in the area, bringing more people to the area, spending money, um, bringing more jobs into the area. Um, several people even asked, you know, when we'll be opening up, uh, if we'll be hiring. Um, so I was actually extremely surprised by the overall support um, that I got while canvassing that area. Um, and so I think if you go and talk to the neighbors that live right there, the ones that are going to be most impacted by this project or by remaining vacant as it's been for the last two years, you'll see that they are excited to have a business come in and uh, begin using that space and be a positive con contributor to the, uh, the local community. Thank you. Thank you. The next public comment will be from Ross, followed by Virginia. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, so my name is Ross. Um, I've lived here for two thirds of my life and I would just like to say that I'm in support of this project. It actually will provide more security to the community area it is in. It will also provide jobs as mentioned, you know, I'm basically repeating what's been said before, but so security jobs, um, that's really my biggest focus. I, I don't want to take too much time, so I'll just leave it at that. Thank you. If you are participating by telephone and wish to make a comment, please dial star nine to raise your hand. When we call on you, if you need to unmute yourself via telephone, please dial star six upon prompting. Um, the next public comment will be from Virginia followed by M. Payne. Muy buenas tardes eh, ad, al concilio. Les suplico, les pido por favor, que rechacen la propuesta del dispensario de marihuana. Yo soy Virginia Lazo, soy un padre voluntario que ha participado trabajando y ayudando en las escuelas de Rosland. Yo he ofrecido mi trabajo voluntario en Shepherd, en Rams, en Rosland, acelerada, Middle School, y en RUP, Rosland Universidad Preparatoria. 
Mi comunidad no necesita un dispensario de marihuana. Somos una comunidad que nos gusta educarnos y no queremos que nuestra comunidad esté expuesta a drogas y esto es, incluye la marihuana. En mi, en mi experiencia ayudando en las escuelas de Rosland, el uso de la marihuana u otras drogas por los estudiantes los expone gravemente a algo, ¿verdad? Que ellos empiezan, digamos, tratándolo o queriéndolo conocer. Una vez que estas drogas los atrapan, de verdad es tan difícil para los padres para los mismos estudiantes que ven cómo sus compañeros se hunden en las drogas. Difícilmente un estudiante que está atrapado por las drogas, incluyendo la marihuana, regresa a las escuelas. Esto lleva a sufrimiento, no solamente de los padres, toda la familia, toda la familia se hunde con este problema. Una cosa es que las drogas, ahora la marihuana sea legal, pero eso no quiere decir que no representa un peligro. Es un peligro muy grande y es un peligro para nuestros jóvenes. No queremos un dispensario de marihuana. Queremos otras cosas, bibliotecas, escuelas de música. Si se trata de negocios, por favor, pongan otro tipo de negocios, pero no drogas, por favor. No queremos un dispensario de marihuana que hunda a nuestros jóvenes y a nuestra comunidad de Rosland. Gracias. Thank you, Pablo. Can you please restate that speaker's comments in English? Mm -hmm. Good evening to fellow council members. Um, I'm here to beg you and to ask you that you please reject this proposal and uphold. Uh, my name is Virginia Lasso, and I'm a voluntary, uh, excuse interpreter, <laughs> I'm a volunteer and I help out at the different schools here in Roseland, at Shepherd, Rams, um, Roseland Accelerated Middle School, and at uh, Roseland University Prep. And in my community, we don't need anything like this. Here, we're in a community where we like to educate ourselves. Um, we don't want exposure to drugs, including marijuana. You know, this exposes students uh who get into wanting to try this out or they become curious about it and it's an entrapment they can become trapped in it and it becomes difficult not only for the students themselves to stop but also for their uh, student colleagues and for the parents it's something that traps the students and the families drown in this use um, now that marijuana is legal You know, not to say that it's not dangerous, um, but we want other things in our community, like a library or a school. Uh, put something else, not this dispensary. Thank you. The next public comment will be from M. Payne, followed by Max. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Thank you. Oh, great. Hi, my name is Mark Payne. I'm 63 years old and I've been in Sonoma County 60 years of my life. And I'm hearing all these different comments and so forth and feeling that in that location and being by it several times and looking at it, it's a, probably an ideal location for a dispensary. You start thinking about all the dispensaries that are in Sonoma County. And there's going to be more that are be popping up all over Sonoma County. What's better than to have a private facility with security, uh, education, um, a place where you go for that particular reason, rather than going into a shopping center and walking by all these children, they're going to all these other stores, and then they walk by a dispensary with not being educated of what a dispensary really is and what it's for. I think this location being private. Uh, cleaning up the whole area. The place has been vacant for two years. There was a school at one time. It was uh, uh, proposed to the city for whatever reason, a library, school, and no one has came up. There's a lot of other locations in the Roseland area that would be ideal also. So I don't think punishing the landowner for 
um, what somebody would like. We'd all like to have certain things, but it's also what it is to uh, to keep working and keep building in the community. I know that that would be a great asset to the area because it will bring up the area. People are concerned about safety. It, what would be safer than to walk by a area that's lit, that has security, or is it better to walk by a dark, dingy, homeless, uh, vacant old building that uh, I would be scared to walk by? Um, I, I really think this is something that should be really looked at carefully. And I think by looking at it carefully, the right decision is to approve this project. And going, I was at the last meeting with the planning commission. And when the planning commission went through all the criteria for where this property is in location, it was approved by six zero vote. One person was missing, I understand that. But who's to say if it wouldn't have been a seven uh, in favor of this project? So looking at anything else but the scope of what we have here would be um, I don't know, I, how would you say, just not right. So I really feel that this thing should be approved. I think it will help the whole community. And again, children, guess what? This is a great location for maybe some of the parents that don't really know what cannabis is about or what the benefits of cannabis are um, or how a lot of people don't go to the doctors because they don't know. But this is a, a facility that can be used for everybody and an educational facility. So by all means, I surely hope that we get a, uh, a vote of approval by every city council member. Thank you so much. Thank you. The next public comment will be from Max followed by June. Good evening, city council. Hope you're doing well and staying awake. Um, my name is Max Bell Elper, I'm the executive director of North Bay Jobs with Justice. Um, so glad that we're getting to have this conversation and thank you everybody for your patience and sticking with it to, to hear all the public comments. Um, so for folks who may not know, North Bay Jobs with Justice is a coalition of over 30 organizations uh, based here in Santa Rosa. Um, we uh, represent labor and community organizations. So teachers and healthcare workers, immigrant rights organizations, climate activists, um, you know, a real, a real wide range uh, of people in our community. And, you know, me personally, I, I, I strongly support uh, cannabis. Um, but today, uh, we're here as an organization to in, in opposition to this project, and in solidarity with uh, the youth and parents uh, of Roseland. Um, you know, there's, there are lots of dispensaries in in our community. Um, this is probably, you know, some of the, the most opposition that you've heard um, to a dispensary, not so much uh, because of cannabis, but because of the real desires and wishes of the community here to make sure that there that there is a place Place, uh, a real community center um, in in a in a part of the the city that has has long been neglected and has not been given the same opportunities, um, and so we we think it's it's important to really listen listen to the people most impacted, which are are the students, are the parents, are the residents uh, of Roseland who have clearly said that this is not what their wish is. In addition, from from our perspective at Jobs with Justice, uh, you know we 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 think it's important. To to look at not just uh, are there jobs being created, but are they good jobs? And the reality is that there are dispensaries in Sonoma County that are that are union dispensaries that mean that people have health care and they have good paying jobs and they have job security. Um, and I have not heard anything from the uh, the proponent of this dispensary um, that they are entering into an agreement with with a union to make sure that these are good jobs. And we in in San Rosa and Sonoma County, we should do better than just creating jobs, but making sure that they're good jobs that can really support the community. In addition, there's also the jobs of construction. Um, and, you know, it's not just enough to do the construction. It matters. Are those jobs that, that local trained um, workers who are union members can do. And so from, from our perspective, we're asking you as city council to really listen to the residents of Roseland um, and to, to hold a higher standard of what it means to create a business in our community to make sure that they're actually good for the community and good jobs. Thank you very much and hope you have a good night. Thank you. The next public comment will be from June followed by Dennis.
Hello, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay. Good evening. My name is June Bershares, and I'm a volunteer with the NBOP's Climate Justice Task Force. And it was an exploring uh, the, in the community what community interest there might be in potentially developing a resiliency hub. Uh, that I became aware of this project and listening to the community. We started hearing from a lot in the Roseland who were very opposed to this project at this site, the uh, cannabis business for this site. And um, I'm very here to ask you to also listen to those community members. I'm very concerned that there's been an ongoing lack of equity on who's being listened to, who's really paid attention to when they speak up. Um, there's ongoing structural inequities and in how those voices are brought forward, um, even in uh, the packet tonight. Um, and uh, in this whole process, I don't think we'd be where we were if there weren't some of those voices that were in opposition that were not paid attention to fully to the level they should be. And I looked in the packet and I couldn't find the petitions that have been referenced. And so I'm concerned about that. I'm wondering where those are. I know last week uh, we saw during public comment, I think that was the over 900 signatures and opposition submitted, but I don't see those in the updated packet. But I did want to point out that this is for project is a conditional use permit, meaning it's discretionary for the city council whether you approve this or not. There's no entitlement for a for-profit business to be permitted for the site. It's conditional, meaning they have to meet extra hurdles and meet those, including being in the public interest, which I would say they do not meet. You hear a lot from the public that they're not in the interest of the community. And even for those who argue they meet the hurdles, um, it's still discretionary. And it seems inappropriate for the council to uh, make a special exception for a conditional use when there's so much of the community that's opposed. This has not got the consensus of the community. Um, I'm not against cannabis. I purchase cannabis, but that's there's plenty of cannabis business in the area. We don't have in the area, as the community says, enough of the educational resources. And approving this at this unique site will make it harder to obtain the community goals to get a educational multicultural center, the long promised facilities that are due this community. So we need to hit the pause button and not roll over the voices that have a stake in shaping their own future in Roseland. So I ask you to please listen to the full community and not support just the slice of folks that want to benefit, but listen to the full community. The next public comment is from Dennis, followed by Chris. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Please go ahead. All right, thank you. My name is Dennis Hunter, and uh, thank you, City Council, for listening to this appeal. Um, I really wanted to talk about, you know, I, I understand the, the desire of the community to have a cultural center. and you know, our library, and, and I totally understand that, but I, I think it's really important to understand that, that this this building was vacant and the city looked at it and decided not to move forward and purchase it. And and then it was stayed vacant and then a new person came in to, to you know, to build a business here. And, and when the city said they didn't want it at that time, they were looking at other properties. And, and so I, I think it's important also the, the city has not said that they want this property right now. So what you're really looking at is a proposal of, of a project that's going to create, you know, over 50 jobs. And that's not counting the construction jobs and, and the money being spent in the community to actually build out this facility. Um, that's what's on the table right now. There, there's not a community center on the table. That is that the city is not coming out and saying, we want this facility there. It, it's the community saying they want a facility either like this or another. They want a cultural center and they're asking the city for that. But I, I think it's really unfair of the property owner and the applicant to, to act as what you get if the city doesn't move forward, if you deny it because this, that for a, a library, 
and they don't go forward with a library or a community center, you're back to a vacant building in the, it's sitting here with the plight that, that's, that's happening now. And that's not fair to that community. It's not fair to the applicant, not fair to anybody. Um, and so I, I don't think this is a decision. It, is it a community center or this project? Because there's only one, one thing that's actually in front of us right now, and that is a project. And so I just think it's important to look at that. I think there was another comment about it being kind of surrounded by residential and, and on three sides of it, it's industrial. And on the fourth side, it's the railroad tracks and then, and then a, a, a big barrier wall and then some apartments. So it's, it's not surrounded by residential as well. Um, I think it is a perfect place for a dispensary and I hope that the city council uh, will look at all the things It checked every box um, it, and the applicant did its, its job to do every piece of that and the planning commission seen that. So I hope the city council does as well. Thank you guys for your time. Okay, the next comment will be from Chris followed by Camille. Uh, hi there, I'd first like to um, thank the council for um, taking their time and, and listening to the community's concerns. Um, my name is Chris Dolly. I'm a Sonoma County resident for um, many years now, born out in Sebastopol, um, currently residing in, in unincorporated Sonoma County. Um, I, I would just really like to emphasize uh, the potential economic benefits of um, opening this uh, this dispensary. Um, you know, as mentioned before, um, fifty plus jobs, uh, a lot of potential tax revenue um, that could really benefit the community and be put towards uh, those public spaces. Um, those, you know, libraries, the community centers, the schools. Um, yeah, it's, it, there's just a lot of potential economic benefits, uh, that could just bring prosperity to, um, that area. Uh, so I just like to, again, reiterate, thank you for taking your time and listening to the community concerns. Um, I'm in support of this project. Um, again, I think it will, will provide an overall positive um benefit to uh, the resident community thank you thank you the next public comment is from camille followed by andrew hi can you hear me yes i can please proceed thank you um first i'd like to thank the council for listening to our comments uh and i would like to say that i'm definitely in favor of this project. Um, I'm a lifetime resident of Santa Rosa. I'm also a mother of two children, ages 22 and five. Um, I am part of the cannabis industry as well. So is my partner and my oldest child. I wanna say that not only will this project bring jobs to the community, not just for the people who work there, but for the construction workers that come and all the benefits that come with that. There's also a huge amount of taxes, as I know, from working in this industry. We talk about safety in the community, and I've never felt safer at a place of work than in the cannabis industry. I allow myself, my partner, like I said before, and my child to go to work in this industry. And I think safety is of the utmost importance. I also am a very big advocate of local business owners. I think this is one of the most important things that we could advocate for in our community. Again, there has been nothing in this location for several years, and I don't see anything coming there in the future except for this project. Um, I just wanna say thank you for listening to our comments. And again, I hope that you approve this project and have a wonderful night. Thank you. The next public comment will be from Andrew, followed by Sylvia. Andrew, go ahead and unmute your microphone. Okay, I think I just did. Can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Okay, beautiful. 
Hi, my name is Andrew Kramer. i um, been a resident of Roseland for the last four or five years or so. Um, you know, I've, I've been over to the site before. I've been over there at night. Um, you know, a little, little sketchy over there. Um, in all actuality, I feel like Roseland is kind of like having like a cool like renaissance and like with like Mitote Food Park and, you know, like all the things that we have going on in the community. And realistically, I think it's very fantastic to have a business coming in that's going to be employing people and, you know, like from local people for local people. And I think that's really, really important. And, uh, you know, there's realistically, if this was a liquor store or it was a wine bar, there, you know, wouldn't even be public hearings. But the fact that, you know, it's a cannabis business, it's under so much scrutiny. It's, it's kind of, kind of ridiculous. And, you know, for this building to sit there vacant for years, and it's not like the city has done anything with it. It's been sitting there. And so to have somebody who's willing to come in and invest in the community, hire people from the community, do things for the community, I think is incredibly important. So, you know, I would really hope for y'all to kind of consider this and, you know, like take it all into account because like, you know, like I've been out here, we, we need jobs, you know, we need good jobs. And, you know, from what I've seen, the cannabis industry typically, you know, pays people pretty well, has good benefits and, you know, I mean, it really takes care of the community and, you know, like we're such a wine centric area and it's, you know, it's, it's interesting, but like in all actuality, I would just really like to see this project go forward because, you know, the, uh, the, the county hasn't done, you know, anything with it. And so like, you know, something needs to be done and let's not let it become like a vagrant hangout where it's super unsafe for the neighborhood. You know, I've never seen a dispensary that hasn't had cameras, hasn't had security, hasn't had lighting, hasn't actually been a much safer place than, you know, a block down the street. So um, very much in favor of this as a local resident and just, you know, really wanted to kind of voice my opinion. So thank you very much for hearing. Appreciate you. Have a beautiful night. Thank you. The next public comment will be from Sylvia, followed by Alicio. Hello, um, my name is Sylvia Langa, um, dear city council members. Thank you for listening. I urge you to uphold the appeal uh, because of the serious violation um, of the open ordinance. I am in full opposition of having a cannabis dispensary in the former school location in Sebastopol Road. There are many reasons for you to reconsider this decision. First of all, I have had the opportunity to speak with more than 100 Rosalind community members, and the majority of them, including the people who live next to the old school, were not aware that there was an interest in having a dispensary in that location. Days before the dispensary approval, only a few Rosalind community members were informed of what was transpiring. The commissioner's ignorance of the lack of information distributed to the public must be acknowledged. This is a serious violation of the proper information that the public should have, and it's a clear exclusion of community of color from decision making that affects their health, their health and well being. Earlier in today's presentation, I heard that one of the positive steps to prevent uh, violence is to support the community's needs. The Rosaland community has expressed on numerous occasions that they are in need of a community center. Rosaline is one of the neighborhoods that lacks adequate recreational space and social environments. We have fewer parks and services than other places in Santa Rosa. If you are not listening to our needs, then you are excluding Rosaline racial minorities from this discussion. Please listen listening to the Rosalind community, listen, uh, especially listen to the youth and the requests as they are vital to our community stability. Thank you. Thank you. The next public comment will be from Alicio, followed by Maria. Okay, great. Um, Hello everyone, my name is Lisa Pachuca. I am a student in RUP and I wrote down a bunch of random notes. So if this is a bit out of the like random, then um, please excuse me. 
about that. Anyway, I'm against the dispensary for multiple reasons. So first things first, if our economic crisis were as easy as having more jobs available, we wouldn't be seeing record high unemployment and business closures. The jobs exist everywhere. I could walk into an in and out of Target, you know, I could walk into any store basically, ask for a job and I would be granted an application. So what we really have to worry about is, you know, incentive, benefits, cheaper cost of living, which is a whole different story, but making more jobs doesn't solve that issue. I'd also like to talk about the idea of trickle-down economics, because a lot of what we're seeing right now is helping a business grow. You know, we want to give this lot to a marijuana company. And if we take a look at our history in the U.S., you will notice that whenever we help businesses grow, we see that they only grow and we get poor. Because when we look at, for example, I think it was uh, 2008, 2013. I was 10 years old, so excuse me for not getting the dates right. But we build out government banks, sorry. We build out banks when our economy was failing. And people only lost their jobs. You know, we, we the people only got poor while CEOs and people, you know, massive landlords only got richer. And yeah, we shouldn't be placing the responsibility of making a better community to businesses because we live in a capitalist society. So the role of companies is profit. Their whole motivation is that profit margin. And the whole idea of a government is to represent the people. And I'm sad that we're forgetting this because when we take a look at the, the, the main idea of what everyone here wants is a better community. People want the like a marijuana company to exist here, not because they want you know, like this company to thrive. They don't want this business to thrive. What they want is a better, you know, more taxes to help the people. They want less crime around the area. They want the decriminalization of marijuana. And these aren't things that this company is responsible for. These are things that you, the city council, as well as the government as a whole are responsible for. This business has no incentive whatsoever to give back to the community. I'm sure that they probably are trying their very hardest to make as many profits as they can. So what, you, what we, we all really need to analyze today is whether we just want another business to exist or if we want a community center and something for the people to exist. Because that is what we all really need. Thank you. Thank you. Next public comment will be from Maria followed by Marlene. Buenas noches, ¿me escuchan? Sí. Muy buenas noches. Mire, estoy um, escuchando todos los comentarios, ¿verdad?, durante estas últimas dos, tres horas. Y precisamente nosotros vivimos aquí en la Roslan por más de diez años. Entonces, ahorita nos juntamos un grupo de amigos que vivimos en la misma calle. Y, este, y no todo lo que están diciendo es cierto, ¿verdad? Este... En esta comunidad necesitamos trabajos, necesitamos el progreso, necesitamos enseñarle a nuestros hijos la importancia de qué es bueno y qué es malo. Qué es malo, que ellos se anden escondiendo, anden comprando cosas con personas que en realidad venden otras cosas que no está bien. Necesitamos enseñarles que, que la marihuana no es exactamente una droga, Esto ayuda a muchas personas, ¿verdad? Y aquí estoy con un grupo de amigos. Muy buenas noches. Hola, buenas noches. Buenas noches. Entonces, este, los voy a dejar que hablen un poquito ellos también. Hola, muy buenas noches. Mi nombre es Joaquín Torres. Este, estoy totalmente de acuerdo con la creación de nuevo dispensario, ya que este, este dispensario generará empleos a nuestra comunidad. Es una fuente de progreso para Rosland. Este, mm, gran parte de la problemática que se ha estado manejando es cuestión de educación de los padres hacia los hijos. Eh, el dispensario únicamente lo que va a ayudar es a generar empleo y, este, y a, al progreso de, de nuestra comunidad. 
Buenas noches, mi nombre es Victoria Cortés y estoy a favor de la construcción del dispensario, ya que como han comentado mis, mis amigos, es una fuente de ingresos para la comunidad y con la educación necesaria, no creo que sea una fuente de peligro para la juventud. Hola, buenas noches, mi nombre es Carlos. Uh, pues yo también, mire, tengo tantísimos años viviendo por acá, bueno, y en lo particular yo consumo bajo prescripción médica eh, productos del dispensario, lo que, ojalá que se lleve a cabo un dispensario, tengo familia desempleada que está feliz de que va a haber trabajos y pues yo estoy a favor, mi voto es que ojalá se lleve a cabo un dispensario, gracias. Buenas noches a todos. Pablo, can you restate those comments in English, please? Of course. Um, good evening. Um, and I, I've been listening to all the comments that have been stated in the last two or three hours. Um, and I've lived here in Roseland for uh, approximately 10 years now. And um, we've actually gathered here with a few of our friends to, to make some comments. Um, and I think that not everything that's being said is true. Um, I think we want this in our community. This is going to provide employment. And I think a lot of the negative things that are being said is just due to lack of information and, <clears throat> and understanding. Uh, we want to teach our youth that they don't have to go to the corner dealer and, and get something unknown. You know, we want to teach them the right way and we want to teach them the appropriate things. Um, and like I said, I have uh, many of my friends here that are also going to be giving a comment as well. So I'll let the next one go. Um, good evening. My name is Jackie Torres, and I agree with having this dispensary here. I think it's something that's going to provide employment and progression. Um, and again, I think the great majority of the problem is just comes from the lack of information. Um, again, I think this is going to help with employment and with progression in our community. Um, it's a great income fountain that is going to be built here. Um, and I don't think it's something dangerous for our community. Um, uh, the next commenter stated, uh, my name is Carlos. I have been living here in the community for uh, many, many years. Um, and I do want to say that I do consume um, medical cannabis um, to help with my ailments. Um, this is something I think that I think my, my family is happy to hear that this is coming here. It's going to provide some employment for them. Um, and uh, yeah, we, we all in approval of this. Thank you. Thank you. The next public comment will be from Marlene, followed by Anna. Marlene, go ahead. Marlene, can you unmute your microphone? Okay, I'll circle back to Marlene after Anna. Anna, please unmute your microphone. Sí, buenas noches. Hola. Buenas noches, ¿me escucha? Sí. Sí, buenas noches a todos los miembros del ayuntamiento. Uh, mi nombre es Ana Salgado y tengo 16 años viviendo cerca del área de Roslyn. Soy propietaria. Y la razón que yo estoy este, esta noche aquí es para apoyar la apelación y también porque como miembro de la comunidad uh, he visto um, cómo varias familias han sido afectadas uh, por este producto que se está promoviendo. Eh, planear ahí, ¿verdad?, eh, algunas veces los jóvenes tan chicos empiezan a fumar este producto y les ha puesto en, una, en un camino de, de problemas ante la ley. Eh, el problema no es de educarnos, de educación de eso. El problema es de que, eh, por ejemplo, las personas que no tienen documentos, el hecho de que tengan algún delito por esto, ya sea por uso, por consumo o por traerlo con ellos, 
pues ustedes saben, las repercusiones son grandes y eso ha estigmatizado esto en nuestra comunidad porque varios padres han, han este, uh, pues desafortunadamente han lidiado con estos problemas dado a que, como les digo, los jóvenes son curiosos y si esto está por ahí, lo, lo van a, a usar, ¿verdad? Y ustedes saben, ha habido llamadas de las escuelas porque chicos han llevado esto a sus escuelas porque lo han fumado. Entonces, esa es la clase de, de estigma que crece alrededor de nosotros los padres de que decimos, ok, esto no es bueno para ellos. Entonces, como ya están en un récord y eso, ya para cuando están adultos, eh, pues ellos lo ven de otra forma. Pero mientras uno tiene otro estatus, uno siempre lo está viendo como un posible riesgo. Entonces, con esto yo quiero decirle que le devolvamos la dignidad, la seguridad y el respeto a Rosland. Porque si ustedes se fijan, en varios lugares siempre están las áreas que están más problemáticas y más calientes. Y entre ellos figura Rosland. Entonces, ¿para qué vamos a ponerle, como dice el dicho, otra raya al tigre, verdad? Entonces, eh, yo quiero unirme a toda esa comunidad que estamos viendo por el bien y el progreso de Rosland, pero con, con buenas cosas, como un centro comunitario, una biblioteca, algo que les ayude a los jóvenes a construir mejores, este, mejor su futuro y no ponerlos en un camino uh, donde siempre van a tener problemas y van a tener una etiqueta. Muchas gracias. Buenas noches. Good evening. Uh, good evening to all the council members. Um, I've been living here in the Roseland area for about 16 years now. I'm a homeowner and I'm here to support the appeal of this dispensary. I think as a community member, I've lived here and I've seen so many people that have been affected by the use of marijuana and others. Um, you know, the youth, they start consuming the product, which creates a problem uh, later on with the law. And I don't think it's necessarily about educating us. I think it's, I think it's creating an issue. This is creating an issue with consumption. Um, this is something that has been stigmatized uh, within our community for many years. Uh, kids get curious about the use. If it's around, they'll want to try it. Um, and I think as many of you know, there have been calls to the, from the schools um, in regards to kids using in school and smoking. <clears throat> Um, and I think it's something that's very difficult to understand um, as a child uh, because you don't really have a record. But once you're older, uh, this is something that's going to stick with you. You know, people maybe without the status. Um, so let's return the dignity and good health to the area of Roseland. And why, you know, as the saying says, um, it's hard to translate. Um, why add a stripe to the tiger? Um, as a direct translation, um, you know, we want progress in our community. So why don't you bring good things, uh, like a community center or a club, something that's going to better the future of, of our youth and, and not be given labels. Thank you, Pablo. The next public comment will be from Ana, followed by Rosa. Ana, can you unmute your microphone? Your microphone? Acabo, acabo de hablar. Sí. Oh, lo siento. Rosa, followed by resident ending in five six nine five. Rosa, go ahead. Buenas noches. A mi nombre es Rosa López y tengo en la comunidad de Roseland por más de 10 años y yo estoy de acuerdo y también mi familia y queremos que aprueben con este proyecto de Roseland. 
este lugar donde quieren el proyector ya tiene meses solo. La señorita Rivera va a darnos oportunidades para trabajo y aprender sobre la marihuana medicinal. Si la comunidad quisiera y les importábamos tanto, ¿por qué hace tiempo no pusieron algo ahí para darnos a nosotros oportunidades y la comunidad y más empleo? ¿Que no tenemos una tienda de cannabis? ¿Hace una milla? La diferencia, ¿Cuál es la diferencia si aprueban con este lugar? Si ya tenemos uno en, en la comunidad. La comunidad no sabe nada sobre cannabis y nosotros necesitamos que nos eduquen más sobre esto porque solamente muchos pensamos que es algo malo y al contrario no lo es, es algo medicinal. Los beneficios del cannabis van mucho más allá de relajarse, ya que se pueden utilizar para varios tratamientos y varias enfermedades. So, yo y mi familia estamos de acuerdo y queremos que aprueben con este proyecto. Es todo. Good evening. Um, my name is Rosa Lopez, and I've lived in the Rosen community for over 10 years now with my family. I would like you to approve this project. Um, I think we agree. Uh, this area has been vacant for many years now. And I think Ms. Rivera is going to provide us with the education that we need to understand and also employ us. And, you know, what is the difference? We have a dispensary about a mile away from here already. So what's the difference to having another one here? Um, and I think a lot of it has to do with us not being educated too much on this product. Um, it's not really something dangerous. It is something medicinal. And it can be used to treat many illnesses. Um, so me and my family, we approve this. Thank you. Thank you. The next public commenter will be resident ending in the or telephone number ending in 5695, followed by Victoria. Thank you. Good Go afternoon. Ahead. Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Hi, my name is Juan Manuel Rivera. I'm a resident of Roseland. I've owned my home here for 15 years. I am first generation Mexican American. Um, I come from uh, an immigrant family from Michoacan. And uh, I'd like to voice my support to the project um, in Roseland. Um, en primer lugar, mi nombre es Juan Manuel Rivera. Soy uh, residente de, de Roseland. Tengo 15 años aquí viviendo en esta comunidad. Uh, mis padres son inmigrantes de Michoacán. Y quiero, quiero dar mi soporte por el el uh, proyecto que quieren poner aquí en Roseland. Uh, en primer lugar, me gustaría decir que <coughs> creo que aquí la, la gente en la comunidad está un poco confundida pensando que poniendo un negocio de estos de cannabis es algo que está um, que están tratando de ponerlo aquí en nuestra comunidad porque es una comunidad hispana y pobre de bajos ingresos quizás. Pero la verdad es que estas uh, estos tipos de negocios se encuentran en todas las comunidades. Uh, hay casi más de 36 de estos clubes uh, aprobados en Santa Rosa. Esta van a estar en todos, en, en todos lugares en Santa Rosa. Uh, hay muchas estadísticas que han comprobado que estos tipos de negocios son, son muy buenos para la comunidad. Y, y es muy importante que entendamos que estos tipos de negocios um, son muy necesarios porque si no hay estos tipos de negocios, la gente va a conseguir estos productos ilegalmente. Y cuando se consiguen ilegalmente, estos tipos de productos no son regulados uh, por, el, por el Estado. No tienen uh, ningún tipo de, de uh, habilidad del Estado de, de poder uh, enforzar de que el producto esté limpio, de que el producto uh, sea un producto 
saludable y es muy importante para la gente que quiere conseguir estos productos medicinales de que puedan hacerlo en un lugar uh, que, que ellos tengan confianza por el producto. Si no, los productos van a ser uh, conseguidos en la calle. Um, este, esta medicina tiene muchos años de que se ha usado. Es más, yo sé que mi abuelita y mi bisabuelita siempre han usado cannabis medicinalmente. Quizás no lo consumían de una manera u otra, pero sí siempre se ha usado esta medicina. Tiene mucho tiempo usándose esta medicina en, um, en países latinoamericanos. Y es muy importante saber que, que este, este programa o este, este proyecto en, en particular, um, Excuse me, en la ciudad ya ha tenido... Yes? You've had your three minutes. Can you please complete you so your much. comment? Sí, thank you. Thank you. So, eh, eh, para, para concluir, me gustaría que la gente abra su mente un poquito y, 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 y sepan que esto se va a hacer con, con mucho cuidado. Los niños no pueden conseguir estos productos allí. Es muy difícil, no se puede entrar, hay seguridad, se va a checar identificación. Thank you, sir. Uh, That completes your comment. Thank You've you. exceeded your three minutes. Pablo, can you please thank restate you. in Spanish or in English? Thank you. Of course. Uh, so he did state his first comment in English and then restated in Spanish and continued. So firstly, uh, I'd like to say that people here in the community might be a little bit confused in thinking that placing a, a cannabis in our community is because it's maybe poor or, or low income. Um, but there are dispensaries all over the place. There are over 32 dispensaries in, in Santa Rosa alone. And there are plenty of statistics that demonstrate that the type of business like this is good for our community. Uh, that, that can be beneficial um, because if not, people will obtain it illegally. It's, a, it's an item that wouldn't be able to be monitored by the state or not be enforced and make sure that it's a clean product um, or that it's safe uh, for people that consume the product. Um, they need to have the confidence that what they're getting is, is safe and it will serve their medicinal purpose. Uh, this medicine has been used for many, many years um, around the world. Uh, in fact, my grandmother and my great grandmother, I know use marijuana medicinally, uh, maybe not in the way that may some people use it now, uh, but it's definitely used in our cultures in Central America. Uh, so to conclude, I do want to say that we receive this with open minds, and this is a place that will be safe. Kids will not uh, be able to come in on their own. You know, they will be checking IDs. Thank you. Thank you. The next public comment will be from Marcella, followed by Marlene. Marcella, you are using an older version of Zoom. Can you please um, do a Zoom update and then reconnect to the meeting and we'll be sure to call on you. Uh, Pablo, can you restate the instructions on reconnecting once you've done a Zoom update? Of course, entonces Marcela parece que está usando una versión de Zoom más antigua, entonces se le recomienda que actualice la aplicación y luego ingrese nuevamente a la reunión y levante la mano nuevamente para poder dar su comentario. Thank you, Pablo. The next public comment will be from Marlene. Hello. Hi, Marlene, go ahead. Hi, my name is Marlene. Um, I've resided in Sonoma County my entire life for 42 years. And I've worked in the foster care system and um, in the schools and community organizations, nonprofits in our in our uh, county for the last, I don't know, 22 years. And uh, I'm also Latina, Mexican-American, Mexican-born. And I just want to say to the parents that are calling in, I want to address this because Um, I think that there's like a lack of accountability that happens in our community a lot and just a general kind of uh, resistance to educating ourselves rather than passing judgment. I think judgment is a really heavy, um, 
heavy presence in our culture and it definitely has an impact on um, on the youth. And I think that a lot of the community problems that our kids face have to do with the lack of communi communication, machismo, and a lot of other um, uh, direct hits to our youth come from just our family environment. And so when substances are brought into our homes and our kids are not educated because our parents are not educated, it's like a trickle down um, impact that it has overall. And I think that this is a really good opportunity for, for parents and kids alike to gain some education that could help our community. And really education is a key for most things. And I think that's what is missing here is that we just need more education to our families. I think that this project can really bring that to our community where we're lacking. We need more education on cannabis, on drugs, on how to communicate with our kids. I think that that's like really, really the whole problem in our community and something that could definitely benefit our community is just educating ourselves more. And I think that this project really can help with that. So I hope um, that we can find that support from the community that's still disengaged by educating them and bringing more more programs like this that can help with that. That's all. Thank you. Thank you. Marlene, please proceed with your comment. Thank you for doing your Zoom update. Um, was, was that, I think that, oh, that was my sorry. comment. sorry, the name fell off and I clicked on the wrong speaker. My apologies. The next public comment will be from April. April, please unmute your microphone. Okay, hello everyone. Thank you for your patience, I'm sorry. It's kind of hard to do this from my phone. Um, I just wanna kind of, just thank you guys. It's 10, 18 and we've heard from a lot of people. So just thank you for being here and being willing to hear everyone's input. Um, I wanna say, you know, Roseland equity, a good saying is nothing for us without us. And in this case, um, a lot of people have been talking about the property and the city has backed off from purchasing property. But now thankfully with ARPA funds, the city has the opportunity to purchase this property and to use it with the intention that the Roseland community has for it. And since 2016, the city of Santa Rosa has conducted public studies that identify these hardworking people of Roseland's top needs to be a child care center, a multicultural center, or a center that can support parents by providing a safe and empowering environment for them and after school programs for their, their kids and the community as a whole. I just want to address legality. When we speak about legality, we need to ask legal for who. So we know that possession of marijuana is currently a federal offense for undocumented and mixed documented folks. And the community in Rosa, we need to take into consideration what that would mean for the people and the families that live in that area. Many of them, um, who, many people who currently work in the, in the cannabis industry are currently undocumented, are currently being exploited as they are in the wine industry. This is known. Uh, for the youth of Roseland, there is currently, as we know, an oversaturation of, of retail of this product in Sonoma County as it is. Uh, this would only contribute to that oversaturation, which will contribute to the existing health issues that uh, contribute to teenage consumptions on campus. So in 2018 and 19, vape pens were being confiscated, confiscated at, a, at a rate of 800 per month per month from middle schools and high schools in Sonoma County. And this has been reported by the Sonoma County Prevention Partnership, which I highly ask the city council to address and to um, refer to before making their decision. I want to also echo the callers who say that is it is very important to, to no note this. She said the people of Roseland 
barely have funds to to live right now. The cost of living is hefty on them, let alone to afford to even purchase what is at, what this dispensary offers. So we need to understand that this project is not intended to benefit the people of Roseland, but rather the license holders, the investors, the people who are calling in from Mendocino at the moment, people who will be direct directly benefiting from the, these contracts. So. This means that it will turn away our undocumented, it will turn away our youth, it will turn away our children who make up a large purport portion of the Rosen community. And it is these exact people that we work so hard to uplift with so many programs. And it is these people that we need to be listening to if we are talking about making equitable decisions. And my respects to the women trying to make their move in the cannabis industry at the moment, but what I want the callers and everyone to hear, the city council members to hear is what about the hundreds of women of color of Roseland who have been urging city council for years to listen to their voice? What about those women? And that is why we're here. So the essential workers who have been working to survive the stress. Your comment, you've exceeded your three minutes. Thank you. The, 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 the essential workers who have been trying to survive these stressors are of the pandemic are the ones who we need to be listening to at the moment. And just as I know, every Robin is the next public comment. Hi, good evening. Uh, my name is Robin. Um, I'm a mother of three school aged children and I was born and raised here in Santa Rosa. I'm here this evening in support of the Old School Cannabis Project. Uh, I've listened tonight to all of the voices, um, both of concern and of support. And I understand the voices of concern. This is a very innovative project. There's really nothing like it of its kind in our area. Um, but yes, it's unknown. Um, and it's natural for people to fear the unknown, right? Especially when it's in your own backyard. However, um, the upside of this project far outweighs the perceived risks. And some of these risks tonight that I've been listening to, I, I do believe are perceived. Prior speakers have spoken to the lack of education. And I do believe that's driving a lot of the, the perceived risks. If you've ever visited a cannabis dispensary, you'll notice right away the increased levels of security. Uh, it's, it's quite shocking the first time you go, um, at least it was for me. Uh, it's far above any standard business or bar or retail establishment. Um, the, cons the consumers, I, I really wanna mention, visiting old school cannabis will, will uplift all of the surrounding businesses whether it's gas stations, restaurants, retail stores, just simply by driving revenue. It's organic uplift and it'll have a huge, huge upside for Roseland. And as mentioned, old school cannabis will bring jobs. These will bring local jobs and it's a true community investment. You know, there's a lot of energy opposing this project. You know, imagine if that energy was focused on partnering with the city to request what everyone in this meeting already knows, regardless of your view on the appeal. Roseland needs a financial investment from the city above and beyond historical run rates. So why not use this business as a catalyst to drive what the community is asking for, whether it be a new community center, a new library, a safe haven, use it. Ask the city to designate a set amount of tax revenue driven directly by old school cannabis to fund the projects that have been mentioned this evening. The council is all ears and they're listening. Take advantage of the opportunity. Thank you. The next public comment will be from Marcella followed by Moreno. Marcella, please unmute your microphone. Go ahead. Hola, buenas noches. ¿Se me pueden escuchar? Sí. Ok. Mire, estoy yo aquí este, para mostrar. Mi nombre es Marcela y vivo por esta calle donde se quiere abrir el dispensario. 
Y estoy aquí para mostrar mi desacuerdo. Un desacuerdo este, que, que cuenta de más, más vecinos de aquí. Que, que en realidad yo estuve hablando con ellos y así como ha habido ahorita opiniones que, que han dicho que están ahí en grupo, si nosotros nos pudiéramos reunir los de esta calle y poder expresar este, igual, de igual manera, estamos en total desacuerdo. Este dispensario no nos favorecería en nada, así como están diciendo, no favorecería. Este dispensario aquí en Roslan, solamente para, para mí, en mi opinión, es un riesgo. Puede existir un riesgo de explosión. ¿Por qué? Porque um, las maquinarias que se pueden usar ahí es un peligro, es un peligro eminente. Aparte, la sobreconcentración de dispensarios en este vecindario de bajos recursos es evidencia de racismo ambiental, porque esto nos trae, quieran que no, nos trae contaminación, nos contamina y nos trae enfermedades. Yo estoy aquí para pedirles que no, no, se, no voten a favor de que se abra, que escuchen esta es pues esto que estamos nosotros en contra, este vecindario, totalmente en contra. Y eso sería todo. Y pues ojalá y este, así como muchos han dicho, ojalá y se abra. Y yo digo ojalá y no se abra, porque no nos favorece en nada. Hablan de educación, hablan de economía, pero no hablan, no resaltan los riesgos de salud. No están tomando más en cuenta los riesgos de salud para los que vivimos aquí alrededor. Eh, otra cosa más también es, este, el, a mí me han callado diciendo que no diga que el aroma y que el aroma, el aroma es muy desagradable, es muy desagradable y, y hasta duele la cabeza. Quien lo van a estar usando ahí es muy desagradable. Ya no vamos a poder caminar ni por la calle donde nosotros vivimos ni por el lado de las vías donde salimos a caminar todas las tardes. Ya no nos vamos a sentir confortables con ese aroma tan desagradable. Y eso es todo. Muchas gracias. Hello, good evening. Uh, my name is Marcela and I live uh, near the street or I live on the street near where this uh, dispensary is going to be built and I am in disagreement. Um, And that counts for a lot of my neighbors as well that are here. Um, and the same way others have gathered in group to give their comments today. I wish that we could have done that as well, um, but we are in disagreement. Um, this is not something favorable for us. A, a dispensary, in my opinion, is a risk. In my mind, it's, there's a risk of explosion uh, with these chemicals. Um, and you're bringing these this dispensary to an area uh, with low resources and I think a lot of the time has been marginalized and this is an example of environmental racism. So I hope that today you hear us and you don't vote for this to go through, um, especially not in this neighborhood. We do not agree for it. Um, so, so many people here um, as it appears, don't agree, you know, and you speak about the economy, you speak about, um, but you don't, excuse me, you speak about the economy and how it's going to help, but you don't speak about the health concerns um, that this could cause us, you know, and, and people have tried to shut me up about, oh, don't speak about the aroma or the scent, um, but why not? It's something that's irritating to me. It, it honestly gives me a headache. Um, I don't think I will feel safe walking around at night Um, taking my walks and, and smelling that in this environment, I just won't feel safe. And that's all. Thank you. The next public comment will be from Moreno. Moreno, please unmute your mic. Eh, buenas noches. Mi nombre es Patricia Moreno y yo vivo en la ciudad de Santa Rosa. Y hoy estoy aquí para pedir a los miembros del Concilio de la Ciudad que revoquen el permiso que se otorgó para la, por el Comité de Planeación para instalar este proyecto en el número 100 de la Sebastopol Road por dos razones. La primera es que este, el, el proceso de informar a la comunidad sobre este proyecto no fue justo 
ya que no garantizó realmente que la comunidad se diera cuenta de manera clara y oportuna de este proyecto. La justicia lingüística estuvo ausente en todo momento, ya que eh, se utilizaron palabras, inclusive para el negocio, como al, a, por asociación, al momento de que ponen school, yo, por ejemplo, yo, yo pensé que era una escuela, Luego dicen, es un dispensario. No, no es un dispensario, es una factoría, es una fábrica que va a manejar productos volátiles que representan un riesgo al momento de que no se, de que no se cumplan las reglas de seguridad. Y, y, este, y que dicen que no hay casi viviendas alrededor. Pues no, están, hay, es una zona altamente poblada y que en el futuro, en los planes, esto pueden cambiar. Además, por favor, es importante que seamos sinceros en una conversación sincera y no seamos hipócritas. Se ha hablado, solo se ha dicho que la marihuana es de uso medicinal. medicinal. Sí, es verdad, pero también es de uso recreacional. Y combinado con otras sustancias y con el alcohol, es combinaciones explosivas. Así es de que, por favor, no manipulemos la conversación y decir que es de solo de uso medicinal, también es de uso recreacional. Además, este, eh, es importante que, eh, que escuchemos a la comunidad. Eh, no podemos estar llenando nuestros vecindarios y estar con, con el pretexto de que va, va a generar este desarrollo en nuestras comunidades. Escuchemos al área de Rosland, por favor. Esto no es un simple dispensario. El proceso de informar a la comunidad no fue justo, no fue correcto, no fue claro. Así es de que, por favor, eh, estoy en contra de este proyecto. Gracias y que tengan buena noche. Uh, <clears throat> good evening. Uh, my name is Patricia Moreno, and I've lived in, in Santa Rosa. Uh, I live in Santa Rosa, and I'm here that you, I'm here to ask that you hopefully revoke this approval uh, that was done by the Planning Commission at 100 Sebastopol Road. Um, in the manner in which it was presented to the community, it wasn't uh, just or equitable. And linguistically, we were not aware of what was being proposed here. Um, you're speaking about justice and the words that are being used. Uh, for example, for someone who can understand or see a word, they'll see school. And at, initially, I thought, oh, a school. Uh, but upon further inspection, it says a dispensary. But let's be, let's be real. This is a factory. It's not just a dispensary. Um, and let's be sincere and, and not hypocrites about the subject here. And sure, it can be used for medicinal purposes but it's also recreational. And to be real about it, this is an explosive combination if consumed with alcohol and, and who knows what else. So yes, it's medicinal, but also recreational. And let's listen to the community here in Roseland. It's not just a simple dispensary. It's the way in which this was presented was not clear or equitable for the community. Um, and we don't want this here. All right, Council Member Sawyer, I don't see any additional hands being raised in Zoom. And no additional public comments from the Council Chamber. I believe that concludes public comment as we have no written, or I'm sorry, no voice message public comments on this item either. Thank you, Madam Host. I will um, close the public hearing, bring it back to the council. Any, any questions for either the applicant or the appellant uh, or staff at this point now that you've heard public testimony? Um, Ms. Fleming? Yes, thank you, Council Member Sawyer. I've got two questions. Um, the first is a follow-up on um, what uh, this for the city manager uh, might have been before you came on, but uh, or the city attorney, um, what discussions, if any, happened about the city purchasing this parcel? And can you walk us through how the decision was made to to not follow through on that? Nope. 
no takers. Well, why don't um, you see if you can get somebody who was here at that time maybe and I'll go on to the next question. Um, th this question is for the city attorney, which is uh, a number of callers brought up an issue around a violation of the principles around the open government task force. I'm not a subject matter expert in that area. Can you address those concerns for us? Sure, council member. Um, thank you. Uh, I heard the comments uh, on a potential uh, inconsistency with the open government uh, ordinance. Um, a couple of responses. Um, the open government ordinance, uh, the terms of that ordinance in terms of uh, translation services, uh, noticing um, hearing procedures and so forth at this point apply only to the council and not to the planning commission or other subordinate uh, boards or commissions. Um, I'd also note that the ordinance uh, isn't quite yet in effect. It will be in effect on uh, January 1st, um, but we are abiding by it nevertheless and have been for the last um, approximately nine months. Um, uh, but again, at the council level and not, uh, it, it is not applicable at this point uh, uh, to the planning commission. So. And um, to that point about it not being fully implemented, I know that you and your staff have been working really hard to follow the spirit of it prior to its legal implementation date of January 1. If it had been implemented during this process, would anything have been done differently? No, um, again, uh, the, the, all of those procedures at this point, the way that the ordinance is written, it applies to the council uh, hearings. That being said, I also want to emphasize that um, throughout departments throughout the city are making an effort uh, to provide um, translation services uh, when possible, uh, to provide noticing in, in Spanish when, when possible. Um, and again, I, I do understand that the initial noticing that went out uh, to the community was in English only. That's what I'm hearing from, from the community members. Um, I, and perhaps the, um, I don't know if Claire or, or um, uh, Jessica Jones want to address um, the issue, but I do understand that there was then an effort to re-notice, at least in the large notifications, to re-notice in Spanish to be able to reach those communities. Um, again, there, there, uh, I know planning and economic development and other city departments um, have begun to really make an effort uh, to do that, even though they are not required to under the open government ordinance. So. Thank you, that's very clarifying. And one small follow-up to that is um, the appellant's claim that they got short notice was the notice that they got uh, consistent with um, how we normally do things and our open government uh, policies or was there any were there any inconsistencies in that regard um, no and I would um, once I make a couple of comments I would ask um, uh, Kristen Aid is to comment or one of the other planners to comment on what was done to clarify the noticing that was provided to both of the applicants. Um, the, um, there is no formal, at the council level, there is no formal requirement um, for uh, early notification of the applicants. In fact, the departments always make an, an effort to coordinate with the applicants and the appellants, I'm sorry, in this case, uh, to ensure that um, hearing dates are suitable and that they have adequate time to prepare. Um, and I might ask if you're willing to hear from, uh, from the planners uh, exactly what they did in an effort to notify uh, both uh, of the two applicants. Yes, anything that we can do to clarify what happened is, is welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Kristen Toomey, a senior planner. So um, one of the appellants um, uh, 
did not provide an email address. So the only form of communication was either via phone or a, or a PO box. Um, when the council date was um, set up um, back in, I believe mid October or maybe towards the tail end of October, um, uh, the appellants were notified one by email and one by voicemail. Um, as we got closer to the hearing date, I inquired if um, one appellant by email, if they had a presentation they would like to um, upload a PowerPoint presentation um, and a, a voicemail was left for the other appellant wondering if they had a, a, a PowerPoint or um, anything that uh, additional information they'd like to upload for the council. Right, and um, I'm imagining that you have documentation, um, at least email documentation for your emails and some sort of phone recorded documentation so that, um, you know, if given um, a reason to need to check that we could demonstrate that reasonable efforts were made to contact people. Uh, yes, and I just wanna add that I also added uh, both um, appellants and um, the applicant to the noticing that went out. So the dual language postcard that was mailed to everyone within 600 feet, um, they were also um, manually added because um, I don't believe they were in the noticing radius, either one. Okay, I'd also like to give you the opportunity, if you heard anything here today about the, the specific process of noticing, whether it was a language concern or a timing concern, that was inconsistent with your records. Um, is there anything that you would like to clarify? Yes, so the, so, uh, the, fir the first main issue occurred uh, for during planning commission. Uh, notice was sent out um, only in English and on-site signage was only in English. And the day before the first planning commission meeting, um, there was a request for translation service. And, um, uh, following that, uh, staff recommended a continuance. Uh, we posted the slides for the continuance in both English and Spanish. And we had a staff member who was fluent in Spanish let everyone know that the item will be continued to allow for professional translation service. And uh, for the um, subsequent continued planning commission hearing, um, we had uh, professional translators um, at the meeting and um, I, to the best of my ability, translated the slides in both English and Spanish. Um, for tonight's meeting, um, the notice went out both in English and Spanish. On one postcard, I was able to fit the information on, um, in both languages and the applicant posted um, on-site sign in that included English and Spanish as well. Thank you for your clarifications. I don't have any further questions at this time. If, if I may, uh, council member add just a couple of things and it looks like the city manager would also like to add. Um, the agendas are also published, um, both the preliminary agenda and the final agenda are published in both English and Spanish and posted. Um, I also had, uh, just had a, um, a message from Magali Teis um, from community engagement. Um, indicating that they are working, uh, they have received funds for translation and uh, they are looking uh, at developing a policy to equitably distribute that um, money and that it may potentially include the boards and commissions for, um, uh, uh, for translation and she indicates that she is available if you have questions. Thank you for that information, city attorney, city manager. Council Member Fleming and members of the City Council, Jason Nutt, our Assistant City Manager, uh, is available to be promoted. I believe he was here during the initial discussions of the former Roseland University Prep uh, campus as a surplus property and may be able to uh, provide some background uh, about what occurred at that time. Thank you. Yeah, good evening, council members. Uh, council member Fleming, um, uh, I was involved in that process as the property came onto uh, the market as a lease uh, opportunity. Um, I worked directly with uh, Jill Scott, our real property 
our real property manager, as well as Dave Gwine, uh, our housing and community service director uh, at the time, uh, to evaluate whether or not that particular property might provide some level of benefit toward uh, part of our homeless uh, approach. Um, recognizing that at that particular point in time, council ex was expressing interest in supporting the location of a permanent Roseland library. Um, we did begin to reach out to the Roseland library or to the library district uh, and discussed with them the possible opportunity at that particular site. Um, council had not designated any funds uh, at that point in time. And we were contemplating creating uh, an, an opportunity where it would be used uh, while the library was currently in temporary locations as a temporary uh, housing or a homeless services site, um, something akin to a safe parking location. Um, unfortunately, we were not able to identify a particular funding source for that opportunity as well. Uh, and the property uh, needed to move on uh, and continue their, uh, their interest in looking for a tenant for that site. Um, we made a decision working with the former city manager to decline uh, further opportunity at that property um, while we continued to understand what we needed to do further with our homeless services program as well as uh, whether council was going to show a financial investment opportunity uh, with the library. By the time uh, council had indicated their interest in pursuing a uh, financial opportunity, uh, the property was under contract uh, and was no longer available for us to uh, discuss a potential lease uh, with the property owner. Um, we did uh, look at or did have a number of conversations with that property owner. They were very interested in working with the city uh, at that time. Um, but once they had uh, another lease um, in the works, uh, there was, we were, we were no longer able to um, work into that process. And we began working with the library on alternative sites. Uh, and again, I'm happy to go into more detail if there's additional information that you would uh, like me to. The only question uh, I want to know is what was the timeline of when the property came uh, to, into your awareness and when that decision was made to not pursue this property? Uh, we looked into this for between six and nine months. Um, we conducted two site tours, one with uh, Housing Community Services uh, team uh, and one with the library district. Um, the property itself uh, would have sufficed for a temporary library operation and for short term, uh, but the long term library approach, uh, we were ultimately going to find a way of um, demoing and rebuilding on that property. Uh, so the timeline was about six to nine months uh, before we made the decision to no longer pursue that that opportunity. My, my question is actually when specifically not how long. You're asking dates. I don't need an exact date, but like spring of 2018 or fall of 2019. That's kind of what I was getting. Yeah, I want to say I want to say we were um, 2019 uh, when we when we decided to no longer pursue that opportunity. Okay. Thank you for the information. Yep. You're welcome. Thank you, Councilmember Fleming. Councilmember Tibbetts. Would you like a motion? There are no, no more questions. questions. Councilmember Rogers. Um, this question is for the city manager. Um, at this time, does the city have any intention of using the proposed site? And if, well, yeah. I, I'm sorry, I couldn't hear the question. Well, at this time, does the city have any intentions of using the proposed site? <laughs> Our understanding is that the site is under a contract for lease and not being offered uh, for alternative uses. Okay. Um, and then I was going to ask the planner when she was on, and I'm not sure if she's still, if she's still on, um, but what is the process to determine if an item needs to be noticed in uh, languages other than English? I know we don't have to, but if uh, um, if we know that 
the surrounding language is 60, I think I saw a percentage of 66, 66.7%, whether we have to do something or not, to me that's an ultimate fail. And that's not communicating with the community that you're wanting to notice um, if you don't notice in the language in which the people speak so that you're attempting our, to communicate with. Under our current policy, as the city attorney explained, um, our noticing requirements for languages other than English um, only apply to city council. Um, in cases where we receive requests, as was demonstrated in this case for Spanish translation, we try to accommodate that. Um, this is also a, a long-term resource issue for the city to consider as we move forward and begin to more fully implement our open government policy. Um, it increases the cost of publishing our notices, publishing our agendas, uh, and staffing our public meeting process, as you can see tonight. And um, those are all new expenses that we have to address in the budget process. Um, understood. I, I don't know how we would meet that criteria or make the criteria of understanding what is different, what what item would be different from another item or who would be interested in an item and who wouldn't be interested in an item or what items would be uh, more controversial than another. Um, but I, I do think that if we're asking for input um, and we're saying that we want diversity, equity, and inclusion, um, you can't want those things and not speak or provide notice in a language that people um, speak or read. Um, that's not providing DEI. So, um, but that's something that we need to figure out um, internally. I, I think we've allocated some one-time funds for additional translation services, about $500,000 worth. Uh, that will allow us to begin to test the implementation of broader translation in multiple language capabilities. Um, and the timing of producing agendas in multiple languages at various levels of boards and commissions within the city. And that'll provide us with some valuable experience and data to evaluate how broadly we want to apply the, the translation services and multiple languages. Um, and I if I may, I do have a um, additional clarification um, from uh, from PED, and that is that um, translation has been done. <clears throat> excuse me, uh, for the for the long range pro projects, for example, for in the general plan update, um, meetings have been held in Spanish, materials have been translated into Spanish, but in specific project. Uh, review matters that are before the the various boards or commissions um, it has been on a re on a request basis so that if someone requests translation then then it will be provided um, um, but again as the city manager indicated now that there have been some funds allocated we'll be looking at those policies and as planning staff also indicated we'll be looking at that policy again And, and I'll note that, um, as you heard earlier, it was, you know, once the request was made in this project, uh, the, the meeting was continued and translation was provided. And once that was understood, the subsequent notices and the notice for this meeting tonight were translated into Spanish as well. Yeah, it, that leads to my next question, um, is how much time do we like to provide um, the community so that we can educate. So I, I've, I've heard the word education and to educate being thrown out a lot, right? And that um, maybe people have a, they feel a certain way because they're not being educated on the type of business 
um, it is and how it can benefit the business and or maybe not benefit the business, I mean the community, right? So um, how much time do we, and this probably the, the planners know, how much time do they send out the notices versus when do they have the actual, when does it go to the um, planning commission? What is the time frame, or is there an exact time frame that they have to send out the notices? Uh, and what's yes, that time frame given with the two-week extension? Um, there are um, uh, statutory uh, notice requirements, um, and I believe that uh, for this type of a hearing, it's a 10-day uh, notice that needs to be sent out. Um, but they are defined by, uh, by statute and by our code as well. So it was provided with the two weeks? Yes. Okay. Um, and in addition, I wanted to ask the chief, um, because I also heard during public comment about calls, uh, not necessarily calls for service, but that with the building being vacant, and I haven't heard um, that the city is planning on using the building, and that is a concern, is that if this project does not go through, that the building is going to stay vacant. Um, and so have there been additional calls for service to the site or nearby um, that we can assume is because the building is vacant or no? Uh, we haven't received any uh, extraordinary calls for service in the area. Um, you know, we. Uh, vacant buildings are always a concern, but we're not, uh, we have not received any calls uh, for service there. Um, and I did check with my uh, lieutenant for the area and they hadn't heard anything either. Okay, thank you, Chief. And then to the appellant, either one or two, do they have an alternate, um, alternate use for the site and funding for the site so that the building does not stay vacant if this project does not go through? Right, it's, I can ask questions to the appellant. You can ask a question of the appellant. Of the whichever appellant answers must re, must restrict their answer to the question. Okay, so that is my question. Um, do you have alternative um, uses for the site and funding already secured so that the building does not stay vacant, or is it just please don't? Um, approve this project, but we don't have a use for this tomorrow if you don't um, approve this project. Um, yes, this is <clears throat> this is Yvette, and at the moment we have uh, $11 million secured. Uh, we would have to have a further discussion into that, but we have $11 million secured in that capacity. And as far as um, the property, it was looked at in July of 2020. And so some of the information that has been stated is um, incorrect. We we don't have the people here tonight to speak on behalf of that. And so, but that property was looked at in July of 2020. Thank you, Ms. Minor. Thank you. And then just one more note, um, as far as the notification for me to present tonight, I, I do have my emails in in regards to when um, I was notified. Thank you. Mr. Tibbetts, could we get a motion on the floor? Yes, thank you. And then I have a point of clarification re relating to the re most recent question. Okay, for discussion purposes, I move a resolution of the Council of the City of Santa Rosa denying two separate appeals and upholding the decision of the Planning Commission approving a conditional use permit for old school cannabis to allow 2,350 square feet of retail dispensary with delivery and on-site consumption, 17,120 square feet for commercial cultivation, 5,001 square feet or greater, 870 square feet for distribution, 500 square feet of manufacturing, level two, volatile within an extension building, located at 100 Sebastopol Road, assessor's parcel number 125-181, dash 023, file number CUP21-027, and wait for the reading of the text. Second. And, and if I may ask the question, uh, 
Sue, this is a point of order question. So we have um, an applicant and an appellant, an applicant who is in lease contract on this property. It, tonight, when we make a decision, are we allowed to fact take into consideration and factor a potential future use that the city could be engaged in? Or are we to limit our deliberations to um, the question before us and the uses and the ordinances pertaining to this property? Uh, thank you for the question, Council Member. Um, you are what's before you today is the applicant is the application um, from the old school uh, cannabis and the two appeals. So what is before you is to address the issues raised uh, in that application and in those appeals. You can you are not limited to the grounds of the appeal. You can discuss the application as a whole. But um, the, the matter is not noticed for discussion of alternative uses uh, of the property, whether by the city or by another private party. So, so if, for example, we were to discuss a rationale to vote no on this project being that we would like to see a future use be a library community center or some other thing, would we be opening up the city to potential litigation? Um, Right, you, you, in evaluating this application, you'd be evaluating it on its own merits and under the findings that are set forth uh, in the, the required findings that are set forth in the staff report. Um, it is uh, not a, a valid basis for denying a project that the council might prefer a different project. Um, different projects are not before you this evening. So, Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Council Member Sawyer. Thank you, Council Member Tibbetts. And for the Council's information and for the community, um, for further clarification, whichever direction this vote goes will require four votes, just to be clear. Um, we have a motion and a second. Any other discussion, Council? I'll, I'll raise my concern with the project, um, just to comment on it. I'm going to be voting no on this project tonight. Um, and the reason, as I stated, is not having to do with a library or community or future use. Um, I was always taught that you have to, as our city attorney said, evaluate the merits of the, the proposal in front of us. I'm voting no on the grounds that um, I think a, a year or two ago, uh, I either denied a cannabis project or sought its pretty radical amendment because I did not believe we should be allowing on-site consumption without a mechanism to enforce what is safe use and to be able to operate a vehicle safely. Um, so I'm going to be voting no on those grounds this evening. Um, I, it just doesn't make sense to me to allow that sort of thing if we don't have a way to determine what is safe and what is not. Council Member Rogers. Um, I'd just like to say for a point of clarification, I asked the question because I didn't want it to be assumed that if the project did not go forward, that the city had the intention of using the, the site and or the property because that is what I heard. Um, and so that is why I asked the question, not for us to make the decision that we were gonna use it, but just to say that that wasn't on that was not on the table that is not what we were talking about we were actually talking about the the proposal at hand not that we were going to use the site that is why i asked the question uh council member tibbetts and and i if i may uh, uh acting mayor um i i do appreciate that clarification and yes i understood um when you were asking those questions and when um, assistant city manager was responding that yes, that's part of your conversation in terms of the background. Um, but again, um, so that was a very legitimate question, but I also appreciated council member Tibbetts question in terms of the scope of actually your decision. And then I just wanted to clarify, um, this is a vote on the appeal. And so, um, 
we'll, we'll be careful when we actually cast the actual votes. An I vote would be to uphold the appeal, which would deny the, which would reverse the Planning Commission's decision. Um, so, thank you. Council members, right home. Could you just clarify? I want to make sure I heard that correctly because I heard the motion was to deny the appeal. So an I vote would be I'm sorry. yes. Yes, you are correct. And thank you for correcting me. Uh, it's been a long day. So yes. Okay. The motion is to deny the appeal. So the uh, a yes vote would deny the appeal and uphold the Planning Commission decision. Okay. Thank you for that clarification. Yes, yes it's been four hours. So. You know, I, I just want to make some general comments because it has been four hours of comment. We've been getting a lot of information. And one thing, because um, I, I heard a lot of the speakers say that, saying their voices are not being taken into consideration, you're not hearing me. And just from my perspective, I'm listening to all the information that's been shared here. I've heard this on other times. Um, and unfortunately, someone's going to think you're not hearing me because I didn't agree with you or I didn't vote the way you wanted me to vote. But I'm just 100% committed to listening to everyone, and that's what I've done since day one uh, on this dais. So I just want to get that out. And so for me, this kind of voyage or journey with the legalization of marijuana um, has helped me make the decisions that I'll be making today. And so I'll just go back to Prop 64 in 2016. Um, I wasn't supportive of it. But you know, the state of California, 57% of the voters said yes. And in Sonoma County, 59% of the voters said yes. And so when we talk about the numbers, so if you took, and I have no idea what 41% of the voters in 2016 give me the numbers, it's thousands of people. So I could have had a petition with thousands of signatures saying you're not listening to me. But the other side could have had 59%. Those are the folks that voted for it. So again, for me, I've been listening. Okay, why are the people, majority of people in Sonoma County and in Santa Rosa supportive of it? Um, same thing with some of the safety concerns that I've heard. We've heard this, so I've been on council um, when cannabis was not legal for the recreational pre-64 and post. I wasn't on the cannabis um, ad hoc, but I listened to what they had to say and the decisions that some of the members still on this body were part about how we crafted this, what I consider to be a model um, program here in Santa Rosa. And it's been modified because we've been listening, we've been having dialogue. And I think a lot of members in the community have pointed to Santa Rosa, they're actually getting it right because it, it's tough. It's not a black and white issue. Specifically with the safety coming from a law enforcement background, a lot of people had used examples and we heard that on some of the appeals of other dispensaries um, that it brings crime. That hasn't been our experience. And I was thankful for staff where they brought the actual districts. You know, my district, District 6, Northwest Santa Rosa, we've got 14 either approved or already operating. I've got three or four walking distance and I'm in a residential area. We have not seen an increase in crime. It hasn't had the impact I've heard other people predict. And on the closed loop system, I remember when we had, I think the first one was the one on Yolanda, there's that same concern. This does not belong in the neighborhood, but there's been no evidence that that's a danger to the neighborhood for folks either working there or in the neighborhood. And I remember one person said when I engaged in the conversation, I'm listening to what they had to say, well, just because one of those mechanisms hasn't exploded doesn't mean it never will. Wow, you got me there, you're absolutely right. It's just the information that I've been listening to doesn't support that, that's a danger to the community or the neighborhood, especially given our fire safety officials are signing off on it. Also some of the disproportionate, you know, this council has worked, I think our tails off supporting the entire community, especially Roseland, I mean, I don't know what speaks louder than the $10 million investment from pg and &E funds to the library. I guess we could have invested that rather than give them to the library, bought this property, but we chose not to. We chose to partner with someone. And I know some of us um, on the council and staff, we are working on a community center. If you heard last week's meeting, we're working on that. We're not throwing a deaf ear. And we don't own this property. That's the bottom line. As Mr. Cullen mentioned, they're, con they're in conversations now with this contract with what's, uh, with what's before us. So process-wise, I start looking through, okay, here's this whole process. It went through the planning commission and it was unanimously supported, right? And again, I, I know not everyone's gonna like it, but doing the process, I think this project, they've done everything that the city has asked for and followed the process that we asked for. And specifically, one thing in reading all the documents that were provided, they talked about the uh, ban the box which is something that helps disadvantaged communities from the violence prevention perspective. In other words, some people may not know what that is, 
But if you check the box, have you ever been convicted of a crime? A lot of times you don't get an interview. So a lot of us in the violence prevention efforts were saying, yeah, ban the box. They talked about it. That's the first time I've heard anyone say, yes, we support the letter in the spirit of the law. So for all those reasons, I'm supportive of this motion and I'll be supporting the motion as it is on the floor. Thanks. Thank you, Council Member. Council Member Fleming. Yeah, thank you for the opportunity to comment on this. This is a really difficult topic because um, it's very clear that some people don't want it and some people do want it. And there's no way to make everybody happy. This is one where we know we're going to walk away having made one group of people really, really unhappy. And I think Council Member Schwedhelm got it right when he said that, you know, we listen to everybody and we hear you and we hear your concerns. Most of the concerns I heard around were around safety. And what I've seen and experienced in my time on council is that there's a correlation of safety and, and legal cannabis dispensaries, because what it does is it removes illegal activity, promotes legal consumption, and um, also the, the presence of cameras and security guards also uh, creates safety. Uh, there's also an increased risk of illegal activity associated with un unoccupied buildings and blight associated with it. So an and economic disinvestment in areas leads to economic or leads to crime. So there's a lot of reason to believe that this project will, will be a benefit. Now, do I think that this is the highest and best use of this property? I, I do not. I think that it was a mistake that we did not acquire this property and we should have and I would have supported that. However, uh, we owe it to our residents and our prospective business owners to lay out a clear and understandable plan of how we do business. And to tell people that if you do this and this and this and this and this, um, and then some, because people don't like it, we're not gonna follow through on it. I, I don't think that that's fair. And to the people out there who will think that this is um, unjust or racial discrimination, I'd like to refer you to all of the votes that I've taken to put cannabis dispensaries and other associated facilities all over the city in predominantly white neighborhoods and told people that, that I don't really much appreciate their um, uninformed views on, on legal cannabis use. And so today I will be staying consistent, if unpopular, in supporting the applicant and denying the appeals. Thank you, Council Member. Councilmember Rogers. Um, I just want to say this has been definitely a very hard, um, hard decision, uh, especially since the, the council member that represents the district is not here. So I can't really look to see how he would represent uh, the district or what he would say um, for his district. But um, I, I, I think that there are a lot of ways um, in times where we can say that uh, votes are being cast or things are being said and it is because um, there is a, a disparity or because it is of color. I think that in this case, um, there, there are certain things that businesses have to do in, in order to get a permit and or a license. And um, if they do those, then they get that permit and or the license, whether they are in Fountain Grove, Bennett Valley, or, or in Roseland. Um, and I think as far as this council is concerned, and I, can, and I can say this wholeheartedly, I think that we fight um, for Roseland and I think we fight hard. And I think that whatever we bring forth, I think this council has not has not doubted or said anything um, about giving to Roseland. And I'm, I'm sorry, Sue, if I'm going like on my, but I think that we do give. And I think that we know that Roseland deserves. And I think as far as the community center, as far as the library, as far as it, we know, we hear, we're coming. It's gonna take a minute, we're working on it. It's not gonna happen tomorrow, but we are working on it. And we hear you, we hear you loud and clear. Your voices are heard, they are not unheard. But with this, um, for me, I will be um, 
agreeing with the project. And that is because I also know in order to support the, the things that I want to do in the community, the things that this council wants to do in the community, we have to have business. It's a full circle. We need businesses because we need the money to support the programs that we want in the community. So it's all connected. Um, so I will be supporting, um, I will be supporting giving uh, the permit to, to the business and it is not for a lack of supporting, um, supporting the community of Roseland. Um, it is because I, I think that we do need to educate more. There's a lot of people uh, of color that have gone to, to prison for distribution of cannabis. There are now schools where you can learn how to cultivate, you can learn how to sell. It is a very profitable industry. And I'm hoping that more people embrace and learn how to get involved and learn about it and take advantage of it um, in a different way and not be scared of it. Um, so these are just hopes that I have. Even the JC, I believe, is looking at having uh, where they bring it into the school where people can learn how to get involved in the industry. So, you know, I'm just hoping that people start to educate themselves a little bit, a little bit more. And also, I think that the, the chief is on, on the line and, and we know that there are concerns. And so we will be very mindful of those concerns moving forward. So. Your voices are heard. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Well, I'll be voting to deny the appeal this evening. The Planning Commission uh, respected the ordinance that was developed by the city, a model ordinance that is not perfect, but is, is duplicated and used in, in many areas throughout this state because it is so comprehensive. And the, the way in which we developed that ordinance was through major amounts of public communicate public engagement so the applicants have um, they've complied with our ordinance and having done that deserve the right to receive my vote to um, move forward with their project and that's why i'll be denying the appeal and madam clerk would you take the roll please point of order one more time if i may Certainly. acting mayor can you remind us what yes means and what no means in this situation? The, the, oh, did you want to, Madam City Attorney? Yes, and thank you again, Council Member Schredhelm, for uh, catching me on that. Um, the motion is to deny the appeal, which will um, affirm the decision of the Planning Commission and grant the use permits. So a yes vote. Uh, will approve the project, a no vote will deny the project. Thank you. Okay, are we ready? We are. Council Member Tibbetts? Nay. Council Member Schwedhelm? Aye. Council Member Sawyer? Aye. Council Member Fleming? Aye. Council Member Rogers? Aye. That motion passes with four ayes, with Council Member Tibbetts voting no. Council Member Alvarez and Mayor Rogers abstaining from the vote. Thank you, Madam City Clerk. We'll take a 10 minute recess.
here, guys. Call the roll. Yes. Council Member Tibbetts? Here. Council Member Schwedhelm? Here. Council Member Sawyer? Council Member Fleming? Here. Council Member Alvarez? Present. Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry, Vice Mayor Alvarez. Still present. <laughs> <laughs> um, Council Member Rogers? Present. Mayor Rogers? Here. Council Member Sawyer, have you joined us? Yes. Thank you. Let the record show that all council members are present. Thank you, Council. Uh, I'll let you know that the Vice Mayor and I are fully refreshed and ready to proceed with item 14.2, Mr. City Manager. <laughs> Mayor Rogers and members of the City Council, item 14.2 is a report item. The matter before the Council is approval of a shared scooter system pilot program. And Nancy Adams has been waiting eagerly to present this item to the council this evening. And Nancy is our transportation planner in our transportation and public works department. Thank you, Jeff. Um, and I am um, just happy to be here, um, mayor and council members. And I, I tell you, my scooter's outside my office, so I'm gonna scoot through this presentation because I know it's been a long evening tonight. <laughs> so um, next slide, please. So just, just really quickly, I'm going to run through these slides because I know the council's had a, a really long evening. So on this one, I just want to kind of pull out the fact that the council back in November a year ago um, gave direction to develop a, a one-year pilot program. Next slide. And so I can, I want to say, uh, pre appreciate the council last year des deciding to, um, you know, create a new position with the active transportation planner. Join, he's joined my team and he's really made us get through this last year. Um, as you can see, we've been very busy, um, throughout the year working with our, um, city departments, 
um, working and talking with some of the California cities who have scooters in operations. Um, so the the year of 2021 has been very busy for us just trying to to call out um, the information to put together the, the draft uh, permit conditions that are before you tonight. Next slide, please. So just really highlight, um, we're anticipating one operator and the fleet size within the permit conditions would be around 100. Um, and our service areas would be the downtown, Railroad Square, the Roseland area, and the junior college area. Next slide. Now these are, I'm not gonna go through all the information that you think what I'd like to do is just highlight that the, uh, the permit conditions will address uh, parking requirements um, and where, where um, the, the uh, devices can be parked. Essentially, they're um, going to be um, responsible to be parked on either a bike rack or a fixed object such as a street sign. And uh, all in the, the thoughts of keeping our clear path of travels on the sidewalks and the curb ranks. Uh, next slide, please. And then in terms of operation, so we really want to make sure that the devices, um, they provide safe riding experience. And that means following the California Vehicle Code where they are not allowed on the sidewalks and um, they're not allowed on streets with uh, uh, a, a 25 mile uh, per hour speed limit unless they're using a bike lane. So these are all consistent with our um, California Vehicle Code. Next slide, please. And then, um, of course, we want to make sure that who's, who's, um, the operator will be responsible for educating the users and making sure that, um, all the, uh, the, um, community members are aware of this program. So we want to make sure that as part of their permit conditions that they have a, a pretty solid, um, engagement uh, process, um, for, uh, deployment of the devices. And then lastly, Next slide, please. I wanted to talk about um, just the accessibility of these devices and making sure that um, all members of our community have um, access to to use these devices. And I, I would I was I, I would note that we actually had a demonstration last Monday, and one of the questions that I think um, was asked of the person, uh, the vendor who did the demonstration was, uh, for example, how much of a of a ride would it be in Santa Rosa and what's the length of the, the trip? And and so it was about a mile and a half um, as a typical ride. And then uh, the, the price of that would be about $6. And if, um, you know, it would be subsidized uh, at a 50% reduction. So it'd be about $3. So um, next slide, please. And lastly, we want to make sure that, um, you know, we, we're able to access all the um, data that will be um, gathered as part of this pilot program. Uh, I think one of the main questions that we have is what's our market and will these be successful in Santa Rosa? So we will be requiring the, uh, the operator to provide us with um, you know, the, the data that they've um, gathered and of course, following all the privacy rules. And lastly, next slide. So, um, Oops, next slide, please. Yeah, there we go. So um, this is, I've, I've had a road show. Um, you'll see on the slide, I've gone to uh, the Downtown Action Organization, Railroad Square, and our Bike and Pedestrian Advisory Board. The Downtown Subcommittee this month was um, actually canceled, so I wasn't able to to share the information with, with the subcommittee um, before the council meeting. So generally, all the, all the groups are supportive of um, deploying these devices. They they did talk a uh, you know about um, uh, the the use of the the devices on the sidewalk and so um, you know we heard that and parking parking the devices um, and keeping the clutter. So I think you know we we structured the the permit conditions to address uh, many of the the uh, thoughts and feedbacks that we heard from the the different community groups. So next slide, please, which I think is the recommendation. So uh, it says a lot, but essentially we're asking the council to um, approve the, the, sh the scooter share pilot program and authorize the assistant city manager or our director of transportation and public works to 
um, either modify conditions, issue or um, uh, revoke the permits and um, or suspend uh, the operations of the scooter share system. So um, I went through this very quickly, um, but I am happy to answer questions if there are any from the council members. Thank you so much, Nancy. Let's go ahead and ask council members any questions. Council member Rogers. Do we get to ride all of us together? Sure. Well, I, I think you can. And once they, if the council decides tonight to, to launch this program, uh, they'll be out there in the street. So let's, let's do it. But like how many, how many bikes will be in one, one area, Nancy? So, so the way this works is, is we're, we're asking the operator to, um, they have to lock a, a device. So if they, if you say you wanted to go, um, take a scooter out somewhere, you, you know, you'd find a scooter either hooked up to a bike rack and you have to, it's all based on an, uh, an application on your smartphone, right? So you, you'd go get your, um, you know, take your phone and check out the, the scooter. And you know you you'd get you get charged on your um, account, or, and then you'd be able to unlock that scooter and and go wherever you want to, and then lock it somewhere, right? Wherever you're, I don't know. Say you wanted to go to the mall, I don't know. So and then you just leave it there, and and the way it works is you're 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 charged on the amount of time you have the scooter. So um, you know you, you may not have the scooter when you come back out of the mall, but there likely you would. Um, so uh, hopefully that answers your question. And how does someone, uh, is there like a, a pass or something where they qualify for the discounted rate? Yes, they have um, anything that, um, it's like the SNAP. So if you, that's one program that the, the vendors have mentioned to us. Um, and a lot of, a lot of the, the assistance programs where, um, you know, the, 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 mar, the low income folks have access to those programs, they also would have, um, that would be their eligibility for, um, getting the 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 discounted uh, uh, rate. So they would do that on their smart. I'm asking, like, how would they do it? They would do that on their smartphone. They would. And actually, the, this was something that the our bike and ped board brought up um, about some some folks don't have a smartphone or they don't have credit cards. So we're asking the vendor to provide as much as possible opportunities for folks that don't have a smartphone or credit card to actually use the devices. So that will be something that we'll ask the vendor to, you know, to, to share with us what mechanisms they can use to help reach the broader um, community for Santa Rosa. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Council Member Sawyer. Thank you, Mayor. And thank you, Nancy. I'm I'm supportive of the project of the of the pilot, but I do have a couple of concerns. Um, is is a week really long enough for the pilot operator to um, be here and then cut us loose? So that's a great question. I think what we're going to have, I I think we're going to see what see how that looks, um, Council Member. And if we need we need them to be here more, I think we can certainly ask them to to, to be here more. Okay. Yes. There's just in, in looking at the presentation and looking at the, uh, the other documents, there, there are a lot of responsibilities that they're taking on as far as reporting, and I mean, it, that's just one, one piece of it. I mean, there are, um, I'm, I'm concerned about hidden costs, you know, what, what, who's going to take care of these scooters when they get thrown in the creek? Um, are there, the, the, uh, is, is the um, time that our staff is going to take in dealing with this, this pilot program are, have they budgeted that into their into their their time uh, constraints? Um, it just I mean I I I don't want to be the, a wet blanket, but it just sounds like there's a there are a lot of details, and I can't imagine that they're going to be able to be comfortable dropping us off in a week. I, I just I don't I don't see that as being realistic. Um, and so it's, I'm, I'm sure a conversation will be had with the with the pilot operator, um, but there are a lot of um, unknowns in, in looking at this, and that's why it's a pilot, and I understand that. Um, I'm, I'm skeptical, but I'm willing to give it a shot because it sounds like a, a, a good direction to move, but um, that's what pilots are all about, right, is to find right. out where the gaps are and then fill them. So um, I'm ready to go with it, but I, I do have my concerns. So I'll, I'll really quickly respond. So we, at, during the pilot, we're not um, actually doing a full cost recovery. 
Um, and, and we would think that if the council wants to make this as a permanent program, that we would definitely integrate that into the permit process um, and, and really get a full cost recovery. But what we are doing for the pilot is, and I work with Gabe Osborne to, um, as part of the encroachment permit, we can, we're going to have them uh, make a, a, a cash deposit, which we can draw down on as necessary um, during the pilot. So we will have a little bit of a resource to, to cover some of the city staff time, but not a full cost recovery. So hopefully that helps answer your question. Good, thank you. And Council Member Sawyer, if I could just add it, just, just as Nancy mentioned in one of the earlier slides, staff has spent a substantial amount of time reviewing other cities and their programs. And so we're, we're, we are in a good position to have learned from their mistakes. And I believe the program, the way uh, Ms. Adams has put forward, um, we're, we've tried to incorporate some of the challenges other cities have seen early on in their process. So we hope that we won't have some of those same difficulties that they did. Thanks, Mr. Nutt. I appreciate that. That's Mr. Schwedel. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, Nancy, uh, first of all, I want to thank you for um, offering that to uh, Council for that presentation. Uh, I think that was last week. Um, and during that presentation and demonstration, they talked about there'll be the actual um, operators will contract with some local folks who will actually be monitoring all of the scooters. So there will be someone in the city to recharge the batteries and whatnot. Am I correct in that assumption? Did yes. I hear that right? Yes, that, that's correct. And they want to, and you know, again, to, to Jason's point, um, you know, the cities that we've worked with um, and talked with about their experiences, they they have been with working with the scooters for a few years. So lessons learned and. You know, I think the vendor that came here, um, it wasn't that they originally were working with local um, uh, folks, and now they are. And I think that really helps to, to solidify their commitment to the community as they deploy these devices. So, yes, you're correct. Okay. And also just for my colleagues, he also, uh, I think I asked or someone asked the question, if you did it citywide, how many would a city our size, how many scooters would be needed? And uh, he said the word 800, which really surprised us. And then Nancy corrected, but this pilot program is only 50 to 100. So, but again, if it's successful and the technology is fascinating, what they can do now with it, it's, it, I was really impressed. But the two questions I asked then, I, I, I want to ask again. Um, it sounds like we're doing a permit process for this versus a franchise agreement. Can you explain why we're going that route versus a franchise for this type of opportunity? Right. And so um, I think just as a pilot, we're, 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 we want to see what the market is. And, um, you know, working with, with uh, our planning and economic development department, Gabe, Gabe um, was really helpful in trying to sort out what's the best mechanism. And, you know, the, the permit process and the encroachment um, process seemed to work the best for the pilot. And we can certainly reevaluate that um, as, as, as a, if a pilot uh, pro program translates into a, a permanent program in the future. But I, I think to start through through the pilot as, as, a, as a, an encroachment and a permit condition is, is probably a better approach. Okay. And then even for this pilot program, what are we doing to mitigate the calls for service to police or code enforcement? So that, that question came up. I, and then some of the officers were there at the demonstration and... And, you know, we I think we'll have a commitment from the from the um, the vendor to to um, to to be responsive. We, we've got conditions in the permit that they have certain number, I think, a couple of hours to to respond to to any um, issues um, The each device will have a, a an identifier and a contact information number so that um, if you see a scooter, that's, you know, misparked or, or, you know, not uh, blocking the, the sidewalk or whatever, you can contact the vendor directly. And if we don't hear, you know, if we don't get a response from the, um, the vendor, you know, we, we can make sure that we follow up with them to ensure that that doesn't happen again. So we've got some things in place that I think will be, will be good. And I think the other part of our approach is that these devices will be locked to um, you know, either bike racks or um, street signs. And that really helps um, mitigate the clutter. Um, Oakland had a, a, didn't have a lock two system and they experienced a lot of clutter, but they converted to a lock two system and really reduced the number of, of devices that were not, were freestanding. So I think how we're asking them to 
deploy um, their parking um, structure with the devices and then just being responsive back to um, issues with within, um, you know, mispark devices. Great. So, so I would just ask that um, not only city departments, and I'm thinking mainly uh, code enforcement police, but also the business community, that they're involved in the, um, the implementation of this. So if I could just see some businesses, I, I've got three of these scooters parked in front of me, they've been here, and if they're being unresponsive, that there are some consequences for this and that everyone understands uh, roles and responsibilities. But I'm, I am supportive of this, and I, I'd really like to make this a win-win for everyone. Thanks. Vice Mayor. Thank you, Mayor. In regards to, to revenue generation, what opportunities are, are there for our local business owners in regards to either housing parking stations for the scooters? Is that a possibility? So um, that's an interesting question. We haven't, I haven't really thought about that, but I, I, I've heard about just parking, um, you know, bike racks in the downtown and Rainbow Square. And, and the, the planner who, um, you know, is, is, is helping me on this, he actually went out the last couple of days and was looking at the, the supply and inventory of parking for bikes. And, and so I think to your question, um, you know, if, if there's an opportunity for a business in the downtown that wants to, you know, we want to see what that would look like if, if um, you know, I know um, having having scooters maybe, you know, access their business is, is a good thing for them. So I think I think those are questions that we need to, you know, once we get the vendor online and, and really see the, the the feedback that we get from business communities. Um, I think that would be a great question to maybe check in with them on as, as needed. Yep. Well, I think it, it might really help with with the cluttering. Uh, mm -hmm. possibility or fear of watching scooters strewn about opposed to having different businesses within the city that another user could either grab the scooter from or the same user that dropped it off knows where they left the scooter at uh, and pick it up from the same destination. Uh, the following question I had for you was job opportunities. I heard, uh, I believe it's operator is how that he or she is being referred to. How many scooters can each operator uh, handle or are so responsible for. Right. So, so the pilot program, we're, we're going to have one operator and we're going to max the number of scooters that they deploy in the city w by a hundred. So they can bring in up to a hundred scooters within the city as part of the pilot. Okay. Are, are they, are they contracted out or are as a, as a subcontractor or are they employee of the company? So the vendor is, is, so for example, we had the, I'll just give you the, the, the vendor that came to do the demo. It, um, it was Bird. So they would be the, the operator or vendor. And then the, to council member, um, Sweathome had brought up the, the local, um, folks that they would hire. And those would be the subcontractors. Those would be the folks that would come out. Um, change the batteries out because um, they all have batteries. Just, you know, look at the maintenance of the devices if there's any issues. So those would be local folks. And they typically come uh, hire people from our bike shops to support them. So, yeah. Or are they usually on an hourly basis or contracted out? Uh, I'm not sure how the vendor uh -huh. would do that. That would be up to them. To, Very well. Yeah, yeah. And, and another question I had for you was... The cost of the city, uh, from what I read, it's, it's no cost to our general fund. Is there a difference between one and 1,000? In terms of the devices? Of the cost, of the cost that, oh. that, that, would, that, would, that the city would incur, whether we order one scooter or 1,000 scooters. No, I think, I think what we're just trying to do, council member, is just find out what the market is. And I think, you know, the 100 is, seems a, a reasonable cap. Um, you know, it's, I mean, obviously, if there's more scooters, it would may possibly mean more, more of a cost for the city, you know, as, as, a, as a staffing resource question. But um, I think at this point, you know, having 100 vehicles or devices as a cap, and then we can figure out, um, you know, if, a, if, a, if it goes to a permanent, we may expand that. And then back to my point, if we do a permanent program where there are more devices, I, I think you're right. Council Member Sweddell men mentioned that 1,000 vehicles could be the market. Then we we'd want to have a, car, a full cost recovery to, to handle, um, you know, all the staff time to put in to support the project. 
Very well, because I'm definitely comparing the, the size of, for example, Windsor, that I believe has 80 to 120 scooters, if not mistaken, and their population is much smaller than the city of Santa Rosa's. And I'm also mm -hmm. looking at other cities that scooters have been implemented, whether it's Eugene, Oregon with 600, Reno, Nevada with 1,000, and mm -hmm. a couple other numbers that are larger, including uh, Santa Clara with 2,000 scooters. And what we're looking at if this possibility, if this pilot program can be successful. And what I'm looking at is if we want the program to be successful, it's because it's dependable. It's easily available. And if we have 100 scooters divided in four areas or 25 scooters per area, that seems that we're setting up the pilot program to be a frustrating form of transportation for those that would depend on it, especially with us moving towards increasing the uses of smart and transportation, and we speak about the last mile, mm -hmm. I could definitely see how that could be a very frustrating situation for, for the constituent. And, and thank you for, for answering the questions. You're welcome. Councilmember Fleming. Yes, thank you, Nancy, and I'm looking forward to finding out more information. And so my questions are gonna be directed at compliance. Uh, one is around the non-cell phone, non-credit card payment. You said we'll try to ask them to do something. And I'm going to quote Yoda and say it's a do or do not. There is no try. Uh, we want to make sure we, or I will say I, it is a priority for me and it is a demand that this is accessible to, to all residents. And so before we get into contract, it's my, it's my request, my demand. I don't know if I'll get three other people on council to say so, but that, that we actually have an answer, not a, um, a we'll think about it or we'll do our best because we know what happens when, when people say that they do their best and their best is often not enough to meet what, what you're asking. So that to me is, is really essential. And the other is a question about what type of data you're gonna be getting. Is it data, all access to all data? that they have in regard to the program and any additional data that you request or that the council requests, or is it gonna be just the data that the company wants us to see? So that's a great question. Um, I think I would say it's what we want, right? So they're gonna have to provide us with, um, you know, the metrics that, you know, for, for me, I mean, I think one thing was very, would be very important is who's using that, where are they going? Um, just, you know, so just some, some motivation behind why you're choosing to 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 ride a scooter right and where you're going so i i think to your question and on both of your questions i think it's absolutely um correct to say that we we need to have that information and we require that information from from whoever we select to operate within the city because right. where i'm going with this is that the council is going to have a lot of questions there's going to be you know, people who are for this, there's going to be people who are against this. I think if this wasn't at 11 at night, we'd have a whole bunch of people with a whole bunch of opinions here telling us things about this. And I can only imagine when this comes back after the trial period. And I want us to be able to answer their questions sincerely and in a way that can say, well, in this in this municipality, they this this company has done this, deployed X amount of scooters with X amount of population. And here's the delta between our city and theirs. And some companies will give that to you and some won't. And so I just would make sure that you're very explicit at the outset about all the types of data sets that you could imagine us wanting. And I know we, we can get down in the weeds and ask unpredictable questions. So the broader the net is probably better for this one. Thanks. Any other questions from council? So Nancy, I had a question about the locks. So who provides the locks for the scooter? So I, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go out there and maybe Jason. So when, the, when they did the demonstration, they actually have the locks on the devices. So when, when Bird came, there was a, like a coiled lock that they had on their devices. And I, you know, I, so they, it would be on the device, right? And your little um, app unlocks the, they unlocks the lock, right? And then you lock it back up the same way. So it's my understanding that, like I said, the one that uh, we had the demonstration, it's actually on the, on the scooter. Okay. I can appreciate that. Um, where I've used them before, there were no locks that were on it. So that was the biggest question that I had. And, and just going back to the vice mayor's comments about dependability, 
I'm looking at our policy construct to make sure that we don't have arbitrary barriers for use from folks. So I understand the importance of the locks in terms of preventing the clutter, but I'd like to just make sure that we have that clarified in the contract that they are locks that are provided on the scooter so that that way, and <clears throat> excuse me, there's you know an individual who doesn't have a lock but needs you know, to, to use one of these, um, still has the ability to do so. So I just wanna make sure we clarify that. Okay. And, and Mayor, I, I will say in my experience in different cities, um, Scooter companies operate similar to bike share, where you have both free roaming and free standing uh, tools, as well as docked uh, equipment. Um, and so there, there, for example, in San Francisco, I've, I've seen both where you've got your uh, scooter in a docking station. Um, that would be how you would lock the piece of equipment. Uh, others, the scooter did come with a lock uh, and that lock was how you secured it to um, as Nancy said, some post or bike rack at the destination where you finished it. So certainly things that we can incorporate into the discussion with the selected vendor. Yeah, and to that point, and I appreciate that, Jason. Like I said, I don't want any arbitrary barriers to making this program work or for the pilot program for us to see if it's useful. So when we talk about what it needs to be locked to, I'm hoping that we will be mindful of areas in our community that may not have uh, what we're asking for, whether it's a bike rack, and that's obviously a, an infrastructure issue we've talked a lot about, is having uh, bike racks, uh, or when we talk about the 25 mile an hour speed limit, unless you're in a bike lane, there are segments of our community that are probably less likely to use the scooters that are more likely to have a bike lane uh, than some of our other target areas, right? And so I'm just concerned as we do the policy construct that we're not putting up arbitrary roadblocks for people to be able to utilize them or to make them useful for folks. And, and Mayor, uh, just to add on to that, I, companies like Bird do sell their specific product on the open market. And I see them on the city streets of Santa Rosa already. Um, those particular vehicles don't have res uh, speed restrictors on them. So they look like the products that, that we may get into contract with um, that, that do have speed regulators, uh, but we just need to make sure, you know, recognize that there are, private, there are private devices out there that look exactly like the ones that we'll be working with through contract um, that, that don't have the same type of regulations. Okay. And I did hear Nancy, and I just want to clarify that the no riding on roads that are above 25 miles per hour uh, that don't have a bike lane, that that's state law, that that's not yes. an arbitrary thing that we're putting in. Right, right. Right. So, yeah, go ahead. Yes, correct. Okay. And then I did also want to echo the vice mayor's uh, concerns about not having enough in the pilot for it to become dependable and for us to figure out if it's going to be useful for the community, uh, particularly when if you had as few as 50, you're down to 10 to 12 in an area, which if you're trying to catch the smart train and you can't find one, I can understand how, how frustrating that would be. So I'd probably be in favor of raising that cap from 50 to 100 to say 200 or some other number that I think gives us a, an appropriate level of saturation, particularly if we are gonna have the locking component to try to prevent uh, clutter or, or the scooters being in different areas. Um, I think that that might be something that I'd, I'd ask the council to consider ultimately. Council Member Sawyer. Thank you, Mayor. Nancy, what is, the, I, I don't remember we were reading it, the helmet requirement. Oh, that you have to wear a helmet? For, yes. So, so I'm downtown and I want to get a scooter um, and I don't have a helmet, so I can't get a scooter. So if I have a helmet, I'm walking around all day along with a helmet. Um, or I'm go to my business or whatever, wherever I might be going. So is that, is that really um, realistic to think that people are gonna walk around with helmets just in case they want to ride a scooter? Uh, that's a great question. Well, I, I, mean, I, I guess the question yeah. is how much of a deterrent is the necessity to have a helmet going to be to the program? 
You know, I, I don't know if it, that, if, if it will be a deterrent. Um, so that's a great question, John. And I think we'll, that will kind of play out. Um, I, I have pretty limited experience with, with the scooter itself, but, you know, maybe Jason, um, could, could weigh in, but I think those are the things that we're going to see, you know, as this pilot moves forward. Um, you know, what, what is that an issue? Right. And, and I honestly don't, I don't know. So I don't know, Jason, if you have any thoughts on that or not. You know, I, I think Council Member Sawyer, I, I, again, being in other cities that have these programs, some scooters have helmets that are attached to them, and folks are encouraged to leave them with the scooter. Um, I seem to recall watching our mayor scoot down the streets of San, uh, Sacramento. He had a helmet on. Um, and so there was obviously that product. I, I did not, uh, Jason. <laughs> I was trying to help you out, Mayor. Um, but... Um, but there are there are definitely some there are definitely some organizations that require helmets. They they attempt to keep them with the scooters. Um, they tend to lock with the locks that are provided. Um, but um, I would say a majority of the scooters that I've seen do not have helmets specifically available. And it's a matter of uh, it, whether they're enforced or not. Okay, I appreciate that. And I, I would assume that every helmet would come with lice spray. So just 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 in case. I mean, just just thinking. And while I appreciate the assist, uh, Mr. Assistant City Manager, I can tell you I just like the feeling of the hair flowing in the wind uh, too much to wear the helmet uh, in Sacramento. Any other questions, Council? Vice Mayor. COVID, helmets, sharing helmets, COVID. I, yeah, I, no, no. I, def I definitely see an issue with that. Um, and, and not even speaking on the deterrent of that, but just for safety issues, I mean, uh, I, I definitely do see that as being a deterrent. Yeah, and that actually, council member, that actually came up and talking with one of the operators, um, just just that very point. So, yeah. All right, I'm not seeing any other questions. Let's go to public comment on this item. If you are interested in providing a comment, go ahead and hit the raise hand feature on Zoom. Or if you are here to give comment, Go ahead, approach the podium. All right, seeing none, do we have any voicemails? We do. Hi, this is Eris Weaver, Executive Director of the Sonoma County Bicycle Coalition. Uh, the public comment on agenda item 14.2. I'm very excited to see how this scooter pilot program works out. Anything that gets people out of cars and into alternate transportation is a great idea. And it does look as what a lot of care went into um, putting policies in place to avoid conflict between scooters and pedestrians, such as forbidding riding on the sidewalk. I do notice that the policy does not explicitly mention the multi-use paths like the Prince Greenway. Are scooters allowed on those or not? It would be a good idea to specify that because people are going to ask and want to know. I do have two comments about potential conflicts between scooters and cyclists. Um, along with the clear signage and education informing the scooter users that they need to stay off the sidewalk, it would also be a good idea to include a reminder that uh, if they're in a bike lane or in the road that they should ride on the right side of the road. Um, I do occasionally have close head-on encounters with cyclists riding on the left side, and I would really hate for cyclists to have to start also playing chicken with scooter riders uh, riding the wrong way. The biggest issue in my mind, though, concerns parking. Uh, secure, correctly placed bike racks are already in really short supply in town, and adding 50 to 100 scooters to the mix is not going to be pretty. Um, the city really needs to get more racks added near all the popular destinations in order to um, facilitate all of that. Thank you. That concludes recorded public comments on the side of Mayor. All right, Councilmember Fleming, can you put a motion on the table for discussion? Yes, indeed. Uh, a resolution of the Council of the City of Santa Rosa approving the Shared Scooter System Pilot Program and authorizing the Assistant City Manager, Director of Transportation and Public Works, or designee to modify permit conditions issue and revoke permits and limit or suspend the operation of a shared scooter system and waive further reading of the text. Second. 
So motion from Councilmember Fleming and a second from Councilmember Tibbetts. Mr. Assistant City Manager, did you have something to add? Uh, you know, Mayor, I did. Um, as Nancy mentioned, we've got a fantastic alternative transportation planner on board who happens to be watching, even though he's not on video, texted us to remind uh, both Nancy and I that helmets are only required for users that are 18 and under. And so that's why uh, you don't see them. And it, it sparked a memory of mine uh, a couple of years ago. I took my younger son under 18 to San Francisco. He desperately wanted to ride it. And actually the al algorithm and process they use to rent a unit will not rent to anyone under the age of 18 if a helmet isn't being provided for the piece of equipment. So I just wanted to follow up and, and, and try to respond to your helmet question a little bit further. All right, thank you, Mr. Assistant City Manager. I, I did have one other question that I forgot, so I hope you'll indulge me, but there is the question of the uh, providing proof of a driver's license. Is that state law that to use a, a, an electric scooter like this that you have to have a driver's license as well? That's a great question. I'm not sure if it's state law. Um, Jason, do you know? I, I apologize. I, I don't recall uh, for scooters. Um, so we would have to get back to you on that, Mayor. Yeah. Okay. Um, and, and part of that is if we're trying to provide multimodal transportation oh, for is. folks who may not want to drive a car, that perhaps they don't have a driver's license. Um, and again, just looking for unnecessary barriers for the folks who might use this as a pilot program. Uh, so I'm actually gonna uh, ask the motioner, uh, Council Member Fleming, uh, for a couple of changes. Uh, one is to change the limit number from 50 to 100 scooters to 200 scooters in those, between those four zones. One is to eliminate the requirement for a driver's license. Um, one is to eliminate the requirement for the helmet that Council Member Sawyer, uh, I think, adequately explained the issues with. And then one is to clarify that the locks will be provided by the operator. If it pleases the mayor, I have a couple of questions before accepting those amendments. Mm -hmm. um, one is, does um, are there any operational challenges or issues with getting 200 scooters and stuff? Because there was a range, 50 to 100. So if we say 200, can that can that happen? Uh, through the mayor, do you want me to answer that question? Yeah, please do. Yeah, I think, uh, uh, council member, I think we can set that max and, and there's no magic, you know, whether it's 100 or 200, I think it, it's fine to increase that to 200 without any problem. Okay. And is there any challenge with uh, removing the driver's license requirement? Will the company, uh, I mean, is there a representative from the company who can say whether or not they'll, they'll enter in a contract with us um, if we don't require people to, to present driver's licenses? Yeah, and I actually I'm I'm looking at the slide where I where I listed the operational regulations, and it does say that it's it's the California Vehicle Code where they're um, citing that that's why the license is required. So I think we need to check into that before I would em em embrace that um, um, elimination of that requirement. So yeah, it's, it seems like an awfully high barrier to require a driver's license, but I also understand the rationale for putting it in there. Um, so uh, I, what I could say is like, you know, on that one, um, give direction to do everything within our power to eliminate the driver's license requirement. Um, but I'm not sure that we want to tank this based on a driver's license. It may be some ID or something. Um, I mean, I'd love to have us have nothing, but if it's the state law, we can't supersede that. Um, uh, and, and I'd say then, if it's just silent in the contract, state law, I mean, state law is going to supersede either way. Right, right. I, I think that, um, and that's about, that's where I was going to go with the helmet is that, you know, I think that we're taking on liability by, by getting into it one way or another, but I think we could stay silent on it, um, have the contract not say anything. 
Um, and then I, so I accept the, the 200, I accept the locks provided by the operator and I recommend and see if the um, mayor accepts it, the, the contract stays silent on the driver's license and the helmet. Mm -hmm. Okay, I accept those challenges. What about my seconder? You, you good, Council Member Tibbetts with that? Okay. Council Member Sweddell? I could have a question, maybe it'd be for the city attorney. I'd be comfortable with language on driver's license and helmet consistent with state law. Whatever we do is consistent with state law, but spell those two things out. That would make me uh, far more comfortable. Um, I was going to um, to ask to to be able to mention that I mean, there are liability issues and risks issue, risk issues with both eliminating the requirement for driver's license and eliminating the, the requirement for helmets. Um, again, as um, the assistant city manager pointed out, the uh, policy just provides for helmets under 18. So um, again, I, I think for both choice. of those, uh, I, I like the suggestion from council member Sweathelm, if we just say consistent with state law, I'm good with that if that works for yeah, you. That also satisfies my concerns around the liability. It's a fine line between barriers and, and um, being cautious. So I think we're on the same page there. Okay. Council Member Tibbetts. I'm sorry to beleaguer it. I, I'm a little bit confused though. So are we requiring driver's license? No. <laughs> we're just saying we're going to follow state law as it pertains to the scooters. Correct. And same with helmets. Yep. All right. I'm good. Thank you. All right, any other questions, comments, or amendments? Vice Mayor? Before I ask my question, as a recipient of a, of a motorcycle license, uh, it's required 150 cc's or above to uh, require a driver's license, and this would not fall into that category, but I'm sure we'll do our research with just a little uh, experience that I had. Uh, in regards to the question, in regards to metrics, actually, is there a way that we can receive information in, in regards to return, return customers or frequency of, of use? So, yeah, I think that will be um, one of the metrics for sure that we'd want to garner from, you know, the, the use throughout the, the year. Um, and I and, and I think what we'll do is we'll we'll check in with some of the other cities and see, you know, I know um, our staff has already thought of things that we'd like to see um, back from the vendor in terms of their um, their operations with, within within the, the year pilot. So um, that could definitely be something there. I'm I'm quite interested in just like I said, who, who what are the users, you know, and what's the market, and and are we are we ad addressing the needs and the market um, with with these devices? Um, so yeah. Is there any city with our comparable size that we could actually see their metrics or their frequency of use? You know, we that's a great question. We did, and I can't remember what city it was. Um, but one of the vendors did have some. It was out of state. It wasn't a California city. But we we will we will follow up with that, and and that that will be a good you know some good information that we can compare with with, with Santa Rosa. So great great thought. Uh, very uh, thank you very much, and I'm very interested to see the, those numbers just to see what we could expect and, and really measure our success or need for more scooters. Thank you, Mr. City Manager. So the, the resolution before the council does cite the vehicle code section that relates to the operation of scooters. And that section does require um, a valid driver's license or instruction permit to operate the scooter. It also has some provisions in it related to which roadways can uh, be used to operate the scooters. And there is a provision in there that allows a local jurisdiction to authorize them um, in a class two or class four bikeway on a highway with a speed limit of up to 35 miles an hour. So there's there's some variations here, but I think as long as you incorporate in, com in compliance or conformance with state law, we're, we're fine. Okay. With that, Ms. Madam City Clerk, can you please call the vote? Thank you, Council Member Tibbetts. Aye. Council Member Schwedhelm? Aye. Council Member Sawyer? Aye. Council Member Fleming? Yes. Council Member Rogers? Aye. Vice Mayor Alvarez? Aye. Mayor Rogers? Aye. That motion passes with seven ayes. Okay.
Okay, let's do item 14.3 and, and council not trying to rush folks, but we do, I believe, lose our translator at 1230. Mayor Rogers and members of the city council, item 14.3 is a report item. The matter before the council is the extension of the COVID-19 related temporary parking user fee reductions through June 30th of 2022. Alan Alton, our interim chief financial officer, will present the staff report. Good morning, Mayor Rogers and members of the council. Um, I think in the interest of time, I can, let's just move to the next slide. And the next one after that. Um, we have uh, parking fee waivers since, actually since April, 2020, the council has taken a number of actions in response to the pandemic relative to parking fees. Uh, this included the uh, uh, waiving all hourly garage fees and parking meter fees early during the pandemic to the current um, uh, uh, fee waivers uh, that I'll go into a little bit more detail um, in the next slide. Um, we received a, a request from the Downtown Action Organization or DAO to extend the current parking fee waivers for an additional two years. However, based on the finances of the fund, uh, which I'll also discuss in the next couple of slides, staff is recommending only a six month of extension of the fee waivers. Next slide, please. So currently uh, and expiring on uh, December 31st, are the following uh, fee waivers. So we, we have free parking at all five garages from Monday through Friday from 5 p.m. to 1 a.m. Uh, free parking in all five garages on Saturday and Sunday, except the 5th Street and D Street garages, which are free on Sunday. Uh, we uh, first free hour, uh, or yeah, the first hour free, at the 3rd Street and 5th Street and D Street garages. One free metered parking session using the Passport mobile payment application and waive the meter reservation fees for temporary parklets. The estimated impact, total impact of, of uh, this action over the next six months would be about $430,000. To date, the parking enterprise has lost over $700,000 in revenue due to the fee waivers. However, this is just a small part of the revenue lost by the enterprise over the last uh, two years at it, as it uh, also uh, uh, felt the impacts of the pandemic. Um, the year over year total revenue declined uh, 25% fiscal year 20 so from fiscal year 19 to fiscal year 20 total revenue declined by 25 percent and then it declined by another 35 percent in uh, fiscal year 21. so we went from a high revenue amount of seven million dollars uh, including revenues and transfers in uh, at the end of, of uh, fiscal year 19 to uh, an ending revenue amount of $3.3 million uh, this past year. Uh, fiscal year 20 and fiscal year 21 ended with total fund deficit of approximately $700,000 and $3.4 million respectively. Next slide, please. So these, these uh, losses in revenue have uh, uh, impacted the, the fund's uh, reserves. The parking enterprise reserves for contingency, which are the reserves from which you can appropriate budget, has declined by uh, rather steadily since uh, um, fiscal year 2016, starting at $10.9 million to its current level of 7.6 million. Uh, there is um, over also uh, 
over $11 million of deferred maintenance for the parking assets in the enterprise uh, with approximately $7.7 million of structural deferred maintenance in the garages and then approximately $4 million of deferred maintenance in the lots. So with all that, that is why we are taking a, uh, a six month um, recommendation of, of um, waiving the existing fees. So extending the current fee waivers for only six months and not two years. Um, and then obviously we will be evaluating this uh, um, uh, periodically, uh, at least quarterly, if not monthly. Um, but there, there, it is at a point where we need to really uh, um, sound an alarm over to the health of, of that enterprise. So with that, the recommendation on the next slide is that it's recommended by the finance department that the council by resolution authorize an extension through June 30th, 2022 of one first hour free at the third street, fifth street, D street garages. Uh, the first hour uh, is already free at the first and seventh street garages. Two free parking in all five garages, Monday through Friday from 5 p.m. to 6 a.m. Uh, noting that parking is already free from 1 a.m. to 6 a.m. Three, free parking in all five garages on Saturday and Sunday, noting that the D Street and Fifth Street garages already have free parking on Sunday. Four, one free metered parking session using the Passport mobile payment application up to $3.15 value to a maximum of $31,500 since, uh, since its inception on July 1, 2020. And five, a waiver of meter reservation fees for temporary parklets, outdoor seating, and retail to expand business footprints to meet physical distancing requirements related to the COVID-19 order. And with that, I'm available to answer any questions should you have. All right, thank you so much, Alan. Council Member Fleming. Thank you, Alan, for your presentation and for its brevity. Um, my, I'm sorry to do this to Council, but I do have a couple of questions. Um, you um, may have mentioned earlier, um, and I'm wondering if you could say it here, um, how effective has this been at getting people in the garages? So um, what we, uh, we have not seen this, uh, uh, these reduced fees actually bring people into the garages as we had anticipated. Um, we are still below our, our uh, pre-COVID levels, uh, but, uh, and I'm trying to remember the percentages, but I believe uh, it was roughly 63% uh, um, of parking is on the street and uh, with about 20 to 22% in the garages. Okay. I, I personally love this program for my personal use. However, given the, the state of disrepair of the garages and the lack of use of the program um, and the fact that it's always easy for me to find a, a a place to park on the street. I don't feel like this is financially prudent. Um, I know I should hold my, my comments, but it is late and that's what I think. Council Member Tibbetts. Sorry guys, I'm having a hard time walking away. I gotta ask more. Um, Mr. Alton, uh, can you show on the graph where there's a spike in the reserve fund in 2019? Yeah, I, I believe that was, uh, there was a um, there was a brief period when we expanded the hours of on street uh, meter parking, and then uh, and then that was um, we rescinded that soon after that. And I'm I'm sorry I'm a little fuzzy at night, but that that's I, I had the same question 
And uh, that was just a very brief period where that, where that happened. That was our very popular evening metered parking program. The progressive yeah. parking, I think it was. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, something. Thank yeah. you. I'll, I have a comment about that, but I'll hold it for comments. Thank you. Any other questions? Let's go to public comment on this. If you're interested in providing comment, hit the raise hand feature on Zoom. Seeing none, do we have any voicemails? We do not. All right, we will go ahead and bring this back. Councilmember Sawyer, can you put a motion on the table? Mr. Mayor, introduce the resolution of the Council of the City of Santa Rosa authorizing the extension of a temporary reduction and waiver of certain parking fees through June 30th, 2022 and wait for the reading of the text. Second. Motion by Councilmember Sawyer, second from Tibbetts. You had comments? I do have a couple of comments. Um, I. You know, I think that uh, we discussed this actually briefly at our downtown action subcommittee when this kind of uh, filtered through us first. And, and I just want to share my comments that I made there with the council recognizing that I won't be here anymore. But I think it's, it's important. Um, and I shared these same thoughts and concerns with uh, Peter Rumble at the Metro Chamber. Right now, I think this is an important gesture during COVID-19. Um, to continue this, but I believe I agree with what Victoria said about the question pertaining to how has this actually affected use. Um, if there is a proposal uh, or a desire to keep this going indefinitely, you know, my suggestion is is to look at increasing the prices of on-street parking at the businesses and working with the businesses to figure that out, because obviously the funds have to come from somewhere. Um, so. Uh, those were just my comments about it. God knows we aren't going to have free parking in the city for a long time. That's member Fleming. I'd like to amend my uh, or add to my comment and say, you know, park. I, I know progressive parking was not particularly popular, but you know, we do. Uh, I concur with Mr. Tibbetts. We we got to figure out a way to pay for it, and I'll, I'll just add this to his comment. You know, it is an important gesture during COVID-19, but then there was COVID-20 and COVID-21, and in a couple of weeks, we're going to be in COVID-22. So at what point do we say COVID is going to be with us 5, 10, 15 years, you know, in different forms? And I think it's really difficult to accept that this is not a real temporary problem. So we need long-term solutions to long-term problems, and we can't keep giving things away um, with the hope that it's going to solve things. I know our local retailers are struggling, but, uh, you know, in many other ways, retail is thriving. And so, um, I, but, but our, our parking district is not. And I think we've got to figure out a way. And so I'm not in favor of extending this. I would be in favor of hearing staff return with a much more pared back version, something that's revenue neutral. Um, and, and breaks even and, and collaborates with our, our downtown uh, districts in order to get their input, but one that, that doesn't continue to deplete the city's coffers and, and erode our infrastructure that's in really serious disrepair. All right, thank you, Council Member. Madam City Clerk, could you please call the, the vote? Council Member Tibbetts? Aye. Council Member Schwedhelm? Aye. Council Member Sawyer? Aye. Council Member Fleming? No. Council Member Rogers? No. Vice Mayor Alvarez? Aye. Mayor Rogers? Aye. That motion passes with five ayes with Council Member Rogers and Council Member Fleming voting no. Okay. Let's go to our public comment for non-agenda items. If you're here to provide a comment for something that wasn't on the agenda tonight, go ahead and approach the podium or hit the raise hand feature. I see none. Do we have any voicemails? No. Okay. We have no written communications. Uh, I did uh, really fast want to, again, extend my appreciation uh, to our Interim City Manager, Mr. Jeff Colin, for your service to the community. I want to again thank Council Member Tibbetts for his contributions over the last five years. Both of you will be incredibly missed around City Hall. Uh, and then as I mentioned before, we are adjourning tonight in the memory of Marie Durkin. 
uh, and want to extend our condolences to uh, Director Burke and her family and hope they're doing well. With that, we will adjourn.